Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, we're covering the Cisco Intelligent Information Network. In this video, you're going to learn the basics of Cisco IIN. You're going to learn how it has a multi-phase approach. You're going to learn about the properties of IIN, what makes it distinct. You'll also learn about the benefits of IIN and its capabilities. By the end of this video, you certainly will know enough to do very well in this portion of your exam. So let's begin. IIN represents a multi-phased architecture that injects intelligence into a network infrastructure. Its single integrated system provides intelligence across multiple layers, as you see here, and aligns the network infrastructure with the rest of the IT infrastructure, integrating the network with applications, software, servers, and services. In other words, the network becomes an active participant in the total delivery of applications and services. Cisco sees this as an evolving environment, or what they would call an ecosystem, that responds to constantly changing business requirements. The Intelligent Information Network is a Cisco ideal where network and application services are integrated, allowing for cost savings and improved user productivity. It allows the network to be used as a strategic asset and provides capabilities which include some of the following, such as CDP, which is a simple broadcast protocol that network devices use to advertise their presence. It operates in the background and facilitates communication between for example, a Cisco unified IP phone plugged into a network and the network switch itself. QoS. Cisco provides an end-to-end -end solution with QoS to ensure that packets are serviced the way they need to be. As traffic flows through the access layer, for example, priority queuing and buffer management ensure that real-time traffic is prioritized over less time-critical data. Next is VLANs. With VLANs, the LAN infrastructure can distinguish between a phone, for example, from a PC using the VLAN tagging, wireless. Cisco wireless access points allow Cisco wireless users to roam a campus without losing connectivity. If a user roams to a different site, the system will discover the new physical location of that user. Power over Ethernet. This eliminates the need for local power connections to every phone. And finally, Gigabit Ethernet, which allows voice, video, and data to take advantage of high bandwidth speeds on the LAN infrastructure. As you saw before, the IIN is broken up into three individual phases. Phase one of the IIN is the integrated systems phase. This phase involves the convergence of voice, data, and video into a single transport network or across a system of networks. This phase is facilitated by platforms such as Cisco ISR routers. Phase two of the IIN is the integrated services phase. This phase merges common elements such as storage and data center server capacity. Additionally, virtualization technologies allow for the integration of servers, storage, and network devices. And finally, phase three of the IIN is the integrated applications phase. This phase is the ultimate goal of the IIN in that it allows the network to become application aware. Now, IIN has three important properties, flexibility, adaptability, and integration. Flexibility means that it can expand and scale easy. There's also multi-layered security that can be adapted with high reliability and virtualization services, which is important now more than ever. Adaptability includes the identification of required applications, adaptable self-defense and self-optimization, but also service flexibility. And then there's integration, which means that when possible, the devices need to be plug and play. And they need to be modular so that you can replace 
older technology with newer technology without having to overhaul your network. Intelligent Information Network applications bring three benefits. First, they reduce total cost of ownership. They lower operating costs. Second is to increase the input-output ratio. This means enhancing productivity and users can access the network at any time, any place, using any device. Third is to increase business ag agility, which means partnering with clients to facilitate the appropriate connections necessary to get business done, and this opens up more revenue streams. Specifically, Cisco IIN has the three following capabilities. First, it acts as an integrated system. The network is integrated with applications, middleware, and services. There's active delivery. The network is a full participant in managing, monitoring, and optimizing service delivery and applications. And then policy enforcement. Enforcing the policy in such a way to achieve business goals and create a link between business processes. The concept behind IIN is that the network design should make information available when it is needed by business processes. To illustrate this concept, draw your network diagram, but instead of starting with a hardware device such as a router or a switch, start the diagram with business process. Although this is a rather simple drawing, you'll get the idea. Now you can start asking, what is required? Well, you need to have a front end so that means you're going to have people coming into a DMZ or an external network that you need to support. But you also have connectivity requirements to an outside partner. So maybe that means an internal VPN connection between the two companies. And then you have to order delivery and services. And so we're talking about different departments here, which then we get into the discussion of VLAN segmentation. The key point here is that the network serves the business, and the business should not be expected to wrap itself around the network. That's what IIN is. It's a multi-phase approach for integrating the network with applications and software, service and services, all that support the business. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about the Intelligent Information Network. You've learned about its distinct properties, benefits, and capabilities. In understanding the essence of IIN is that it moves the network from a static platform to a very dynamic environment participating in the entire technology ecosystem. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about service-oriented network architecture. Specifically, we're going to give you a description of what SONA actually it is. Then we're going to talk about the framework, the actual layers of SONA, and the sub-modules within those layers. And then finally we'll talk about the advantages, what are the business advantages Service-Oriented Network Architecture, or SONA, is an ongoing architectural framework that supports emerging technologies, IT strategies, and initiatives. IT Initiatives and Strategies SONA is a three-layered model, as you see here. The physical infrastructure, which is also referred to as the network infrastructure layer, is the bottom layer. This is where servers, storage, and clients are located, and it includes different modular design areas, such as WAN, Enterprise Edge, and Enterprise Campus. The middle layer consists of an interactive services layer and management of the services that can deliver consistent and robust capabilities throughout the network. Cisco SONA Core Services Group includes management services, which offers configuration and reporting capabilities, transport services, which are concerned with resource allocation, 
and delivery of the overall quality of service requirements of the applications, as well as routing and topology functions. Mobility services, which offer location information and also device and presence dependent services. Application delivery services, which are concerned with performance optimization based on application awareness. Virtualization services, which deliver abstraction between physical and functional elements in the infrastructure. Security services that help to protect the infrastructure, data, and application layers from constantly evolving threats, and also offer access control and identity functions. And then communications and collaboration services, which are integral to Cisco Unified Communication Solutions, offering session and media management capabilities, contact center services, as well as identity and presence functions. The top layer forms the middleware and applications platform, which includes the following, commercial applications, in-house develops applications, software as a service, and other composite applications, such as product lifecycle management, customer relation management, and enterprise resource planning. All of these components work together as an architectural framework with the following advantages. Increased functionality, supports enterprise operational requirements, scalability, expansion and growth of organizational tasks since it separates the functions into layers and components, facilitates mergers and acquisitions, modularity, hierarchical design that allows network resources to be easily added during times of growth, and availability of services from any location in the enterprise at any time. The Sona network is built from the ground up with redundancy and resiliency to prevent network downtime. The goal of Sona is to provide high performance, fast response times, and throughput by ensuring quality of service on an application by application basis. The Sona network is configured to maximize the throughput of all critical applications, such as voice and video. Sona also provides built in manageability, configuration management, performance monitoring, fault detection, and analysis tools in addition to an efficient design with the goals of reducing TCO, or total cost of ownership, and maximizing the company's existing resources when the application demands increase. Now let's do an even deeper dive into each of the three layers of SONA. SONA divides the IIN ideal into the following three different layers. The network infrastructure layer, also referred to as the physical infrastructure layer, facilitates the transport of services across the network. It refers to a hierarchical converged network that includes servers, storage, and clients. This is where the servers, storage, and clients are located and includes different modular design areas, such as the WAN or Enterprise Edge, Branch, Campus, Data Center, or teleworker. The interactive services layer, also referred to as the core common services layer, optimizes the communication between applications and services using intelligent network functions such as security, identity, voice, virtualization, and QoS. The application layer contains the business and collaboration applications used by end users. These applications include commercial and internally developed applications, such as software as a service, and composite applications within the service-oriented architecture. The Sona network is built from the ground up with redundancy and resiliency to prevent network downtime. The goal of Sona is to provide high performance, fast response times, and throughput by assuring quality of service on an application by application basis. The SONA network is configured in order to maximize the throughput of all critical applications such as voice and video. SONA also provides built-in manageability and configuration management, performance monitoring, 
fault detection, and analysis tools. Sauna provides an efficient design with the goal of reducing the total cost of ownership and maximizing the company's existing resources when application demands increase. Next, on a piece of paper, what I'd like you to try to the best of your ability and as detailed as possible, draw out the Cisco Service-Oriented Network Architecture Framework. See if you can draw it out to the best of your ability and try to include some modules within your layers to see how well you do. Let's see how you've done. There's the network infrastructure layer, and you can see the modules here. There's the interactive services layer, and you can see the submodules here. And then there's the application layer, and you can see the submodules here. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about service-oriented network architecture. You received a high-level description of it, but then we went into the framework itself and the advantages of using this architecture in the enterprise that you support. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, we're going to be covering the Cisco PPDIOO lifecycle. In this video, you will learn about the benefits of PPDIOO, as well as its design methodology. You will also learn about how to identify customer requirements for network design and the characteristics of a customer network. And then finally, we'll discuss design approaches, and design documentation. So let's begin. Cisco has formalized a network's life cycle into six phases, prepare, plan, design, implement, operate, and optimize. And these phases are collectively known as PPDIOO. The life cycle has four main benefits. It lowers the total cost of ownership. It increases network availability. It improves business agility. And it speeds access to applications and services. Let's discuss the PPDIOO phases in detail. First, the prepare phase. This phase establishes organization and business requirements develops a network strategy, and proposes a high-level conceptual architecture to support that strategy. Technologies that support the architecture are identified in this phase, as well as a business case to establish the financial justification for the strategy. The plan phase identifies the network requirements based on goals, facilities, and user needs. This phase characterizes sites and assesses the network, performs a gap analysis against best practice architectures, and looks at the operational environment. In the design phase, the network design is developed based on the technical and business requirements obtained from the previous phases. A good design will provide high availability, reliability, security, scalability, and performance. In the implement phase, new equipment is installed and configured according to the design specifications. In this phase, any planned network changes should be communicated in change control meetings and with the necessary approvals to proceed. The operate phase maintains the network's day-to-day -day operational health. Operations include managing and monitoring network components and performing the appropriate maintenances. And then finally, the optimize phase, which involves proactive network management by identifying and resolving issues before they affect the network. Now, there is a design methodology for the first three phases of the PPDIOO methodology, and there are three steps to it. In step one, 
Decision makers identify the requirements and a conceptual architecture is proposed. In step two, the network is assessed. The network is assessed on function, performance, and quality. And then in step three, the network topology is designed to meet the requirements and close the network gaps identified in the previous two steps. Let's review these three phases in detail. To obtain customer requirements, you need not only to talk to network engineers, but you need to talk to the business personnel and company managers. Networks are designed to support applications, and you want to determine the network services that you need to support, both now and in the future. This, this analysis is broken into five steps. First, identify network applications and services. Then define the organizational goals. Define the possible organizational constraints. And then define the technical goals. And finally, define the possible technical constraints. When you're characterizing an existing network, you need to obtain all of the existing documentation. Sometimes no formal documentation exists, so you need to be prepared to use tools to obtain the information needed and to get access to log into network devices to obtain the information required. Here are the steps you want to take to gather information. First, you're going to identify all existing organization information and documentation. Then you'll perform a network audit that adds detail to the description of the network. And then finally, you're going to use traffic analysis information to augment information on applications and protocols used. When you're designing the network topology and solutions, Cisco recommends that you use the top-down approach for network design. Top-down simply means starting your design from the top layer of the OSI model and working your way down. Top-down design adapts the network and physical infrastructure to the network application's needs. With a top-down approach, network devices and technologies are not selected until the application's requirements are analyzed. Here you can compare and contrast top-down versus bottom-up. A bottom-up design may result in an inappropriate design because the requirements of the organization, that is, those requirements of the applications and the users using those applications, are not included in this type of design. Next, the design document itself. The design document should include the following sections. The introduction, the design requirements, existing network infrastructure, including layer three topology diagrams, physical topology diagrams, audit results, network health analysis, routing protocols, applications, and a list of routers and switches and other devices, among many other things. Then the design portion, which actually contains the specific design information, such as logical, physical topology, IP addressing, routing protocols, etc. Proof of concept, which results from the live pilot or prototype testing. And then the implementation plan, which includes the detailed steps for the network staff to implement the new installation. And then the appendixes, which will list all the existing network devices configurations, and additional information used in the design of a network. So now it's your turn. Go ahead and on a piece of paper or a whiteboard, go ahead and draw out the PPD IOO methodology. Uh, start with the first step, the first P, I guess you could say, and write it out, and then write out the full chart of PPD IOO uh, what each letter stands for, and also put a sentence next to each word to summarize the activity that occurs at that phase. Go ahead and do that now and pause the video.
So let's see how you did. The first phase is prepare. The second phase is plan. The third phase is design. The fourth phase is implement. The fifth phase is operate. And the final phase is optimize. This is a life cycle. That is, it doesn't mean once you hit optimize that it's over. It's a continual process going from prepare, plan, over to design, implement, operate, and optimize, and then around again. On a regular basis, you're constantly looking at the network, seeing what can be done to make it run more efficiently and more cost effective. Now, assuming you went ahead and added a sentence or two after each word, here are some good foundational sentences or questions regarding what is going on in each phase. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about the benefits and the design methodology of PPDIOO. You've learned how to identify customer requirements and the characteristics of a network. And then you dug into the design approach as far as top down versus bottom up and how to properly document a design. It appears from the study materials that Cisco does want you to focus in on the first three phases of PPD IOO, which is why this video also focused on the first three phases. Wish you the best of luck in your studies. Thank you. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, you're going to learn about the Cisco hierarchical network model. Specifically, you're going to learn about what Cisco calls the core distribution and access layers of a campus network. So let's begin. The most important idea concerning the Cisco hierarchical network model it is the step-by-step -step construction of the network, which implements one module at a time, starting with the foundation. The implementation of each module can be supervised by a network architect, but the details are covered by a specialized team, such as routing or security or voice teams. This modular approach is the key to simplifying the network. Before we cover each module within the network model, Let's talk about the main advantages of the Cisco hierarchical network model. There are eight key advantages. Ease to understand and implement, flexibility, cost savings, modularity, it's easily modified, it allows for network growth, it facilitates summarization of networks, and there is also built-in fault isolation. The three-tier model was created in order to make the construction of networks easier to understand. Cisco has always tried to make efficient and cost-effective networks with a modular structure so they can easily be divided into building blocks. The modular network design facilitates modifications in certain modules after their implementation and makes it easy to track faults in the network. The Cisco hierarchical network model is defined by three layers, the core or backbone layer, the distribution layer, and the access layer. Now, if you're working for a small company, these layers might be collapsed. Core and distribution are often collapsed into a single layer, or sometimes all three layers are collapsed. That being said, let's dive into each of the layers. The access layer is the on-ramp to the network. So for the most part, any end user or device that wants to connect to the network will do so via the access layer. 
As you can see, access layer switches should have redundant connectivity to the distribution layer. This will ensure network connectivity for the hosts even when there is an equipment failure. You could take it another step further and provide redundant connectivity for the host to the access layer switches, but this is the exception to the rule and certainly not the norm. The access layer is comprised of layer two switches, workstations, IP telephones, or any other device that requires access to the network. Here are some specific features you should be aware of at the access layer. It should provide high availability and flexible security features. You can also implement authentication, broadcast control, and it's where you would define QoS trust boundaries. In the access layer, you would also implement rate limiting techniques, and it's where you would often program spanning tree protocol, include power over ethernet for your phones, and configure voice VLAN settings. As you can see, the distribution layer has redundant connectivity to both the access and core layers. The distribution layer is often where the brains of the network resides, since many decisions such as filtering, quality of service, and policy-based routing are performed in the distribution layer. As you can see, the distribution layer has redundant connectivity to the access and core layers. The distribution layer normally has advanced layer three switches that can support a wide array of functionality to support the services required from this layer. Here are the attributes of the distribution layer. It gives access control to core devices. It has redundancy to access devices. It's where the boundaries are for routing protocols. You, redistribution occurs at this layer, as well as filtering, route summarization, policy routing, and here you will see your security implemented. It provides separate multicast and broadcast domains using layer two and layer three technologies and provides routing between VLANs. It is a media translation and provides boundaries for media and also provides redistribution. There is a lot going on in the core layer. The high speed switching fabric ensures that all modules which connect to the core are serviced immediately. You rarely will put any programming on these switches that could cause them to slow down processing. For example, no QoS, no ACLs. Rather, you want to keep it so that these high-end switches spend their time processing forwarding traffic rather than doing anything else. Although it's not always required to have redundancy to and from the distribution and access layers, redundancy is certainly required in the core. As you can see, the core is the hub for the interconnects in the network. It connects to the server farm, to the distribution layer, and then off to the enterprise edge as well. So having a high performing core is critical. Here are some key features of the core layer that you will want to memorize. The core layer is high speed, it's reliable, it's redundant, it has fault tolerance and load balancing, it has manageability and scalability. In the core layer, there are no filters, packet handling, or other overhead that would slow traffic down or the processing of traffic down. It has a limited but consistent diameter, and it can provide quality of service. So in summary, you've learned in detail about the core distribution and access layer. If you can memorize what you've learned in this video, you will do very well in this portion of your exam. Good luck in your studies.
Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, you're going to learn about the Cisco Enterprise Architecture Model. The Cisco Enterprise Architecture Model is broken into three primary modules. That is the Enterprise Campus Module, the Enterprise Edge Module, and the Service Provider Edge Module. Within these modules, there are sub-layers you need to know of. So let's go ahead and learn about the Cisco Enterprise architecture model in detail. So as you can see here, there are, there's a lot going on here in the enterprise architecture model. Specifically, there is the enterprise campus, which is made up of the access distribution and core layer and the server farm that connects into the edge distribution, which then allows communication between the campus network and the enterprise edge. The Enterprise Edge module is made up of the WAN, e-commerce, internet, and RAS blocks, and that obviously interconnects with your service providers. So your service provider edge is made up of your internet providers and your WAN providers. So let's dig deep into all of these so that uh, by the end of this video, you have the knowledge that you need to pass your CCDA exam, but more importantly, so that you understand how to apply this knowledge in your career. The access layer is the on-ramp to the network. So for the most part, any end user or device that wants to connect to the network will do so via the access layer. As you can see, access layer switches should have redundant connectivity to the distribution layer. This will ensure network connectivity for the hosts even when there is an equipment failure. You could take it another step further and provide redundant connectivity for the host to the access layer switches, but this is the exception to the rule and certainly not the norm. The access layer is comprised of layer two switches, workstations, IP telephones, or any other device that requires access to the network. As you can see, the distribution layer has redundant connectivity to both the access and core layers. The distribution layer is often where the brains of the network resides, since many decisions such as filtering, quality of service, and policy-based routing are performed in the distribution layer. As you can see, the distribution layer has redundant connectivity to the access and core layers. The distribution layer normally has advanced layer three switches that can support a wide array of functionality to support the services required from this layer. There is a lot going on in the core layer. The high-speed switching fabric ensures that all modules which connect to the core are serviced immediately. You rarely will put any programming on these switches that could cause them to slow down processing. For example, no QoS, no ACLs. Rather, you want to keep it so that these high-end switches spend their time processing forwarding traffic rather than doing anything else. Although it's not always required to have redundancy to and from the distribution and access layers, redundancy is certainly required in the core. As you can see, the core is the hub for the interconnects in the network. It connects to the server farm, to the distribution layer, and then off to the enterprise edge as well. So having a high performing core is critical. The server farm is what it says it is. It's a place where you place your servers in a centralized area. Since it's connected to the core layer, end users are assured of high-speed connectivity to these servers, assuming they are not facing any bandwidth limitations at the lower layers. The server farm can also service any of the other modules on the edge, should backend communications be required between the internet DMZs and the internal servers. Obviously, firewalls are going to play an important role in making sure that only the traffic that is required can make it through to the server farm. Obviously, firewalls are going to play an important role in making sure only the traffic from the enterprise edge that is required can make it through into the server farm. The server farm is comprised of the following servers, database, email, DNS, application, file, and SAN, among many others. The servers are often connected redundantly to switches to ensure high availability. The Enterprise Edge is the demarcation point between the internal and external facing networks. Here you will find redundant switching infrastructure connecting into the core of the network and all other externally facing modules. 
In a nutshell, if it's going in or out of the internal network, it's going to pass through the enterprise edge. The enterprise edge connects to many different layers or blocks, including the core layer, WAN block, e-commerce block, internet block, and RAS block. So having redundancy and high-performing switches is key. The WAN block connects to the enterprise edge and any of the many possible wide area network transport protocols or technologies. This can be anything from your standard MPLS network connectivity to something more obscure, such as directed wireless connectivity between a headquarters and a branch office located down the street. If you're transporting data from one location to another and not using the internet, then it's going to be using the WAN module. Normally you will not find a lot of switching infrastructure in the WAN block unless it happens to be layer three, but even then because of the WAN connectivity requirements and the interfaces required, usually you're gonna find routers in the WAN block. The e-commerce block is the face of the company to the outside world. It is a storefront for internet users to come and transact with the business or entity that wishes to engage with them. Obviously this needs to be a highly secure area since those who have entered it are on the edge of your private network. So security is going to play a key role here with intrusion detection equipment and firewalls that ensure no unwanted traffic is getting from this block into the internal network. This block is normally comprised of web servers, application servers, firewalls, IDS, and IPS. Intrusion detection systems simply detect if there is unwanted activity or an attack. But IPS systems are prevention systems, and they actually can prevent attacks. The internet block generally serves as the gateway for your internal users to the internet. If they want to browse, perform file transfers, or stream audio or video presentations, their flows would go in and out of this block. Now notice how the internal traffic from your users is not using the same block as those who are coming in from the internet. This ensures that no external users are trying to hijack internal flows. That being said, oftentimes the internal and e-commerce blocks can share the same internet pipe. But if you prefer not to do that, you can use what is called a dual homes connection to two separate internet service providers to make sure that that traffic is segmented. Now, if one internet service provider did fail, you could then allow all traffic over the same circuit as a fail safe. The internet block is comprised of firewalls, routers, HTTP servers, SMTP servers, FTP servers, and DNS servers, to name a few. The RAS block allows for employees or contractors to remotely access your network. Now, 10 years ago, popular solutions might have included dial-up networking solutions. That is, yes, people actually would use a modem to dial into a server. But for the most part, those days are long gone. Now, the typical solution is made via VPN over the internet. Thus, users are using an existing internet connection and then going into the network securely. As long as someone has an internet connection, regardless of where they are, they can get in. Now, VPN concentrators have often been used to accept these external sessions, but Cisco's multifunction ASA platform is now the standard platform for providing both security and VPN services to the RAS block. The RAS block is normally comprised of firewalls and systems that can provide VPN and security solutions all in one, or they can be broken out, such as VPN concentrators, dial-up networking services, and of course, you still want to have your security, so IDS and IPS solutions to actively monitor any unwanted traffic or activity. So let's recap what you've learned. The access layer, as you know, connects to the distribution layer, and it's comprised of layer two switches, workstations, and IP telephones, which connect into those switches, or any other device that requires quote unquote access to the network. The distribution layer is the go-between between, between the access and the core. It can be comprised of layer two or layer three switches, and it is the primary point where quality of service, ACLs, or any type of policy routing, load balancing, or filtering would occur on your network. The core layer connects to the distribution layer, 
the server farm and the edge distribution module. It's comprised of high speed layer 3 switches and provides the following services such as high speed switching, fast convergence, and reliability. This is the quote unquote center point for your network and it must be able to forward traffic quickly. The server farm connects off of the core layer and it's comprised mainly of servers that many people need to reach, such as database, email, or DNS. These servers are often connected to redundant switches because they are critical in nature and must remain up. Therefore, they will remain up and running should there be a network device outage. Now, the edge distribution connects into the core layer, but it is the go-between between, between the campus and the edge. So the edge distribution connects to the WAN block, the e-commerce block, the internet block, and the RAS block, anything on the edge of the enterprise. It's usually comprised of layer three switches. And again, it is the aggregation point for all the links in the enterprise, but it's also the demarcation point that is the line between your internal campus and the edge, which is reached by external users. The WAN block obviously connects to the enterprise edge and provides secure connectivity to remote locations of your enterprise. Now this can be done using MPLS or any other wide area network transport. The e-commerce block again connects to the enterprise edge and it provides a secure internet presence for companies who require online transactions. So here you'll find your web servers, um, application servers, and sometimes even database servers if they're not placed on the internal backend. But obviously you're also gonna have high security in this area because you're allowing external users in. So again, you'll have firewalls, IDS, and IPS. The internet block connects to the enterprise edge and it, obviously it provides internet access for the company and therefore it also must be highly secure. So here you will see firewalls um, as well as sometimes IDS and IPS, but then also you will have your proxy servers or FTP servers or DNS servers that your internal users may need to use or sometimes that external users may need to use as well. And then there's the RAS block. This connects to the enterprise edge and it provides remote access into the enterprise campus network. The most popular way that is done now is using uh, VPN. There, are, Although there are still some dial-up networking servers out there, uh, they're not nearly as prevalent as they were 10 years ago. So here's what you've learned. You've learned in detail about the enterprise campus module and the enterprise edge module. And we have talked about the service provider edge module and as long as you understand that the service pro provider edge is off of your enterprise edge and can provide connectivity, for example, to your e-commerce, uh, to your internet, and for your remote access modules. And I wish you the best of luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, you're going to learn about Layer 2 Campus Infrastructure Best Practices. Specifically in this video, you're going to learn about collapsing the core layer. Then you're going to learn about Cisco NSF with stateful switchover. Then we will discuss Cisco iOS software modularity spanning tree protocol best practices, trunking best practices, and ether channel best practices. This video assumes that you already understand the basics of these technologies and we're moving more into the advanced information and or best practice information that really will not make a lot of sense to you unless you understand the foundation of these topics 
the foundations you can obviously learn in the CCDA or CCNA exams. So let's begin. Let's begin with collapsing the core layer. The process of collapsing the core layer implies combining it with the distribution layer. And this is one of the first decisions small and medium enterprises make when analyzing enterprise campus design. The core layer is the aggregation point for all of the other layers and modules in the enterprise campus architecture. The main technology features required inside the core layer include a high level of redundancy, high speed switching, and high reliability. The core layer devices should be able to implement scalable protocols and technologies, and they should support advanced load balancing mechanisms. Typically, the core layer infrastructure is based on layer three high speed switching and uses hardware accelerated network services. But not all enterprise campus environments need a dedicated core layer. So in some situations, it may be combined with the distribution layer to form what is known as a collapsed core layer architecture, as you can see in this figure. Although some organizations choose to use a collapsed core layer architecture, implementing a dedicated core layer has several advantages over that, including the distribution layer switches can be connected hierarchically to the backbone switches on the core layer. There's less physical cabling, less complex routing environment, improved scalability, easier data and voice integration, it's easier to converge LAN and WAN, improved fault isolation, improved summarization capabilities, and allows for identifiable boundaries. The next topic is Cisco NSF with stateful switchover. Cisco nonstop forwarding with stateful switchover is a high availability feature and can be implemented as a supervisor redundancy mechanism. And in layer two environments, SSO can be used on its own while NSF with SSO can be used in layer three environments. With this feature activated, the standby route processor will take control of the router after a hardware or software fault in the active route processor. Cisco NSF will continue to forward packets until route convergence is complete. And SSO allows the standby RP to take immediate control and maintain connectivity protocols. Now, regarding NSF, if you look at this diagram, Cisco provides some recommendations for each layer in the Service Provider Edge module and the Campus Enterprise module. And here they are. Service Provider Core Layer, the Cisco NSF with SSO feature may provide some benefits, but usually is not required. Service Provider Distribution Layer is a good position for NSF-aware routers. Service Provider Access Layer is the primary deployment position for Cisco NSF with SSO-capable routers. Campus Enterprise Access Layer, this is the secondary deployment position for Cisco NSF with SSO-capable routers. Campus Enterprise Distribution Layer, this is a good position for NSF-aware routers. And then Campus Enterprise Core Layer, and here SSO may provide some benefits. Next, let's talk about Cisco IOS Software Modularity. To add functionality to the Cisco 6500 IOS non-modular software, the new image must be loaded on the active and backup supervisors and a reload must occur before the new software patch can take effect. With Cisco IOS software modularity, this is no longer necessary. The most important advantages of Cisco IOS software modularity are that it minimizes unplanned downtime, it makes software modifications much easier to accomplish. It can be integrated with the change control policy, and it allows for process level policy control. 
To fully understand the Cisco IOS software modularity features, it is necessary to understand the different services that can be implemented in its different distributed subsystems as follows. The control plane, which handles routing and multicast protocols. The data plane, where you will find ACLs, the Ceph forwarding information base, or quality of service, and the management plane. This is the command line interface, or also you will see here, SNMP, NetFlow, or SSH are other examples. The key benefits of the iOS software modularity feature include the following. Operational consistency, that is new command line interface commands are added. Memory protection, Cisco iOS software modularity offers a memory architecture where subprocesses where sub use protected address space only. Fault containment, this increases availability as issues that occur with one process do not affect other parts of the system. Process restartability, the modular processes can be restarted individually. Process modularization, each process is modularized. And then subsystem ISSUs, in-service software upgrades. This means selective system maintenance can be done during runtime is available through individual patches. Now you already understand spanning tree protocol, but let's talk about best practices. Implementing spanning tree is another key issue when considering layer two campus infrastructure best practices. There are several recommendations for spanning tree protocol implementation. First, a VLAN spans multiple access layer switches to support business applications. Spanning tree might be necessary to prevent loops. Second, spanning tree could be implemented to support data center applications on server farms or to protect against user side loops, which can occur in multiple ways, such as workstation misconfiguration, malicious users, or wiring misconfiguration. In addition, network designers should take advantage of the Cisco STP toolkit, which includes the following features that you should already know. And if you do not, please revisit the CCDA or CCNA study series. Port fast, uplink fast, backbone fast, loop guard, root guard, BPDU card, PP, BPDU filter, and UDLD. Next, let's talk about best practices in trunking. Now you understand what trunking is, but some of the most important recommendations when using trunking include the following. Use 802.1Q instead of ISL because the VLAN tag is eternal to the ethernet frame and the frame size is not affected. Set the native VLAN to an unused VLAN. Place all of the unused ports in a non-functional VLAN to increase network security. Use VTP in transparent. Use VTP in transparent mode. Set DTP to desirable with encapsulation negotiate when configuring switch to switch links that will carry multiple VLANs. Manually prune unused VLANs from the trunk interface to avoid the propagation of broadcasts. Hard code all of the access ports as a security countermeasure to VLAN hopping. Finally, let's discuss ether channel recommendations. Ether channels are important when using spanning tree because when all the physical links look like one logical link, spanning tree will not consider them a possible loop threat and will not shut down any link for that specific bundle. Therefore, the links in an ether channel can be dynamically load balanced without interference from spanning tree. Cisco switches support two implementation options when using ether channel, PAGP or LACP. PAGP is port aggregation protocol. It's a Cisco proprietary protocol 
And then there's link aggregation control protocol, which is the open standard. The recommended configuration when using PAGP or layer two ether channels is to set the port modes to desirable on all the members of the bundle to ensure that individual link failures will not lead to a spanning tree failure. The recommended practice for LACP is to configure both sides of the link in the active mode. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about collapsing the core, NSF with SSO, iOS software modularity, STP best practices, trunking best practices, and ether channel best practices. All of this you'll need to know to really master the layer two portion of your exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video we're going to be covering Layer 3 Campus Infrastructure Best Practices. We'll be covering Layer 3 Design Optimization, including Managing Oversubscriptions, Ceph Polarization, Routing Protocol Design, First Hop Redundancy Protocols, and then Layer 2 to Layer 3 Boundary Design. First, let's begin with managing oversubscription. In any network environment, situations will seldom be found in which all the users access the same servers at the same time. The concept of data oversubscription is usually applied at the access and distribution layers and implies understanding that not everyone will be accessing the bandwidth at the same time. Here are a few rules to follow. Data oversubscription recommendations imply a 20 to 1 ratio for the access ports on the access layer to distribution layer uplinks. Some congestion might exist, but this should not happen very often and usually can be solved by applying quality of service techniques. The recommendation for the distribution layer to the core layer is a 4 to 1 ratio. When the bandwidth for the distribution to core layer starts to grow, Oversubscription at the access layer must be controlled and key design decisions must be made. To accommodate for greater needs at the access layer for the end stations, the solution would be to increase the number of uplinks between the distribution layer and the core layer. Another solution involves using ether channels. This will reduce the number of peers because a single logical interface is created. An important configuration aspect when using Ether channels with LACP involves the minimum links feature, which defines the minimum number of member ports that must be up, that is link up, and bundled in the Ether channel for that interface to transition to the up state. The goal of using this feature is to prevent low bandwidth LACP Ether channels from becoming active. Another technique to support the greater needs for bandwidth is to use 10, 10 gigabit per second links. This is recommended instead of ether channel because it has the advantage of not having to add routing complexity and not increasing the number of routing peers. In addition, routing protocols can deterministically find the best path between the distribution and core layers. Next, let's talk about Ceph polarization. As you take a look at this diagram, please note that Ceph operates on all of the multi-layer switches in the figure, and it has a deterministic behavior as packets initiate from the left access layer switch and traverse the network toward the right access layer switch. They all use the same input value for the Ceph hash, and this implies using the same path. This has the negative effect of not utilizing some of the redundant links in the topology, which is known as Ceph polarization. This can be avoided by tuning the Ceph algorithm across the infrastructure layers. The default input hash value in layer 3 
is based on the source and destination values. If this input is changed to layer 3 plus layer 4, adding port number values to the calculation, the output hash value will also change. Cisco recommends using alternating hashes in the core and distribution layers to avoid ignoring and underutilizing redundant links. In the core layer, the default hashes based on layer 3 information should be used, but in the distribution layer, layer 3 plus layer 4 information should be used as the input for the Seth hashing algorithm. Next, let's talk about routing protocols. Routing protocols are usually used in the distribution to core layer and the core layer to core layer connections. An alternative would be moving layer 3 routing implementations to the access layer. The solution is becoming more popular because it avoids the complexity of implementing spanning tree and lowers reconvergence times in large scale deployments. Three methods can be used to quickly reroute around failed links and failed multi-layer switches to provide load balancing with redundant paths. You can build redundant triangle topologies for deterministic convergence. Control unnecessary peering across the access layer by peering only on transit links. And then summarize at the distribution layer to core layer for optimal results. Analyzing this figure, it is usually the access layer devices that have redundant links to the upstream, upstream multi-layer switches. Avoid using square topologies because this will lead to a higher degree of routing protocol convergence if there is a link failure. When using triangle design, each node is directly connected to every other node, so the convergence time is lower. It's important to build the network distribution and core layer design based on triangles so that there are equal cost paths to all the redundant nodes. This will avoid non-deterministic convergence depending on the timers that come with the layer 3 routing protocols. Next, let's talk about first hop redundancy protocols. Another critical aspect of convergence and high availability in network design is the ability to have redundancy on behalf of the end user in the access layer to a first hop or what is known as the default gateway. With layer 2 switches at the access layer and with layer 3 switches at the distribution layer, the default gateway is usually the interface on the distribution layer switch that connects to the access layer. Only first hop redundancy protocols are needed if operating at layer 2 in the access layer and layer three in the distribution layer. Let's learn about each of the first hop redundancy protocols at this time. Let's start with HSRP. HSRP is a Cisco proprietary first hop redundancy protocol. Two versions of HSRP are supported on iOS software. Version one, and this is the default HSRP version. And this restricts the number of configurable HSRP groups to 255. I don't expect you should be exceeding that anytime soon. And then there's version two. Some updates to version two, it uses a new multicast address, among many other things that you can see here. Finally, HSRP authentication gives you the option of plain text or MD5 authentication. MD5 authentication can be configured with or without keychains. When implementing HSRP, two or more routers are configured with a standby IP address on a broadcast interface, usually an Ethernet segment. So while they will each have a local IP address, in this case, dot two and dot three, a passive election is held to determine the active router, which is actually answering for the gateway IP address dot one. The active router answers ARP requests for the standby IP address with a virtual MAC address so that the host sends packets to the gateway IP address, winds up sending it to the active router. Now, if the active router dies, then another election is held. And in this case, traffic would go out the dot three interface, even though traffic would still be pointing to the virtual dot one IP address. 
VRRP is an open standard first hop redundancy protocol, which elects a virtual router master and then virtual router backups. You can configure up to 255 virtual routers on an interface. That is, if your system is capable of handling it. The default VRRP priority value is 100, and that's important to note because the lower you set it, the less likely it's going to take over as the master. The higher you set it, the more likely it will be. The virtual router master is in charge of sending advertisements to the other routers in the same group. In VRRP, it should be noted, can support both plain text and MD5 authentication. So let's say we have three switches with VRRP, which is non-proprietary. In VRRP, one router is elected as the virtual router master, and the other routers are acting as backups in case the virtual router master fails. So in this case, the master has been elected Dot three and dot four will serve as backups to dot two. Dot two will answer to the virtual IP address. And if it were to fail, then a backup device would take over. In this example, that would be the dot three device. And if the dot three system failed, then the final backup system, dot four, would take over. Next, let's cover GLBP. GLBP allows multiple gateways in the same GLBP group to actively forward traffic. So instead of just one device forwarding traffic, you can have multiple. Gateway, gateways communicate via hellos messages that are sent by default every three seconds. The GLBP group members elect one gateway to be the AVG. Now the AVG answers all ARP requests to the virtual router address and assigns a virtual MAC address to each member of the GLBP group. GLBP has many other features, but you should really focus on the fact that GLBP does provide load sharing and many different load sharing methods, host dependent, round robin, and weighted. And it does support plain text and or MD5 authentication. But the big advantage and the question you're most likely to get regarding GLBP is when would you use it? And you would use it if you would like to load balance between devices. GLBP provides a standby IP just as HSRP, but it also provides multiple virtual MAC addresses. So when a host on the connected network sends an ARP request, one of the routers answers with the virtual MAC address. Now this does allow for load balancing. You can load balance across multiple systems instead of just relying on one system to serve all the traffic. In this case, we're gonna load balance 50% to router one, 20% to router two, and 30% of the traffic to router three. This can be done because you're using virtual MAC addresses, which take turns answering traffic requests. If a router were to fail, the other remaining routers could take over for all the traffic. Finally, let's talk about designing the layer two to layer three boundary. There are a few notes you need to remember. Depending on the network topology and the devices used, different design models for the layer two to layer three boundary can be used. If the access layer uses layer two devices and the distribution layer uses layer three, the links between distribution layer switches can be layer two trunks to support layer two at the access layer. When using layer two trunks at the distribution layer switches, a best practice would be to use RSTP, Rapid Spanning Tree Protocol, as the STP version and place HSRP active device in the primary STP root bridge on the same distribution layer switch. This design is more complex than the one that uses layer three interconnections between distribution layer devices because spanning tree convergence must be taken into consideration. Layer three interconnection design at the distribution layer is the recommended design 
and some of its advantages include spanning tree convergence is not an issue, and then layer 3 VLAN numbers can be mapped to layer 3 subnets, reducing management overhead. Here are some of the biggest advantages of rolling out a complete layer 3 environment. Simplified implementation, faster convergence, equal cost load balancing on all of the links, eliminates the need for spanning tree, first hop redundancy protocol configurations are not necessary, and the convergence time to reroute on a failed link is much faster. So in this video, you've received some important advice on how to do well on your architecture exam. Specifically, we covered oversubscription. We've covered Ceph polarization, routing protocol best practices, first hop redundancy protocols, and finally, some key tips on designing the layer two to layer three boundary. I wish you the best of luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video, you're going to learn about Cisco virtualization. In this video, you're going to learn about the advantages of virtualization, its drivers, the types of virtualization, and finally, the platforms that support virtualization. So let's begin. The official definition of computer virtualization is the pooling and abstraction of resources and services in a way that masks the physical nature and boundaries of those resources and services. A good example is a VLAN because it masks the physical nature of resources. The concept of virtualization dates all the way back to the 1970s with IBM mainframes. These mainframes were separated into virtual machines so that different tasks could run separately and to prevent a process failure that could affect the entire system. One of the issues that IT departments face today is called server sprawl. This concept implies that each application is installed on its own server and every time another server is added, issues such as power, space and cooling must be addressed. These are just a few of the many issues and none of them are cost effective. However, these challenges can be mitigated with server virtualization that allows the partitioning of a physical server to work with multiple operating systems and application instances. The most important advantages are improved failover capabilities, better utilization of resources, and a smaller footprint. Virtualization is a concept that applies to many areas in modern IT infrastructures, and it's not limited to servers. It can include networks, storage, applications, and desktop. Network virtualization refers to one physical network supporting a wide array of logical topologies. This allows actions such as outsourcing by the IT department where a logical topology can be created that can be accessed by external IT professionals. Network virtualization with Cisco products is typically classified into four areas. Control plane virtualization. This is making sure processes like routing are separated and distinct so routing process failure will not affect the entire device. Data plane virtualization. This is done every time different streams of data traffic are multiplexed. That is, different forms of traffic are placed on the same medium. The simplest example of data plane virtualization is a trunk link between two devices. Management plane virtualization. This implies the ability to make a software upgrade on a device without rebooting that device or having it lose its capabilities to communicate on the network. And then pooling and clustering. 
This, for example, is used on the Cisco Catalyst 6500 virtual switching system, and it works by creating pools of devices that act as a single device. Another example is the Nexus VPC, or virtual port channel, which allows Ether channels to be created that span across multiple devices. Virtualization has become a critical component in most enterprise networks because of modern demands in IT, including increasing efficiency while reducing capital and operational costs. Virtualization is a critical component of the Cisco enterprise network architecture. Virtualization can represent a variety of technologies, including extracting the logical components from hardware or networks and implementing them into a virtual environment. Some of the drivers behind implementing a virtualized environment are as follows. The need to reduce the number of physical devices that perform individual tasks. The need to reduce operational costs. The need to increase productivity. The need for flexible connectivity. And the need to eliminate underutilized hardware. Virtualization can be implemented at both the network and the device level. Network virtualization involves the creation of network partitions that run on physical infrastructure, with each logical partition acting as an independent network. Network virtualization can include VLANs, vSANs, VPNs, and VRFs. On the other hand, device virtualization allows logical devices to run independently of each other on a single physical machine. Virtual hardware devices are created in software and have the same functionality as real hardware devices. The possibility of combining multiple physical devices into one single logical unit also exists. The Cisco Enterprise Network Architecture contains multiple forms of network and device virtualization, such as the following. Virtual machines, virtual switches, virtual LANs, virtual private networks, virtual storage area networks, virtual switching systems, virtual routing and forwarding, virtual port channels, and virtual device contexts. Device contexts allow the partitioning of a single partition into multiple virtual devices called contexts. A context acts as an independent device with its own set of policies. The majority of features implemented on the real device are also functional on the virtual context. Some of the devices in the Cisco portfolio that support virtual contexts include the following. Cisco ASA, Cisco ASE, Cisco IPS, and Cisco Nexus series. Server virtualization allows the server's resources to be extracted in order to offer flexibility and usage optimization in the infrastructure. The result is that data center applications are no longer tied to specific hardware resources, so the applications are unaware of the underlying hardware. Server virtualization solutions are produced by companies such as VMware, Microsoft, and Citrix. Now, all this being said, there are unique design considerations to network virtualization. Network solutions are needed to solve the challenges of sharing network resources, but keeping users totally separate from one another. Although the users are separate, we need to ensure that the network is highly available, secure, and can scale along with business growth. Network virtualization offers solutions to these challenges and provides design considerations around access control, path isolation, and services edge. Regarding access control, access needs to be controlled to ensure that users and devices are identified and authorized for entry to their assigned network segment. Security at the access layer is critical for protecting the network from threats, both internal and external. Path isolation. This involves the creation of independent logical network paths over a shared network infrastructure. MPLS VPN is an example of path isolation technique, where devices are mapped to a VRF to access 
the correct set of network resources. Other segmentation options include VLANs and vSANs, which logically separate LANs and SANs. The main goal when segmenting the network is to improve the scalability, resiliency, and security services as with non-segmented networks. Services Edge The Services Edge refers to making network services available to the intended users and devices with an enforced centralized managed policy. Separate groups or devices occasionally need to share information that may be on different VLANs, each with corresponding group policies. In such cases, the network should have a central way to manage the policy and control access to the resources. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about Cisco virtualization, the dip different types of virtualization, but also the platforms that support this type of virtualization. The fact is this type of software defined networking is radically changing how engineers are going to design their networks. And to understand this is not only important for your CCDA exam, but as you go forward in your career. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, you're going to learn about designing a wireless network. Specifically, we're gonna give you an overview, a refresh of wireless LANs and their components, discuss in detail the 802.11 standard, and then we'll dig into specifically wireless design, including redundancy, RF groups and site surveys, and then finally, mesh wireless design. So let's begin. So wireless LANs provide network connectivity almost anywhere. Surely you use wireless LANs. If, if you're in technology, surely you're using them, whether it's your mobile phone or your laptop, whether you're at a coffee shop or at your place of business doing BYOD. Wireless LANs typically can be implemented at much less cost than traditional wired LANs. The wired infrastructure is, of course, based on the 802.3 standards, but a wireless network uses radio waves to transmit data and, con and to connect devices. So as you surely know, a wireless network uses radio waves to transmit data and connect devices. Wireless LANs are defined by the 802.11 standards. Now, some additional advantages of wireless LANs over wired LANs include the following. Monetary cost, uh, flexibility, uh, that you allow users to roam in places where they normally cannot or uh, use their devices in places they always wish they could. Load distribution and finally redundancy. And we'll get into this in a little bit, but using these wireless access points, um, multiple wireless access points in one area can provide redundancy and load distribution at a much more affordable cost than wired LANs. Now, there are, there are certain components that make up wireless LANs, and let's start with the client, uh, specifically you or any of our customers. Uh, clients are basically an appliance that interfaces with the wireless medium. Now, again, that could be a mobile device. It could be a laptop. It could be a tablet. It could be a PC, but it's basically a device that operates as an end user device. An access point functions as a bridge, basically, between the endpoints and the existing network backbone. So the access point is what the endpoints are actually communicating with. And as they roam, they may change access points throughout the building, but the access points are actually what are getting them access to the network. As you can see in this picture, access points come in many different shapes and sizes. These are just a few examples of access points. The distribution system plays a key role in communications between the customer who's trying to get on the wireless network and the major wireless LAN components, 
that are actually switching routing the traffic. The distribution system allows for the interconnection of the APs of multiple cells. Think of your organization. If you have one area that's considered a lab and it's a wireless lab, and that ultimately needs to communicate with marketing on the eighth floor, there's, you're going to need a distribution system to communicate between those two locations. The wireless distribution system allows you to connect multiple access points. So with wireless distribution systems, APs can communicate with one another without wires in a standardized way. Now that being said, distributions could be wired or integrated. But this capability of communications between access points is absolutely critical in providing a seamless experience for roaming clients and for managing multiple wireless networks. It can also simplify the network infrastructure by reducing the amount of cabling required. Another concept you need to understand is the basic service set. The wireless architecture divides the system into cells referred to as basic service set. And it's controlled by a base station or more commonly an access point. Now an extended service set is a set of connected BSSs. And then there's the independent basic service set, which is a wireless network consisting of at least two endpoints and no distribution system. So let's draw this out so we can get a better understanding of what we learned thus far. So in any wireless implementation, you're going to have endpoints that need to connect. So for example, here's a laptop that is connecting to the wireless network. It connects to the wireless network through an access point. The access point is sending out the radio waves which are being received by the laptop. The laptop endpoint then connects onto the wireless network, assuming it has the proper security configurations, and it can then reach the network. Now access points can communicate not only with laptops, but again, mobile phones. And you can think of this as a basic service set. Now, let's say in a different area, we have another access point, which is also serving customers or users. And this again, could be a server, it could be a workstation, could be a printer, but regardless, it's servicing endpoints. It's a different implementation, different part of the building or a different building altogether, but this is another basic service set. So how do these two basic service sets communicate? Well, they use, as you, as you have already learned, they use a distribution system. These two DSs can uplink in many ways via wireless, or in this case that we're looking, here's a wired connection. This is the distribution system that is allowing these two separate wireless implementations or basic service sets to communicate. Now, if we look at the big picture, both of these basic service sets and the distribution system, the big picture, this is the extended service set. This includes all of the wireless equipment and any equipment used to connect the wireless equipment together. The IEEE 802 standards define two separate layers for the data link of the OSI model. As you know, that these two layers are the LLC and the MAC sublayers. The 802.11 standards cover the operation of the MAC sublayer and the physical layer. The 802.11 frame consists of a 32-byte MAC header, variable length, and a frame check sequence. Next, let's talk about Cisco Unified Wireless Networking. The Cisco Unified Wireless Network concept includes the following elements. Wireless clients, this includes laptops, workstations, etc. Access points, this provides access to the wireless network. Network management, this is accomplished through network wireless control system. It's a centralized management tool 
that allows for design and control of wireless networks. Network unification, the wireless LAN system needs to be able to support wireless applications by offering unified security policies to quality of service and RF management. So the, the WLCs or wireless LAN controllers offer this unified integration functionality. And then network services. Wireless network services are also referred to as mobility services and they include guest access or voice services, location services, and even threat detection and mitigation. Standalone access points are also known as autonomous access points. They're obviously very easy to install, but the thing is they can be difficult to manage in large deployments. They're not as desirable as the lightweight access points from Cisco because they must be managed individually. In addition, different parameters must be configured manually on each device, including SSID, VLAN, and security features. The Cisco Unified Wireless Network introduced the concept of lightweight access points and wireless LAN controllers, that's LWAPs and WLCs. These two types of wireless devices divide responsibilities and functionalities that an autonomous access point would normally perform on its own. This technology adds scalability by separating the wireless LAN data plane from the control plane into a split MAC design. Lightweight access points focus only on the actual RF transmissions and the necessary real-time control operations, such as beaconing, probing, and buffering. Now, wireless LAN controllers manage all non-real-time tasks, such as SSID management, VLAN management, um, access point association management, authentication, and quality of service. When using lightweight access points, all RF traffic they receive must first go to the wireless LAN controller device that manage this, manages the specific access point. This changes the way in which traditional wireless LAN communication works, even for hosts associated to the same access point. The RF communication between lightweight access points and wireless LAN controllers is handled using the lightweight access point protocol. The lightweight access point tunnel can operate in either layer two or layer three mode. In layer two mode, the access point and wireless LAN controllers share the same VLAN, subnet, and functions with the lightweight access point, receiving 802.11 frames and encapsulating them inside Ethernet toward the wireless LAN controller. When the lightweight access point tunnel operates in layer three mode, the lightweight access point receives 802.11 frames and encapsulates them inside of UDP toward the wireless LAN controller. So this implies that the wireless LAN controller can be anywhere as long as it is reachable by the access point. The Cisco Lightweight Access Point Protocol can operate in the following six modes. Local mode, REAP or Remote Edge Access Point mode, Monitor, Road Detector mode, Sniffer mode, and Bridge mode. Every 180 seconds, the access point spends 60 milliseconds on channels on which it does not operate. During the 60 millisecond time period, the access point performs noise and interference measurements and scans for intrusion detection events. The REAP mode allows the lightweight access point to reside across a LAN link and still be able to communicate with the wireless LAN controller and provide the functionality of a regular lightweight access point. REAP mode is not supported on all lightweight access point models. Monitor mode is a special feature that allows lightweight access point enabled APs to exclude themselves from dealing with data traffic between clients. Instead, they act as dedicated sensors for location-based services, rogue AP detection, and for IDS. In RD mode, the lightweight access point monitors for rogue APs. The, ro the goal of this rogue detection of APs is to see all the VLANs in the network because rogue APs can be connected to any of those VLANs. Sniffer mode allows the lightweight access point to capture and forward all the packets on a particular channel to a remote machine that is running packet capturing software. And finally, bridge mode typically operates on outdoor APs that function in a mesh topology. This cost-effective high bandwidth wireless bridging connectivity mechanism includes point-to-point -point or multi-point bridging. 
One of the main features of a wireless LAN solution is the user's ability to access network resources from different areas. End users most likely move from one location to another, so designers should scale the wireless network carefully to allow for client roaming. Wireless roaming can be divided into the following two categories, intra-controller roaming or inter-controller roaming. Intra-controller roaming occurs when a client moves its association from one AP to another AP controlled by the same wireless LAN controller. Inter-controller roaming can operate in either layer two or layer three mode. In layer two, inter-control roaming moves users from AP to AP and from WLC to WLC, but they remain in the same subnet. Layer three inter-controller roaming is more difficult to implement because users can move from AP to AP and WLC to WLC from subnet to subnet as well. In this scenario, the wireless LAN controllers must be configured with mobility groups. Wireless LAN controllers can be configured for dynamic or deterministic redundancy. For deterministic redundancy, the AP is configured with a primary, secondary, and tertiary controller. This requires more upfront planning, but allows for better predictability and faster failover times. Deterministic redundancy is the recommended best practice. N plus 1, N plus N, and N plus N plus 1 are examples of deterministic redundancy. With N plus 1 redundancy, a single wireless LAN controller acts as the backup of multiple wireless LAN controllers. The backup WLC is configured as the secondary WLC on each AP. One design constraint is that the backup WLC might become oversubscribed if there are too many failures of the primary controllers. The secondary WLC is the backup controller for all APs and is normally placed in the data center. With N plus N redundancy, an equal number of controllers back each other up. For example, a pair of WLCs on one floor serves as a backup to a second pair on another floor. The top WLC is primary for AP1 and AP2, and the secondary for AP3 and AP4. The bottom WLC is the primary for AP3 and AP4, and secondary for AP1 and AP2. There should be enough capacity on each controller to manage a failover situation. With M plus M plus 1 redundancy, an equal number of controllers back each other up. Plus, a backup WLC is configured as the tertiary. M plus M plus 1 redundancy functions the same as M plus N redundancy, plus a tertiary controller that backs up the secondary controllers. The tertiary WLC is placed in the data center or network operations center. Here is a summary of wireless LAN controller redundancy. It would be good to memorize this in preparation for your exam. RF surveys are done to determine design parameters for wireless LANs and customer requirements. RF site surveys help determine the coverage areas and check for RF interference. This helps determine the appropriate placement of wireless APs. The RF site survey has the following steps. Define customer requirements such as service levels and support for VoIP. Determine devices to support. Obtain a facility diagram to identify the potential RF obstacles. Visually inspect the facility to look for potential barriers to the propagation of RF signals. Identify user areas that may be intensively used, such as conference rooms, and areas that are not heavily used, such as stairwells. Determine preliminary AP locations, which need power, wired network access, cell coverage, and overlap not to mention channel selection, mounting locations, and antennas. Let's talk about wireless mesh for outdoor wireless. Traditionally, outdoor wireless solutions have been limited to point-to-point, point-to-multipoint -to -point bridging between buildings. With these solutions, each AP is wired to the network. The Cisco Wireless Mesh Networking Solution eliminates the need to wire each AP and allows users to roam from one area to another without having to reconnect. The wireless mesh components are shown here. The WCS, the WLC, the RAP, and the MAP. The following are Cisco recommendations for mesh design. 
There is under 10 millisecond latency per hop, typically two to three millisecond. For outdoor deployment, four or fewer hops are recommended for best performance with a maximum of eight. For indoor deployment, one hop is supported. For best performance, 20 MAP nodes per wrap is recommended. Up to 32 maps is supported per wrap. Throughput, one hop, 14 megabits per second, two hops, seven megabits per second, three hops, three megabit, and four hops, one megabits per second. As you can see here, you have five primary design items, number of APs, placement of APs, power for APs, number of WLCs, and placement of WLCs. The following points summarize wireless LAN design. An RF site survey is used to determine a wireless network's RF characteristics and AP placement. Outdoor wireless networks are supported using outdoor APs and Cisco wireless mesh networking APs. Campus wireless network design provides RF coverage for wireless clients in the campus using LWAPs. Each AP should be limited to 20 data devices and a data wireless LAN. So here's what you've learned. You've received an overview of wireless LANs. You've learned about the 802.11 standard. Surely these are probably refreshers for you, but good information to know going into your CCDP examinations. And then you went into wireless design, specifically what it takes to design a wireless network. All of this information will be very helpful to you, not only as you take your exam, but also as you put it into practice as an engineer. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, you're going to learn about designing quality of service. Specifically, we're going to be going over the following categories of quality of service classification, congestion management, link efficiency mechanisms, and then traffic shaping and policing. Let's talk about quality of service at a higher level and then discuss the quality of service concepts that Cisco wants you to know for the CCDA exam. Quality of service is a tool for managing a WAN's available bandwidth. Now, quality of service does not and bad, add bandwidth, but it helps you make better use of what you have. If you have chronic congestion issues, quality of service should not be the primary answer to resolving that problem. You need to add more bandwidth. However, by prioritizing traffic using quality of service, you can make sure that your most critical traffic gets the best treatment and available bandwidth in times of congestion. One popular quality of service technique is to classify your traffic based on a specific protocol type or matching access list, and then giving a policy treatment to that specific class. You can define many classes to match or identify your most important traffic classes, for example, video or voice. And then the remaining unmatched traffic then uses a default class, which is the traffic that can be treated as best effort. So let's begin with classification. For a flow to have priority, it must first be identified and marked. Both of these tasks are referred to as classification. The following are popular technologies which support classification. NBAR, it's a technology that uses deep packet content inspection to identify network applications. So an advantage of NBAR is that it can recognize applications even when they do not use standard network ports. Also, it matches fields at the application layer. Before NBAR, classification was limited to layer 4 TCP and UDP port numbers, but NBAR has changed that. Next is CAR committed access rate and uses an ACL to set precedence and allows customization 
of the precedence assignment by the user uh, source or destination IP address or even application type. Next, let's talk about congestion management. There are two types of output queues that are available on routers, hardware and software. The hardware queue simply uses FIFO, first in, first out. But the software queue schedules packets first and then places them in the hardware queue. Now keep in mind that the software queue is only used during periods of congestion. The software queue uses quality of service techniques such as priority queuing, custom queuing, weighted fair queuing, class-based weighted fair queuing, low latency queuing, and traffic shaping and policing. Let's go through each of one of those. Cisco does not expect you to know each of these in detail. Again, that would be later in your CCDP studies. But that being said, they want you to understand what each of these are. Priority queuing is a queuing method that establishes four interface output queues that serve different priority levels, which are high, medium, default, and low. Unfortunately, priority queuing can starve other queues if too much data is in one queue, because higher priority queues must be emptied first before lower priority queues. Next, there is custom queuing. It uses up to 16 individual output queues Byte size limits are assigned to each queue so that when the limit is reached, it proceeds to the next queue. The network operator can customize these limits and custom queuing is obviously fairer than priority queuing because it allows some level of service to all traffic. But this is really a legacy solution because there are improvements in the queuing methods which we'll talk about next. Weighted fair queuing ensures that traffic is separated into individual flows or sessions without requiring that you define access lists. Weighted fair queuing uses two categories to group sessions, high and low bandwidth. Low bandwidth traffic has priority over high bandwidth traffic, and high bandwidth traffic shares the service according to assigned weight values. Please know that weighted fair queuing is the default quality of service mechanism on interfaces below 2 megabits per second. Weighted fair queuing is not the best option in every scenario because it doesn't provide enough control in the configuration. But it is far better than the first in first out approach because interactive traffic flows that generally use small packets do get the priority they need in the software queue. As you can see in this diagram, the different weighted fair queue traffic flows are placed into different queues before entering the weighted fair queue scheduler, which will then allow them to pass to the hardware queue based upon the defined logic. If one queue fills, the packets will be dropped, but this will also be based on the weighted fair queue approach, that is, lower priority packets are dropped first, as opposed to the first in, first out approach of tail dropping. Next is class-based weighted fair queuing. It extends weighted fair queuing capabilities by providing support for modular user-defined traffic classes. Class-based weighted fair queuing lets you define traffic classes that correspond to match criteria, including ACLs, protocols, and input interfaces. Traffic that matches the class criteria belongs to that specific class, and each class has a defined queue that corresponds to an output interface. So after traffic has been matched and belongs to a specific class, you can modify its characteristics such as assigning bandwidth, maximum queue limit, and weight. As you see in the picture here, certain classes receive higher priority than other classes. As you can see here, class-based weighted fair queuing logic is based on the class-based weighted fair queue scheduler that receives information from queues defined for different forms of traffic. The traffic that does not fit any manually defined queue automatically falls into the class default queue. These queues can be assigned minimum bandwidth guarantees for all traffic classes. Class-based weighted fair queuing offers powerful methodologies for controlling exactly how much bandwidth these various classifications will receive. If it contains more than one traffic type, each individual queue will use the first-in, first-out method inside the hardware queue. 
so the network designer should not combine too many forms of traffic inside of a single queue. Considering the inefficiency of class-based waiter fare queuing when using VoIP, another quality of service technique was developed, and that is low latency queuing. Adding a priority queue to class-based waiter fare queuing will not lead to starvation because this queue is policed so that the amount of bandwidth guaranteed simply for voice cannot exceed a particular value. Since voice traffic gets its own priority treatment, the remaining traffic forms will use weighted fair queuing based on bandwidth reservation values. Unlike priority queuing, low latency queuing provides for a maximum threshold on the priority queue, and this will prevent lower priority traffic from being starved by the priority queue. Now that we've talked about queuing, let's talk about traffic shaping and policing. Traffic shaping and policing are mechanisms that inspect traffic and then take action based on the traffic's characteristics, such as DSCP or IP precedence bits set in the IP header. Traffic shaping slows down the rate at which packets are sent out an interface by matching certain criteria. Traffic shipping uses a token bucket technique to release the packets into the output queue at a pre-configured rate. So this helps eliminate potential bottlenecks by throttling back the traffic rate at the source. Traffic shipping is used on larger networks to smooth the flow of traffic going out to the provider. This is desirable for a few reasons. In provider networks, it prevents the provider from dropping traffic that exceeds the contracted rate. Now, policing is a little bit different because it tags or drops traffic depending on the match criteria. Generally speaking, policing is used to set the limit of incoming traffic into an interface, and then it will drop traffic that exceeds what the settings were. One example of using policing is to give preferential treatment to critical application traffic by elevating to a higher class and reducing best effort traffic to a lower priority class. The best way to compare shaping with policing is to remember that shaping buffers packets. Policing does not. It can be configured to drop packets. Our final topic is link efficiency. Within Cisco IOS, there are several link efficiency mechanisms available, as you can see here. There's LFI, which is used to reduce delay or jitter on slower speed links. Multi-link PPP, which bonds multiple links together between no two nodes, which can increase available bandwidth. And then RTP, real-time transport header compression, which, comp which provides increased efficiency for applications that take advantage of RTP on slower links. So here's what you've learned. You've received a high-level overview of quality of service. And then you learn about quality of service functions, such as classification, congestion management, link efficiency mechanisms, and then traffic shaping and policing. And I wish you the best of luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video, you're going to learn about what you need to know for network management for your architecture exam. Specifically, you're going to learn about network management tools such as NBAR, Armon, SNMP, IPSLA, NetFlow, CDP, and then the FCAPS network management model. Obviously, there's a lot to learn, but there's a lot to know for the exam. So let's go ahead and get started with NBAR. Network-based application recognition is a Cisco IOS embedded technology that helps identify well-known applications, protocols, and services. It offers an application-level intelligent classification engine that recognizes many protocols and applications for the delivery of quality of service. Some of the protocols that are automatically recognized by NBAR are shown below. 
Obviously, many of these will look familiar to you, but this is just the beginning of what MBAR can recognize. A special feature of MBAR called protocol discovery can be applied to interfaces and it allows them to automatically discover the application protocols that run over that interface at any point in time. This can monitor all ingress and egress traffic on the specific interface and then build statistics on a protocol by protocol basis. These statistics help to deliver the traffic classes and policies and contain input packets, output packets, number of bytes, and input and output bit rates. NBAR and NetFlow are complementary embedded technologies that have some overlapping functionalities. The most important differences between these two mechanisms is that NBAR offers deep packet inspection and NetFlow traditionally works based on the type of service and the interface. MBAR can work with AutoQOS, which is a feature of the Cisco IOS that generates predefined policy maps for voice. So this can help simplify the deployment and provisioning of quality services by using MBAR traffic classification. AutoQOS works by creating a trust zone that allows DSCP markings to be used for classification. MBAR can be used to mark these DSCP values dynamically. Another feature that can be used with MBAR is QoS for the Enterprise Network, which uses MBAR discovery to collect traffic statistics. Then based on that discovery, MBAR will generate policy maps and make its bandwidth settings via Cisco suggestions on a class-by-class -class basis. Next, let's talk about remote network monitoring. Armon is a MIB that allows proactive monitoring of LAN traffic in the network environment. It tracks individual data packets, the number and size of those packets, broadcast packet tracking, and network utilization errors and statistics. Armon agents run on various network devices, such as routers, switches, or servers. To save overhead on those specific devices, Armon can be configured on special workstations that operate as probes on specific network segments. Armon can diagnose faults within the LAN and allows for network tuning and planning for future growth. Armon is implemented in two versions, Armon 1 and Armon 2. Armon 1 operates only at the physical and data link layers, but Armon 2 operates at all seven layers of the OSI model, so it can monitor such things as database servers, exchange servers, or even web traffic. Next, let's discuss simple network management protocol. SNMP is an application layer protocol that provides a message format for communication between SNMP managers and agents. SNMP provides a standardized framework and a common language used for the monitoring and management of devices in a network. The SNMP framework has three parts, an SNMP manager, an SNMP agent, and a MIB. Let's cover these in depth. The SNMP manager is the system used to control and monitor the activities of network hosts using SNMP. The most common managing system is called the network management system or NMS. The term NMS can be applied to either a dedicated device used for network management or the applications used on such a device. The SNMP agent is a software component within the managed device that maintains the data for the device and reports these data as needed to, managed, to managing systems. The agent and the MIB reside on the routing device or the switch. The SNMP agent contains MIB variables whose values the SNMP manager can request or change through get or set operations. A manager can get a value from an agent or store a value onto that agent. A key feature of SNMP is the ability to generate notifications from the SNMP agent. These notifications do not require that the request be sent from the SNMP manager. There's unsolicited messages or notifications, and these can be generated as traps or inform requests. Traps are messages alerting the SNMP manager to a condition on the network, and inform requests are traps 
that include a request for confirmation of receipt from the SNMP manager. Now, notifications can indicate improper user authentication or restarts, the closing of a connection or loss of connection to a neighbor router, or other significant events. Traps are often preferred because informs consume more resources in the router or on the switch in the network. Unlike a trap, which is discarded as soon as it is sent, an inform request must be held in memory until a response is received or the request times out. Also, traps are sent only once, while an inform may be retried several times. The retries do increase traffic and contribute to higher overhead on the network. There are three SNMP versions that you should be aware of. Version 1, which is the full internet standard defined in the initial RFC 1157. SNMP version 2C, which is community string based administrative framework. The C stands for community, and it is an experimental internet protocol defined in RFC 1901, 05, and 06. Now, that being said, SNMP version 3 is an interoperable standards based protocol defined in RFCs 2273 and 2275. SNMP version 3 provides secure access to devices by a combination of authenticating and encrypting packets over the network. The security features provided in SNMP version 3 are as follows. Message integrity, which ensures that a packet has not been tampered with in transit. Authentication, which de determines that the message is actually from a valid source. And encryption, which scrambles the contents of a packet to prevent it from being learned from an unauthorized source. On to IPSLA. IPSLA allows you to monitor, analyze, and verify IP service levels. It's comprised of two components, a source and a target. Operations can broadly be categorized into five functional areas. Let's take a look at an example. You can use IP SLAs to monitor the performance between any area in the network, core distribution and edge, without deploying a physical probe. It uses generated traffic to measure network performance between two networking devices. So as we draw this out, this shows how IP SLAs begins when the source device sends a generated packet to the destination device. After the destination device receives the packet, depending on the type of IP SLA's operation, it responds with the timestamp information for the source to make the calculation on performance metrics. It then can communicate with a performance management application via SNMP to provide real-time analysis of the network. It should be noticed that IP SLA can communicate with any IP device on the network that's enabled for these types of measurements. You're probably already aware of syslog, that it's a protocol that simply allows a host to send out event notification mes messages. A syslog daemon or server is an entity that listens to the syslog messages. It uses UDP as the underlying transport mechanism. Next. Next, let's talk about NetFlow. NetFlow gives you different capabilities than SNMP. And let's say, for example, we have a web server and uh, an uh, IP phone, and they're connected to a switch. Now, NetFlow, as we build out this network, NetFlow is something that would run on the router that supports all of these devices that would analyze the communications going to and from them. So here's our UC server. And here's our, here's our collection server, our data collection server. NetFlow is gonna analyze the specific, the specific flows between, let's say the phone and the, in the unified communication server or out to the web. Um, you can get very granular and look at traffic and it will help you make decisions on your network, which could include um, quality of service configurations. Next, let's cover CDP. 
CDP is a proprietary Cisco protocol that operates at layer two between Cisco devices. Its main job is to summarize information it discovers about directly connected routers, switches, or other Cisco devices. The Cisco devices themselves do not forward any CDP frames to their other neighbors because their role is to share device information only between directly connected devices. Next, let's talk about the FCAPS network management model. Specifically, you're going to be, learn about the five domains of FCAPS, which are fault configuration, accounting, performance, and security management. So let's go ahead and dig in, and we will begin with fault management. Fault management deals with error conditions that can cause administrators and users to lose functionality, resulting in not being able to use certain network resources. So this is a key area for network management. Fault management activities include finding abnormal network operations and isolating and correcting the faults that do occur. This is accomplished in the following five steps. First, detecting the problem, then diagnosing the fault, bypass and recover from the issue, resolve the situation, and then track and manage the problem. The two main components of fault management are the event generators, and these are the devices that generate the events, such as a router or switch, and then the event collectors, such as the SNMP server um, or syslog server, for example. The events sent from the event generators to the event collectors can be one of the following. State events, which are sent when a network device changes its state, such as a link going up or down. Or performance events, when issues are happening on the device that you should be aware of, such as disk, disk space usage getting low, link errors, or high CPU. Once the event generator produces events, they are collected and processed by the EMS, and Cisco Works would be an example of that. And this follows a five-step process. First, there's event collection, event normalization, which is normalizing the syslog events based on their timestamps, event filtering, for example, ignoring low priority events, event correlation, and then event reporting. And the event reporting can be, for example, in a text file or even a GUI format. The next area we're going to talk about is configuration management. This is the process of collecting different information on the network, driving consistency throughout all network devices, tracking changes in the network, and then ensuring network documentation is up to date. The configuration management process also includes tracking and storing software versioning of all the network devices and making sure the most recently updated iOS and the most recent software builds are used for all of the systems. It also allows the availability of improving all the devices with the overall goal of configuration management to lower the time and cost overhead. For example, by building an efficient configuration management system with Cisco Works, you can lower the total cost of ownership of network infrastructure because fewer administrators will be required to work on those specific tasks. The next area we're going to discuss is accounting management. This is the area that usually uses AAA services. There are a few different approaches regarding accounting management, for example, intra-organization management or inter-organization management. If the AAA services are implemented within the company, that is intra, you will need to make sure people who are they claim to be when they try to access an object or do something on a device. Then you must authorize what they can do with those objects or devices. After that, you need to account for what activities they are engaging in. Sometimes you do this for billing purposes with customers. Account management helps manage resources between the individuals in the company. An ISP would use the accounting management aspect to offer 
flexible billing plans to their customers and to track usage of network resources on a customer by customer basis. The next area we'll discuss is performance management. This area is usually managed by a system administrator or by a network administrator or engineer. The network designer should ensure that the organization has performance management techniques in place so that the overall management guidelines are followed. The goal of performance management is to keep the network uncongested 24 seven with all of the devices accessible. Another goal is to reduce overhead and downtime. A recommended target to achieve is 99.9 .9 network uptime, although you've certainly heard of five nines before for mission critical services. An important part of performance management is to provide service level management or service level agreements, which are established with the customers. This is a proven methodology to ensure that you can deliver the promised services to the organization or the customer that requires those services. Part of performance management is to identify trends in network operations, such as the usage of bandwidth, application usage in other support services and intelligence services, as well as performing a what if analysis as you would find with capacity planning. The last area of FCAPS is security management. The goal of security management is to ensure that you have access control to network resources and you can prevent intentional or accidental changes to a particular object or device and also prevent unauthorized access to sensitive corporate information. Some of the protocols and tools that can be used with security management on the routers, switches, and other devices include the following. Telnet, or what is preferred SSH, for connecting to devices. SSH is preferred due to its encryption abilities. SNMP for management and monitoring. HTTP and HTTPS for web access to the device. RADIUS and TACX for authentication and authorization. And AAA. So here's what you've learned. You've received a nice high level overview of FCAPS network management model. And this is very important for your CCDA exam. You certainly will be asked on each of the areas within this model. Just a reminder, you learned about fault, configuration, accounting, performance, and security management. Good luck in your studies. So you've learned a lot about network management in this video. Specifically, you've learned about network-based application recognition, remote monitoring, simple network management protocol, IP SLA, NetFlow, CDP, and the FCAPS network management model. All of this you're going to need to know for your architecture exam, and I wish you the best of luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, you're going to learn about the importance of IP addressing. Specifically in this video, we're going to learn about the importance of IP addressing design. And then we're going to do a brief review of subnetting and public and private addressing with the understanding that with subnetting and public and private addressing, you gained most of your knowledge in the CCDA series. So let's go ahead and begin with the importance of IP addressing design. One of the major concerns in the network design phase is ensuring that the IP addressing scheme is properly designed. A solid addressing scheme should be hierarchical, structural, and modular. These features will add value to the continually improving concept of enterprise campus design. This is also important in scaling any of the dynamic routing protocols. A solid IP addressing scheme helps routing protocols function in an optimal manner, especially RIP version 2, EIGRP, OSPF, or BGP. 
Facilitating summarization and the ability to summarize addresses provides several advantages for the network. Shorter access lists, reduces the overhead on routers. The performance difference is actually very noticeable, especially on the older models. Faster convergence of routing protocols. Addresses can be summarized to help isolate troubled domains and overall improvement of network stability. Address summarization is also important when there is a need to distribute addresses from one routing domain into another, as it impacts both the configuration effort and the overhead in the route processing. In addition, having a solid IP addressing scheme not only makes ACLs easier to implement and more efficient for security, policy and QoS purposes, but also it functions and facilitates advanced routing policies and techniques such as zone-based policy firewalls, where modular components and object groupings that are based on the defined IP addressing schemes can be created. Solid IP addressing planning supports several features in an organization. Route summarization, a more scalable network, a more stable network, and faster convergence. Now, if you to understand route summarization, you need to understand subnetting. Let's go ahead and do a quick review of subnetting at this time. An IP address is a unique logical number to a network device or interface. It is 32 bits in length, and to make the number easier to read, the dotted decimal format is used. The bits are combined into four 8-bit groups, each converted into decimal numbers. For example, as you will see here, this address is 10.128.0.1. The first octet dictates which class the IP address is in. As you see in this diagram, the beginning bits of the first octet will dictate what class the IP address is. There are five classes, A, B, C, D, and E, and let's go ahead and talk about each of those at this time. Class A addresses range from 0 to 127 in the first byte. Network numbers available for assignment to organizations are from 1.0.0.0 to 126.0.0.0. By default, for Class A addresses, the first byte is the network number, and then the three remaining bytes are the host number. Class B addresses range from 128 to 191 in the first byte. Network numbers assigned to companies or other organizations are from 128.0.0.0 to 191.255.0.0. By default, for Class B addresses, the first two bytes are the network number, and the remaining two bytes are the host number. Class C addresses range from 192 to 223 in the first byte. Network numbers assigned to companies are from 192.0.0.0, to 223, 255, 255.0. The format is the first three bytes are the network number and the last byte is the host number. Class D addresses range from 224 to 239 in the first byte. Network numbers assigned to multicast groups range from 224.0.0.1 to 239, 255, 255, 255. Please note that these addresses do not have a host or network portion. Class E addresses range from 240 to 254 in the first byte. These addresses are reserved for experimental networks. Network 255 is, reversed, is reserved for the broadcast address, such as all 255s. Again, take a look at this table 
and you will see the summary of the IPv4 address classes. Each address class can be uniquely identified in binary by the high order bits. Now, subnetting plays an important role in IPv4 addressing, since you want to be able to break down the networks into smaller ones. As you can see here, we have a class A IP address. And if we were to use its default subnet mask, it would be a slash eight. That is the first eight binary bits would be ones and the rest would be zeros. But this would mean we have hundreds of thousands of IP addresses in this one subnet. Let's say we want to use this IP address on our internal network and simply assign it to one small portion of our network where there are 100 users. In that case, we would want to assign a smaller subnet, let's say a slash 24. So subnetting allows us to put it on a smaller network with fewer hosts. So the subnet mask is a 32-bit number in which the bits are set to 1 to identify this network portion of the address. And the 0 then identifies the host portion of the address. As you can see here, we will now set to 1 the first 24 bits, and that will mark off the subnet, which is now a slash 24, which means that 10.128.0 slash 24 is a dedicated network that can host 254 hosts. The importance of IP addressing is reflected in the new requirements that demand greater consideration of IP addressing as the following examples illustrate. The transition to voice over IP telephony and the additional subnet ranges required to support voice services. Data in voice VLANs are usually segregated, and in some scenarios, twice as many subnets may be needed when implementing telephony in the network. Layer 3 switching at the edge, replacing the Layer 2 switching with multi-layer switches. This involves more subnets needed at the enterprise edge, so the number of smaller subnets will increase. There should be as little re-addressing as necessary, and making efficient use of the address space should be a priority. Sometimes, Layer 3 switching moved to the edge will involve a redesign of the IP addressing hierarchy. Many organizations use technologies like Network Admission Control, 802.1x, or Microsoft NAP. These types of deployments will be dynamically assigning VLANs based on the user login or port-based authentication. In this situation, an ACL can actually manage connectivity to different servers and network resources based on the source subnet. Using NAC over a wired or wireless network will add more complexity to the IP addressing scheme. Many network topologies involve having separated VLANs, such as data, voice, and wireless networks. Using 802.1x may also involve a guest VLAN or a restricted VLAN, and authorization policies can be assigned based on VLAN membership from AAA server. Using role-based security techniques might require different sets of VPN clients such as administrators, customers, vendors, guests, or extranets. So different groups can be implemented for different VPN client pools. This role-based access can be managed through a group password technique for each Cisco VPN client. Every group can then be assigned a VPN endpoint address from a different pool of addresses. If the pools are subnets of a summarizable block, then routing traffic back to the client can also be accomplished in a simplified fashion. Network designers should also consider that NAT and PAT can be applied on the customer edge routers. This is often a PIX firewall or on the ASA devices. NAT and PAT should not be used internally 
on the LAN or within the enterprise network to simplify the troubleshooting process. NAT can be used in a data center to support the out-of-band management of the VLAN, that is, devices that cannot route or cannot find a default gateway for the out-of-band management of the VLAN. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about IP addressing design, subnets, or a, an overview of subnets, and then a refresh of public versus private addressing. So as we move on in this chapter and this video series, this foundational knowledge will be necessary as you continue to learn and grow in preparation for your exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about subnet design and summarization. Specifically, we're going to talk about not only the importance of IP summarization, but how to design for it, and then we will talk about how this works within routing protocols. Now you've already learned about IP addressing design, Let's dig deeper and understand this concept of summarization. After planning the IPv4 addressing scheme and determining the number of types of necessary addresses, a hierarchical design might be necessary. This design is useful when finding a scalable solution for a large organization, and this involves address summarization. Summarization reduces the number of routes in the routing table and involves taking a series of network prefixes and representing them as a single summary address. It also involves reducing the CPU load and the memory utilization on network devices. In addition, this technique reduces processing overhead because routers advertise a single prefix instead of many smaller ones. Large enterprise networks can have routing tables with many route entries and network summarization allows multiple routes to then be summarized into a single route advertisement. So it reduces the number of entries in a router's routing table that eats up less memory and also CPU because it reduces the number of network advertisements that need to be sent. And that can obviously increase convergence time as well. Here's a perfect example. Let's say we're looking at the routing table of a core router and it knows about all the branch offices. And let's say there are 255 branch offices and each are allotted a slash 24. And they're assigned a 192.168.x.0 uh, slash 24 network. Now, sure, the core router has individual entries for all of these routes and knows how to reach all of them through separate interfaces or tunnels. But all these routes do not need to be passed individually throughout the network onto a neighbor through a route advertisement. They can be summarized using one summary route, 192.168.00 slash 16. So as you can see, using summarization, we're saving a lot of memory and CPU by simply summarizing all of these routes um, into one single route. A summarizable address is one that contains blocks with sequential numbers in one of the octets. The sequential patterns must fit a binary bit pattern. Another planning aspect of summarizable blocks involves medium or large blocks of server farms or data centers. Servers can be grouped based on their functions and on their level of mission criticality, and they can all be in different subnets. In addition, with servers that are attached to different access layer switches, it is easier to assign subnets that will provide a perfect pattern for wildcarding in the ACLs. Simple wildcard rules and efficient ACLs are desired, as complex ACLs are quite difficult to deal with, especially for new engineers who must take over an existing project. 
when implementing the hierarchical addressing scheme, it is important to have a good understanding of the math behind it and how route summarization works. This is an example of combining a group of class C addresses into an aggregate address. Summarization is a way to represent several networks in a single summarized route. In real world scenarios, a subnet calculator can be used to automatically generate the most appropriate aggregate route from a group of addresses. The goal is to take all of these networks and aggregate them into a single address that can be stored at the edge distribution submodule or at the core layer of the network. The first thing to understand when implementing a hierarchical addressing structure is the use of continuous blocks or IP addresses. In this example, the addresses 192.100.168.0 through 192.100.175.0 are used. Summarization will be based on a location where all the utmost bits are identical. Looking at the first address above, the first eight bits equal the decimal 192. The next eight bits equal the decimal 100. And the last eight bits are represented by a zero. The only octet that changes is the third one. To be more specific, only the last three bits in that octet change when going through this address range. The summarization process requires writing third octet in binary format and then looking for the common bits on the left side. In this example, all the bits are identical up to the last three bits in the third octet. With 21 identical bits, all the addresses will be summarized to 192.100.168.0 slash 21. Now, different routing protocols handle summarization in different ways. RIP version 2 has classful origins, that is, it summarizes by default. Although it can act in a classless manner because it sends subnet mask information, because of its classful origins, RIP version 2 performs automatic summarization on classful boundaries. So, Anytime RIP version 2 is advertising a network across a different major network boundary, it summarizes to the classful network mask without asking for permission. This obviously can lead to big problems in the routing infrastructure for discontiguous networks. RIP version 2's automatic summarization behavior should be disabled in many situations to gain full control of network routing operations. In addition to the automatic summarization feature, RIP version 2 allows for manual route summarization to be performed at the interface level. The recommendation is to disable automatic summarization and configure manual summarization where it is necessary. EIGRP functions similar to RIP version 2 regarding summarization. As EIGRP also has classful origins, because it is an enhanced version of IGRP. EIGRP automatically summarizes on classful boundaries and just like RIP version 2, this feature can be disabled. And manual summarization can be configured on specific interfaces. The biggest issue with this behavior is that there might be discontinuous networks and this could cause problems with any of the automatic summarization mechanisms described. As you can see in this diagram, the 172.16.10.0/24 subnet is on the left side. 172.16.12.0/24 is on the right side. These networks are divided by a different major network in the middle, and this will cause a problem due to discontinuous networks and summarization. Applying EIGRP to this scenario and automatic summarization enabled by default, it will summarize toward the middle of the topology that is 172.16.0.0 from both sides. That will obviously cause major routing problems. OSPF 
does not have automatic summarization feature, but two different forms of summarization can be designed. Summarization between internal areas and summarization from another separate domain. Summarizing from one area to another involves a type three LSA. Summarizing from another domain involves two types of LSAs in the summarization process. A type four LSA, which advertises the existence of the summarizing device and the actual summary of information, which is carried in a type five LSA. BGP uses just a single type of summarization called aggregation. If you aggregate in the vast majority of cases, you will be specifically typing in the command to aggregate those addresses. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about IP subnet summarization beyond just the basics. You've dug deeper and specifically, especially with the routing protocols, understanding their behavior so that you can design accordingly. You certainly will be asked questions about this on your CCDP exam, but you will also be asked questions about this as you design for the enterprise. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, you're going to learn about transitioning to IPv6. Specifically, you're going to learn how IPv4 and v6 can coexist so that you can make the transition seamlessly and without downtime. We'll talk about methods you would use, such as dual stack, tunneling, and translation. So let's go ahead and begin. With the exhaustion of the IPv4 addressing space quickly approaching, it's become a high priority for organizations to begin their own deployments of IPv6. This can be accomplished in a number of different ways. The common methods include side-by-side -side implementations of IPv4 and v6, the implementations of tunneling over existing IPv4 networks, and the implementation of a translation process from IPv4 to v6. This video will examine these specific methods and how they can be used to support an IPv6 deployment. Let's talk about IPv4 and v6 coexistence. The transition from v4 to v6 will not be something that is done overnight. It will take a number of years before v6 has anywhere near 100% implementation. In these intervening years, a number of mechanisms have been and will be developed to make the transition as easy as possible. The first of the available options is referred to as dual stack. When using this method, an organization essentially does not transition to IPv6, but simply builds a parallel IPv6 network next to their existing IPv4 network. The second of the available options is tunneling. The basic idea behind tunneling methods is that IPv6 will be tunneled over an existing IPv4 network, and a number of different tunneling methods are available and can be selected based on the requirements of the situation. And then the third available option is translation. The idea behind translation is that a boundary router between IPv4 and v6 network is performing a translation process and it maps IPv4 to v6 addresses and vice versa. Let's dig a little deeper with dual stack. When a network is configured as a dual stack, each device on the network is configured with both a IPv4 address and an IPv6 address. The idea being that once all the devices have implemented IPv6, the IPv4 part of the network will be depreciated. This method is common for businesses looking to slowly convert their existing devices from v4 to v6. These companies can configure their routing infrastructure to support both v4 and v6, but bring their own network devices over to v6 at their own pace. 
It's also possible for individual devices to be configured as dual stack and use one of the tunneling technologies discussed here. The concept behind tunneling is certainly not new. Many people use tunneling daily, but you use it for other reasons. For example, many companies use IPsec or SSL tunnels to secure information. Many different tunneling methods are available for your conversion from V4 to V6. Which one to use will depend on the specific implementation. And you can use this table to help you remember why you would want to use a specific type of tunneling. The manual tunneling is used to provide a point-to-point -point IPv6 link over an existing V4 network, and it only supports IPv6 traffic. GRE is used to provide a point-to-point -point V6 link over an existing IPv4 network, and it supports multiple protocols, including IPv6. 6 to 4 is used to provide a point to multipoint IPv6 link over an existing IPv4 network. Sites must use IPv6 addresses from the 2002-16 range. 6RD is used to provide a point to multipoint IPv6 link over an existing IPv4 network. And sites can use IPv6 addresses from any range. And then ISATAP is used to provide a point to multipoint IPv6 links over an existing IPv4 network and it's designed to be used between devices inside the same site. Next let's talk about translation. The concept of address translation is not a new concept to most network engineers but this is because NAT is implemented between different IPv4 networks in almost every residential household. The concept behind this type of NAT and the newer technologies that support address translation between v4 and v6 networks is similar. IPv6 translation technologies differ from IPv6 tunneling technologies. This is because the translation technologies enable IPv4 only devices to speak to IPv6 only devices, which is not possible with any of the other tunneling methods. However, IPv4 and V6 translation and IPv4 only translation entail a certain amount of complexity. What happens when an IPv6 only device is attempting to communicate with a device on the public IPv4 internet and only an IPv4 DNS record exists? In these situations, a second technology is required to step in and provide additional services for the connection to work. The first method to be introduced to provide IPv6 translation service was NAT. Protocol Translation, or NAT slash PT. NAT PT defined a mechanism to not only translate between IPv4 to V6 addresses, but also a built-in ability to provide protocol translation services for ICMP, FTP, and DNS. The component that was responsible for these translation services is called the Application Layer Gateway. The ALG piece of NAT-PT method raised a number of issues. With additional testing and real-life experience, a new method was introduced that separated the address translation functionality and the application layer translation functionalities, NAT64 and DNS64. DNS64 can synthesize IPv6 address resource records from IPv4 resource records. It does this by encoding the returned IPv4 address into an IPv6 address format. The selection of an IPv6 translation mechanism depends greatly on the current status of an organization's network and how fast they want to transition their devices from IPv4 to V6. Logic seems to say that those organizations with bleeding edge technologies and small staffs will probably be or are already the first people in line to transition to V6. But larger companies that have tens of thousands of network devices will most likely transition a piece at a time following the experience level of each department. The transition to IPv6 is coming, so it's good that you're learning it while you're studying for your architecture exam. 
you have learned about IPv4 and v6 coexistence and how to handle migrations at a higher level, learning about dual stack, tunneling, and or translation to make it happen. Now you will be asked general questions about IPv6 transitions, and certainly what you've learned in this video will be very helpful in your exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, we're going to continue to learn about addressing design. Specifically, we're going to talk about IP address planning. And then we're going to talk about role based addressing. So let's begin. An important issue in IP addressing design is how the addresses will be assigned. Obviously, one way would be to use static assignments, but the other and much more popular way is to use dynamic protocols such as dynamic host configuration protocol, or as you surely know it, DHCP. Deciding on the address allocation method requires answering some of these questions. How many end systems are there? For example, if there are a small number of hosts, less than 50, you may want to consider using static or manually assigned addresses. However, if there are several hundred systems, that's just not realistic, and you're going to use DHCP to speed up the address allocation process. The other question you would want to ask is, what does the security policy demand? Some organizations demand the use of static IP addressing for every host, or for every node to create a more secure environment so that the IP addresses are not being assigned or being allocated over the network wire. For example, an outsider cannot plug into a station on the network, then automatically get an IP address and then have access to internal resources. The organization's security policy might demand static addressing regardless of the network size. Another question you'll want to ask is, what is the likelihood of renumbering? This includes the possibility of acquisitions and mergers in the near future. If the likelihood of renumbering your IP addresses is high, then DHCP should obviously be used. The next question is, are there any high availability demands? If the organization does have high availability demands, DHCP should be used in a redundant server architecture. In addition, static addressing should always be used on certain modules in certain devices. For example, corporate servers, network management workstations, standalone servers in the access layer submodule, printers and other peripheral devices in the access layer submodule, public accessible servers in the enterprise edge, remote access layer submodule devices, and WAN submodule devices. Now, building off of this, you will want to then implement IP addressing in a logical manner. Now, the most obvious approach to implementing role-based addressing is to use the network 10 dot whatever. This has the virtue of simplicity. A simple scheme that can be used with layer three closets is to use 10 dot the number for the closet dot the VLAN dot whatever the last octet you'd like it to be to avoid binary arithmetic. This approach uses the second octet for closets or layer three switches, the third octet for VLANs, and obviously the fourth octet for hosts. If you have more than 256 closets or layer three switches to identify in the second octet, you may use some bits from the beginning of the third octet because you probably do not have 256 VLANs per switch. 
Another approach is to use some or all of the Class B private addressing blocks. This approach will typically involve binary arithmetic. The easiest method is to allocate bits using bit splitting. In the case you see before you, you start out with six bits reserved for hosts in the fourth octet, or 62 hosts per subnet, or VLAN. The X bits are to be split even further. This format initially uses decimal notation to the first octet and binary notation in the second, third, and fourth octets to minimize conversion back and forth. This addressing plan is enough to cover a reasonably large enterprise network. Another four bits are available to work with in the second octet if you need it. Using a role aware or ACL friendly addressing scheme, you can write a small number of global permit or deny statements for each role. This greatly simplifies edge ACL maintenance. It is easier to maintain one access list for all edge VLANs or interfaces than different ACLs for every layer three access or distribution switch. You will also want to spend some time focusing on IP addressing for VPN clients. As role-based security is deployed, there is a need for different groupings of VPN clients. These might correspond to administrators, employees, or different groups of contractors, consultants, etc. You can use different VPN groups for different VPN client pools. Role-based access can be controlled via the group password mechanism for the Cisco VPN client. Each group can be assigned a VPN endpoint addressed from a different pool. Traffic from the user PC has a VPN endpoint address as its source address. The different subnets or blocks of VPN endpoint addresses can then be used in ACLs to control access across the network to resources, as discussed earlier for NAC nodes. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about address planning, and then specifically about the importance of role-based address planning to make it easier to manage your network. Cisco deems it important to approach your address planning logically, not only so it's easier on you, but also for anybody new to your environment, that someone who is new to the environment can get to work right away and understand the network much easier with proper planning. This is important information for your architecture exam, and I'm sure you'll do well on this portion. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video, we're going to be covering network address translation applications. Specifically, we're going to talk about how you're going to apply NAT, or how Cisco suggests you apply NAT on the network. So although you surely understand the basics of NAT and PAT, we're going to go a little bit deeper here and understand how this should be applied within your designs. That being said, within this video, there is a quick refresh in case you need it uh, of NAT and PAT as well at the very end. So although the goal with IP version six is to avoid the need for NAT, NAT with IPv4 will still be used for a while. NAT is one of the mechanisms used in the transition from IPv4 to v6, so it's not going away anytime soon. In addition, it is a very functional tool for working with IPv4 addressing. NAT and PAT are usually carried out on Cisco ASA devices, which have powerful tools to accomplish these tasks in many form, including static and dynamic NAT, identity NAT, and policy NAT. A recommended best practice is to try to avoid using NAT on internal networks except for situations in which NAT is required 
as a stopgap measure during mergers or migrations. NAT should not be performed between access layer and the distribution layer or between the distribution layer and the core layer. Following this recommendation will prevent address translation between OSPF areas, for example. Organizations with a merger in progress usually use the same internal network addressing schemes, and these can be managed with NAT overlapping techniques, often referred to as bidirectional NAT. And this translates between the two organizations when they have an overlapping internal IP addressing space that uses RFC 1918 addressing. If there are internal servers or servers in the DMZ that are reached using translated addresses, it is a good practice to isolate these servers into their own address space and VLAN, possibly even using private VLANs. NAT is often used to support content load balancing servers, which usually must be isolated by implementing address translation. NAT can also be used in the data center submodule to support a management VLAN that is out of band from production traffic. It should also be implemented on devices that cannot route or cannot define a gateway for the management VLAN. This results in smaller management VLANs, not a single large management VLAN that covers the entire data center. In addition, large companies or internet entities can exchange their summary routes and then they can translate with NAT blocks into the network. This will offer faster convergence, but the downside is an increased troubleshooting process because of the use of NAT or PAT. Now, PAT is harder to troubleshoot because one or a few IP addresses are used to represent hundreds or possibly even thousands of internal hosts which all are using TCP and UDP ports to create logical sockets. This increases the complexity of troubleshooting because it is difficult to know what IP address is assigned to a particular host. Each host uses a shared IP address and port number. If the organization is connected to several different partners or vendors, each partner can be re represented by a different NAT block which can be translated in the organization. Now that we've talked about design considerations, let's go ahead and do a quick refresh of NAT and PAT because any of this is fair game on your exam. The first thing you need to understand when we talk about NAT are the different types of NAT IP addresses. So I created this simple chart for you, which hopefully will help you memorize um, each of these address types. Now, when I referred to inside or outside, um, inside is inside a network, and outside would be outside of your network, such as the internet. So inside local is a private IP address. And when I say private, I mean RFC 1918. So it's a private IP address referencing an inside device. Inside global is a public IP address referencing an inside device. Outside local is a private IP address referencing an outside device. And then outside global, a public IP address referencing an outside device. As a memory aid, just remember that inside always refers to an inside device. Outside always refers to an outside device. When you see the word local, think of that as private, that is private IP address that is not routable on the internet and global that should remind you of the internet because global addresses are IP addresses that are routable on the internet. Now an inside local address can be randomly assigned an inside global address from a pool of available addresses, or it can be specifically assigned an address from a static configuration. Now, whatever you choose will determine what type of NAT or network address translation you're using. There are two approaches to NAT. The first is dynamic NAT. Now, dynamic NAT occurs when an inside local address or addresses are automatically assigned to an inside global address from a pool of available addresses. 
And then there is static NAT or SNAT. And you might want to statically configure the inside global address assigned to a specific device inside your network. So an example of that might be, let's say you have an email server that is inside of your company and you want other email servers on the internet to send email messages to your server, but they need to point to a specific IP address, not one that's randomly selected. So in this case, you would choose SNAT or static NAT and specifically assign a global IP address to represent that mail server. Next is port, port address translation. And PAT addresses a limitation of NAT. And the problem with NAT, well, it's not really a problem, it's just a limitation, is that it does have a one-to-one -one mapping of inside local addresses to inside global addresses. But you know, what if you're in a situation where you only have one IP address to use? One IP address assigned to your firewall, one public IP address, but you have 100 users that need to get out to the internet. They can't each wait to use that IP address. So what PAT does, it allows multiple inside local addresses, your private IP addresses, to share that single inside global address. And it uses port numbers to keep track of separate communication flows. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about network address translation applications in the enterprise. That is beyond just the basics of NAT, but how specifically do you design for it? And then you received a quick refresh on the most common components of NAT and PAT. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video, you're going to learn about designing IP version 6 addressing. First, you're going to learn about IPv6 addressing, but then specifically, we're going to talk about how this addressing can be assigned on the network. There are many different options, not only in how you deploy IPv6, but actually ongoing how IPv6 is managed and rolled out. You need to understand both to do well on your exam, but also to master IPv6 on the network. So let's begin. So let's ask the basic question, why even upgrade to IP version 6, other than the fact that you simply get more IP addresses? Well, there's a lot of reasons why you would want to upgrade to IP version 6, and here are a few of them spelled out for you which I think you'll need to know for your CCNP route exam. But please note, you no longer need NAT or PAT. It has inherent IPsec support. These are key and critical updates. Now, once you've committed to using IPv6, you need to understand how these different IP addresses are labeled. There's a global unicast address. These are unicast packets sent through the public internet, with public IP addresses. Unique local, which are unicast packets inside one organization which is basically e equal to your private IP addressing. Link local, which are packets sent to a local subnet and are not rout routable across networks. And, th and then finally, take note of the loopback address, which you know from IP version 4 is 127.0.0.1. IP version 6 also has a loopback addressing as well. An IP version 6 address has 128 bits broken out into 32 hexadecimal numbers organized into eight quartets. So here is the hexadecimal numbering system, which I'm sure we won't need much of a refresher on, but we do need to use it to understand IP version 6. And here is an IPv6 IP address. And as you can see, it looks quite long, mainly because we're used to looking at IP version 4 addresses. So this ups the game a little bit, and we may begin to wonder how we're going to support this on our network or document this and we get concerned about managing a network addressing this long well there are built-in mechanisms within ip version 6 to help us manage it and we're going to cover that there's ways you can summarize ip version 6 addresses to make it more manageable not only to read but to understand and explain to other people so you can shorten an ip version 6 by omit by omitting the leading zeros in any, any given quartet 
or you can represent one or more consecutive quartets with a double colon. So here you see an IP version 6 address with many zeros in it. Here's how we can summarize it. On the left hand side, you can see that we use a double colon to represent the first, uh, the second and third quartet, and then we summarize the remaining quartets of zeros. And in the second example, we did the opposite. We summarized the first two quartets with zeros and then used the double colon for the end. You can only use the double colon once in an IP version 6 IP address. So here we see an IP version 6 IP address, and this is the subnet. It's the, remember, it's a slash 64, so we're matching the first 64 bits, as you see here. And this also can be summarized. You don't need to write out all these zeros. So to, to explain what the subnet is to somebody, you can simply write it out this way. So IP version 6 is manageable. It gives you tools to manage it. So whether you are reviewing documentation or holding a general discussion about your network or simply logging into a Cisco router to take a look at what's going on, understanding abbreviation is key to IP version 6. Here are some other ways we can understand IP version 6 addressing. In our first example, you'll see that it's 2000 and then a double colon slash 4. The slash four would match the first four bits. In hex, that would be 0010. So all addresses whose first four bits are equal to the first four bits of the hex number 2000. In the second example, we're matching all addresses whose first 20 bits match the listed hex number. And you can see in red what match that would be. And then the final example, all addresses whose first 32 bits match the listed hex number. Here's another IP version 6 address. How do we break it out into subnets? Well, here you have it. We're honoring the first 48 bits of this range, and then we are breaking this out into smaller subnets, as you can see here. Each subnet matching the first 112 bits. So let's continue. Next, let's talk about IPv6 global unicast address assignments. So IPv6 actually has four major options for IPv6 global unicast address assignment. And you need to be aware of all four. So let's cover those. This chart's been created for you to understand these four options a bit better to help you study. You have stateful DHCP, stateless auto config, static configuration, and then static configuration using EUI64. Now, I'm not going to go through every detail here. I just want to point out some things that are important to note. Now, if you'll remember, in IPv6, the clients are receiving the following information, prefix and length, the host address, the default router, and the DNS servers. And this can vary depending upon which method you're using. You need to understand which method or how these items are learned depending upon the method. Now, one acronym you see frequently in this chart is NDP, and we're going to go into NDP shortly. Uh, you certainly will need to know that. But also in this video, we're going to go into stateless versus stateful. Um, configuration. So you'll see the words stateful DHCP, stateless auto config um, under the DNS server assignment. Uh, DNS servers are known via stateless DHCP. So we are going to be digging into that as well. So you understand stateful and stateless concepts. But I just wanted to point these items out for you. Um, as you learn more about this, feel free to come back to this chart to study it for your exam. We need to revisit these words stateful and stateless so that you can understand what exactly is what exactly that means. IPv6 hosts can use stateful DHCP to learn and lease an IP address and the prefix length, the mask, and the DNS IP address. Now, since you have a baseline knowledge of DHCP for version 4, it'll help to compare and contrast IPv4 and v6 DHCP services. 
With IPv4, the host sends a multicast packet searching for the DHCP server. And when a server re replies, the DHCP client sends a message asking for a lease of an IP address. And the server does reply. And the same is true for IPv6. But the server obviously provides an IPv6 address instead of v4. And then it also provides prefix length DNS IP address. And please note that stateful DHCP version 6 does not supply the default router information. Instead, it relies on NDP, neighbor discovery protocol, between the client and local routers. DHCP version 4 servers retain state information about each and every client, such as IP address leased to that client, and the length of time for which the lease is valid. So version 4 tracks the current state of DHCP clients, where version 6 DHCP servers do as well. But please note they have two operational modes. First is stateful, in which the server tracks state information. And then there's stateless, in which the server does not track any state information. We'll cover stateless in a, in a minute. Now, one big difference between version 4 and version 6 DHCP operations is that version 4 hosts sends, send broadcasts and version 6 hosts send multicasts. So IPv6 multicast addresses have a prefix beginning as you see here. The first eight bits of an address are all ones. So routers know to forward these packets to the appropriate DHCP server. Now let's go to stateless auto configuration. The second of two options for dynamic IPv6 address assignment is stateless auto configuration, which allows a host to automatically learn the key pieces of addressing information, such as prefix, host, and prefix length. Plus, the default router IP address and DNS IP address by using the following steps. First, IP version 6 NDP, Neighbor Discovery Protocol particularly the router solicitation and advertisement messages. And it does this using NDP to learn the prefix, prefix length, and the default router. Next, there will require some math, but it will derive the interface ID portion of the IPv6 using a format called EUI64, which we will cover later in this video. And then finally, stateless DHCP to learn the DNS IPv6 address. So this section examines all three topics in order. First, learning the prefix length and default router with NDP router advertisements. NDP allows IPv6 hosts to multicast a message and it asks all routers on the link to announce two key pieces of information. First the IPv6 address of routers willing to act as a default gateway, and then all known IPv6 prefixes, prefixes on the link. So it uses ICMP version 6 messages called RS, or router solicitation, and RA, router advertisement. Now, for this process to work, before a host sends an RS message, a router connected to that same LAN must already be configured for IPv6 and must have an IPv6 address configured. So at that point, the router only knows it can be useful as a default gateway and it knows at least one prefix that can be useful to any clients on the LAN if and only if it has a route. If it has no routes, then it knows it can't be of any use. Now, let's talk about calculating the interface ID using EUI64. It's important to note that the value of the interface ID portion of a global unicast address can be set to any value if there's no other host on the same subnet. To automatically guarantee there is a unique interface ID, IPv6 defines a method to calculate the 64-bit interface ID. So let's go ahead and take a look at two examples. The following two lines list a host's MAC address and the EUI64 format interface ID. 
And now this assumes the use of an address con configuration option that uses that EUI64 format. And you can see here where the MAC address gets split and then there's an insertion made as we were just talking about earlier. Finally, let's talk about finding DNS IP addresses using stateless DHCP. Now, as you know, IPv4 servers keep a record of the least IP addresses and when the least expires. The IPv6 stateful DHCP server does that as well. However, for v6, the server's name includes the word stateful. So this is to contrast it with stateless DHCP server function in version 6. The stateless DHCP server function in version 6 solves one particular problem. It supplies the DNS server's IPv6 addresses to clients. So all hosts, since they typically use the same small number of DNS servers, the stateless DHCP server does not necessarily need to keep track of any state information. An engineer can configure the stateless DHCP server to know the IPv6 address of the DNS servers. And then the server tells only any host or any other device that asks, and it keeps no record of that process. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about IPv6 addressing, but specifically how this addressing can be assigned in the enterprise. This is critical information, not just for your exam, but also as you increase in knowledge as an engineer. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video we're going to be defining the concept of IP multicast to lay the groundwork for the next set of videos on multicast. In this video we're going to first define IP multicast, discuss traffic types. In order to understand what multicast is, you need to understand what the other traffic types are, such as unicast or broadcast, so that we can compare and contrast the advantages and the disadvantages of multicast. We'll then discuss multicast goals, and then we'll talk about the disadvantages of multicast and how to address those disadvantages. So let's begin, and let's talk about IP multicast. Now this may be a refresher or let's just lay a foundation here for the rest of the videos on multicast. As you can see in this diagram, the receivers, which are the designated multicast group, are interested in receiving the video stream from the source. The receivers will indicate their interest by sending a message in IGMP host report to the routers in the network. These routers will then be responsible for delivering the data from the source over to the receivers. The routers are going to use PIM, and now PIM you're going to learn more about in later videos, but PIM allows for there to be a dynamic creation of a multicast distribution tree. This video data stream will then be delivered only to the network segments that are in that path between the source and the receivers. So it would be helpful for you to understand that multicast is based on the concept of groups. A multicast group is a group of receivers that expresses the same interest in receiving a specific data stream. Now the group does not have to have a geographical boundary, it probably doesn't, nor a physical boundary. Therefore, the hosts that are requesting could be located anywhere, such as anywhere on the internet or anywhere on the campus network. Hosts that are interested in receiving data flowing to a particular group must join using, as we've stated before, IGMP. And you'll learn more about IGMP in this video, but especially in the follow-up videos as well. Hosts must be a member of the group to receive the data stream for that group.
Enterprise network architecture should support the transfer of all kinds of content and data, that is voice or video, but a traditional IP backbone is not efficient when sending the same data to many locations. This is because the specific data stream must be replicated to all the different destinations, and this involves utilizing many resources, especially bandwidth. With the incredible advances in collaboration tools using the World Wide Web and the Internet, it is very likely that organizations will have to support multicast traffic. Multicasting implies taking a single data packet and sending it to a group of destinations simultaneously. This behavior can be considered a one-to-many transmission as, to oppose, as opposed to other types of communication, such as unicast, which is one-to-one -one transmission, broadcast, one-to-all transmission, or anycast, one-to-any transmission. The first traffic type you will learn about is unicast. Most network traffic is unicast in nature, meaning that traffic travels from a single source device to a single destination device. As you can see in the figure below, the video server is sending traffic to a specific destination 172.31.1.1. Now only 172.31.1.1 endpoint is receiving the traffic. You use unicasts all the time when you connect to web pages. If you connect to howtonetwork.com, for example, your connection is going to go from your IP address to howtonetwork.com web server IP address. The second type of traffic is broadcast. Broadcast traffic flows from a single source to all destinations on a specific subnet. When the traffic is sent this way, it's being sent from a single endpoint to what is known as the broadcast domain. Please note that broadcasts are not used in IPv6 networks, so this type of communication is only used on IPv4 networks. As you can see in the diagram provided on your screen, the video server is sending traffic to a broadcast address. Now you may think that all devices on any network would receive that, but that's not the case. Only the devices on the same subnet will receive the broadcast from the device originating that traffic. So as you can see, endpoints 172.31.1.1, 1.2, and 1.3 are receiving the broadcast message from the video server. The next traffic type you will learn about is multicast. Multicast provides an efficient mechanism for a single host to send traffic to multiple yet specific destinations. For example, imagine a network with three users. Two of those users want to receive a video stream from a video server. With a unicast solution, the video server would have to send two individual streams, one stream to each recipient. And with a broadcast solution, the video server would only have to send the video stream once but the stream would be received by every device on the local subnet, even devices not wanting to receive it. Even though those devices do not want to receive the video stream, they would still have to pause what they're doing, take time to check each of the unwanted packets. So multicast is the ideal solution so that only the endpoints who need the traffic receive it. They are part of a multicast group. So imagine if you had a network of 500 nodes and only 100 nodes needed to receive the multicast stream, think of the performance impact of using multicast versus broadcast or unicast. So multicast is primarily used on larger scale networks for that very reason, for that performance enhancement. The final traffic type you'll learn about is anycast. As you can see in the diagram, an IPv6 address can be assigned to multiple devices. Anycast traffic will forward traffic to the nearest host while not sending it to the farthest host. Please note that this feature is not used in IPv4 networks. So the 6 to 4 IPv6 translation protocol, for example, uses any cast. 6 to 4 gateways announce their presence on a specific IP. Clients look to using are looking to use the 6 to 4 gateway send traffic to that IP and trust the network to deliver the connection request to a 6 to 4 router. So I created these diagrams to help you with your studies. It's a simple way to memorize traffic types. 
First, you see unicast. It is one-to-one -one communication. Then there's broadcast, which is one-to-many communication. Multicast, one-to-many, or actually many-to-many -many communication. But for the simplicity of this drawing, we're showing one-to-many. And then any cast, many to few. The intent of this diagram is to show you that there are multiple possible destinations. Only one will be chosen. With the unicast one-to-one -one transmission process, network resources could suffer because a packet would be generated for each destination, and this would result in a heavy network load and device CPU utilization as illustrated in this figure. Senders in unicast transmissions must know the addresses of all the receivers. When using multicast, traffic can be sent to the multicast address, so there is no need to know specific address information for the receivers. In addition, the router processing of the packets is dramatically reduced in multicast environments. Broadcast transmissions could also create issues because devices that do not need the packets still receive them, as illustrated in this figure. When a device receives an unwanted packet, that, pa that specific device must stop running its processes and analyze the packet received, even if it was not destined to the device. This behavior affects device functionality, so sending unnecessary broadcast packets should be avoided as they interrupt normal device functionality. This behavior can be avoided by using multicast transmissions because devices that do not subscribe to a particular group do not receive packets in the specific stream. The process of multicasting as opposed to the process of broadcasting or unicasting has the advantage of saving bandwidth because it sends a single stream of data to multiple nodes. The multicasting concept is exercised by most modern corporations worldwide to deliver data to groups in the following ways, such as corporate meetings, video conferencing, e-learning solutions, webcasting information, distributing applications, streaming news feeds, and streaming stock quotes. The main goals of using multicasting are as follows. Reduce processing on network devices, reduce bandwidth consumption, and reduce processing for the receiving host if it is not interested in the transmission. Multicast generates a single feed for all the devices that are interested in receiving it, and the source sends out the data as illustrated in this figure. The routers along the multicast tree make the forwarding decisions. This behavior of radiating information away from a source is completely different from the behavior of unicast transmissions, where information is sent to a specific destination. Multicast behavior is actually called reverse path forwarding, RPF, as packets are forwarded along a reverse path. IP multicast does use UDP in its operations, as UDP has a connectionless behavior. This results in several disadvantages to using multicast technology. It's a best effort behavior. There's a lack of acknowledgement process lack of a congestion avoidance process, possibility of duplicate packets existing that arrive at a particular destination, and the possibility of out-of-order packets. These disadvantages can be easily managed using the multicast software that is running on the hosts. The actual multicast applications can sort out these unreliable communication issues that occur when using the multicast approach. So here's what you've learned. We've defined and laid a foundation for IP multicast. We've talked about the tra all the different traffic types so that you can compare and contrast what multicast can do and what it can't do. Then we talked about multicast goals. And then finally, the disadvantages of running multicast and how to address those disadvantages. All this information you will need to know for your exam 
but obviously, especially, you'll need to know it if you're rolling out this technology on your enterprise network. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about IP multicast functionality. In this video you're going to learn about multicast applications, multicast components, the multicast group address concept, address space used for multicast. We'll get deeper into IGMP and PIM protocols. And then finally, we'll discuss advanced multicast protocols. As you can tell, after the first video on multicast, we're getting a bit more granular into multicast operations. And we will continue to do so throughout this multicast series in this chapter. For all of this information, you'll need to know for your exam. So let's begin. In multicasting, a source application sends multicast traffic to a group destination address. The hosts interested in receiving this traffic join the specific group address by signaling their upstream devices. The routers then build a tree from the senders to the receivers and portions of the network that do not have receivers do not receive this potentially bandwidth intense traffic. Examples of multicast applications include IPTV, video conferencing applications, data center replication, stock tickers, and routing protocols. The first RIP version used broadcasting to send updates. RIP version 2 and RIP Next Generation use multicasting to accomplish this process. The major IPv4 multicast components include the following. Group addressing, that is layer 3 addresses and the underlying layer 2 multicast MAC addresses. Multicast routing, control plane, that is IGMP and PIM, and forwarding mechanisms, data plane, which is RPF or reverse path forwarding. A critical concept in multicasting is the multicast group address, which is an address that is agreed upon between the sender and receivers for particular multicast transmissions. The source sends traffic to this destination group address and the receiver listens for traffic that is destined for this group address. Traffic is always sent to a group, but the group never sends traffic back to the source. However, there may be situations in which a multicast receiver in a group is a source for other groups. IPv4 multicasting uses the Class D address space, meaning the 224.000/4 range, which is 224.000 up to 239. 255, 255, 255. This address space is not fully available to multicast designers due to some address range reservations, which you need to know and include local link addresses, source specific multicast, and administratively scoped addresses. Local link addresses. This addressing is very common with routing protocols. For example, OSPF uses 224.005 and 006 in its operations. The administratively scoped address range can be used for multicast applications inside corporate boundaries. The control plane is one of the most complex components of multicast. Multicast control plane is used to determine the following. Who is sending traffic into what groups? who is receiving traffic and for what groups, how traffic should be forwarded when it is received. The control plane is built with host to router and router to router communication protocols. Host to router communication is accomplished with the Internet Group Management Protocol or IGMP and router to router communication is achieved with protocol independent multicast or PIM. IP multicast technology allows information to be sent over networks to a group of destinations in a very efficient way. 
the multicast data is sent to a multicast group and the users receive the information by joining the specific multicast group using IGMP as shown in this figure. IGMP is used for receiver devices to signal routers on the LAN that they want traffic for a specific group. IGMP comes in all the following versions. IGMP version 1, defined in RFC 1112, which deals with host extensions for IP multicasting. IGMP version 2, defined in RFC 2236. And IGMP version 3, defined in RFC 3337. The most common IGMP version used in modern infrastructures is version 2, since version 1 has many known issues. One of the big issues with IGMP version 1 was that it defined a membership query and a membership report, so host machines would express their interest in joining a group by sending a host membership request to the local router. The host membership query would be used to find out whether members of the group were still present in the local network. This caused leave latency, which presented the problem in which all the receivers would disappear, and multicast traffic would still unnecessarily be sent to that segment, even though all were offline. This timeout, which is the idle timer for the group, would have to occur before the multicast traffic stopped flowing into the area. The router would send a query on a timed interval, and then it would eventually find out that every receiver had left. This behavior was very inefficient and could be improved by having the devices send a leave message to signal that they wanted to leave the specific multicast group immediately. This was the major enhancement that generated the development of IGMP version 2, which is backward compatible with version 1. IGMP version 2's major enhancements include Courier Election, which deals with the situation in which there are multiple routers on a segment. Tunable timers, they can speed up query response timeouts. Group specific queries, queries are sent to the group address instead of all multicast hosts. Explicit leave, which speeds up convergence if no other hosts are joined to that group. IGMP version 3 is used to support SSM, source specific multicasting. Version 3 allows a device to request a particular multicast feed from a particular source or sources. In most networks, the hosts are connected to layer 2 or multi layer switches that are connected to upstream routers. IGMP is a protocol that operates at layer 3, so the layer 2 switches are not aware of the hosts that want to join the multicast groups. By default, Layer 2 switches flood the received multicast frames to all the ports in the VLAN, even if only one device on one port needs the specific information. This issue is solved by using specific multicast protocols available for switched environments, namely CGMP, Cisco Group Management Protocol, and IGMP snooping. These protocols will be presented in later videos. PIM is used by multicast enabled routers to forward incoming multicast streams to a particular switch port. PIM uses the typical routing tables that are populated by regular unicast routing protocols like EIGRP and OSPF, and it exchanges multicast messages between PIM routers, as illustrated here. PIM operates in multiple modes sparse mode, dense mode, bidirectional PIM, and PIM source specific multicast. PIM dense mode is not used very often in large modern networks. Other advanced multicast protocols are used mainly in the following inter-domain scenarios. Multi-protocol BGP, which is used for multicast routing between domains. Multicast source discovery protocol, used with PIM sparse mode for multicast source delivery and multicast VPN used for secure remote connectivity. Understanding whether the organization will use multicast traffic and the way this will be accomplished is an important issue when designing enterprise campus switching. 
multicast deployments involve three components, the multicast application, the network infrastructure, and multicast client devices. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about multicast applications, multicast components, the multicast group address, and address space. You've learned a bit more about IGMP and PIM operations, and then advanced multicast protocols. All this information is absolutely required for your exam, but now you're moving into a level of really understanding how multicast works, and surely you're becoming a better engineer for it on your own network. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video, you're going to learn about protocol independent multicast deployment methods. Specifically, in this video, you're going to receive a PIM overview. This might be a refresher for some of you, but for many of you, it will be the first time you're learning about PIM in more detail. Then we're going to talk about PIM operations and then the capabilities of PIM. What are the value adds to the network? What are its capabilities? And actually, when you talk about capabilities, in essence, you also talk about limitations, things it cannot do. PIM is IP routing protocol independent and can leverage whichever unicast routing protocols are used to populate the unicast routing table. This includes EIGRP, OSPF, BGP, or even static routes. PIM uses this unicast routing information to perform the multicast forwarding function. Although PIM is called a multicast routing protocol, it actually uses the unicast routing table to perform the RPF check function instead of building up a completely independent multicast routing table. We will talk about this in more detail later in this video. But unlike other routing protocols, PIM does not send and receive routing updates between routers as well. So that is what makes PIM unique as well. IGMP helps the router know who wants to receive specific multicast traffic, but that router needs to communicate this information with the rest of the network. In other words, it needs to tell the rest of the network how to deliver traffic for that group. This process is accomplished using multicast routing protocols. And one that is used in modern networks is PIM, or Protocol Independent Multicast. Some legacy multicast protocols include multicast OSPF, this is not supported on Cisco equipment, and Distance Vector Multicast Routing Protocol, DVMRP, which is supported on Cisco equipment, but it's just not commonly used. PIM is a router-to-router -router control protocol that builds a loop-free tree from the sender to the receivers. It's called protocol independent because it relies on the underlying unicast routing protocol which is used and it does not care what that routing protocol is. PIM will rely on whatever IGMP is used. For example, RIP, EIGRP, OSPF, or ISIS. PIM will rely on whatever routing protocol is used such as RIP, EIGRP, OSPF, ISIS, etc. And it will base its operation on the information received from the IGP. PIM comes in two versions, version 1 and version 2, and comes in two modes, dense mode and sparse mode. Dense mode, which is now becoming legacy mode, uses an implicit join approach and sends the multicast traffic everywhere unless a specific host says it does not want it. It's also known as flood and prune behavior. PIM dense mode is suitable for multicast environments with a dense distribution of receivers. PIM sparse mode is also known as any source multicast and is described in RFC 4601. It uses a combination of shared trees, source-based trees, 
and RPs or rendezvous points and is used by the majority of modern multicast deployments. As shown in this figure, sparse mode utilizes an explicit join type behavior. So the receiver does not get the multicast traffic unless it asks for it. This can be considered a pull mechanism as opposed to the push mechanism used in PIM DM dense mode. The pull mechanism allows PIM sparse mode to forward multicast traffic only to the network segments with active receivers that have actually requested the data. PIM sparse mode distributes the data about active sources by forwarding data packets on shared trees. PIM sparse mode utilizes the concept of an RP to process the join requests. Sparse mode turned out to be the optimal solution for governments with both dense and sparse receiver distribution. The control plane helps build the multicast tree from the senders to the receivers and traffic can then start to flow over the multicast data plane. When the routers receive multicast packets, they perform two actions. In the Ceph architecture, they do an RPF check. This is a loop prevention mechanism. They check their multicast routing table, similar to the unicast routing table. This will tell the router which interfaces it should use to forward packets. The RPF check uses the underlying routing information. In this figure, router 1 received multicast traffic on its fast Ethernet 00, 0 interface from a device with the source address of 10.10.10.1. The multicast RPF check verifies the unicast routing table to see which interface traffic should be coming from that particular source. If unicast traffic reaches that particular destination through FAST00 interface, according to the unicast routing table, then RPF verification passes. If the source is not associated with the FAST Ethernet00 interface, the multicast device will drop the multicast traffic. PIMDM would be suitable only for small multicast implementations because of the flooding behavior of the multicast traffic to all potential segments, and then for pruning to the segments that do not want the traffic. With dense mode flooding, there is a collection of shortest path tree entries for multicast, as all the sources are building their independent trees to flood out the multicast traffic. This flooding and pruning behavior on top of the SPT type approach is not very efficient. The major problem with this process is that even after the pruning phase, traffic is periodically reflooded at a defined interval. To avoid waiting for periodic reflood, PIM dense mode uses a graft message to unprune a particular segment, similar to a join message. This is useful in situations where multicast receivers come up after the initial dense mode flooding phase. Another PIM-specific concept is called the assert. This is what happens when multiple multicast speakers are on the same LAN and broadcast. The assert process will start and someone will take over as the assert winner. This is based on the lowest metric or highest IP address when the metrics are equal. One of the biggest issues when designing dense mode multicast implementations is dense mode state refresh. This happens because after three minutes, the traffic refloods the previously pruned areas. This behavior can be overwritten with certain mechanisms designed by Cisco, but the recommendation is to use PIM SM to avoid this process. PIM SM also supports SPT switchover. So the last hop router that is the router that is directly connected to the active receiver group, can switch to a, a source tree to bypass the route processor if the traffic rate goes over a certain threshold, which is the SPT threshold. SPT switchover allows PIM SM to be more effective in supporting multicast traffic. Bidirectional PIM is an enhancement that was designed for the effective many-to-many -many communication in an individual PIM domain. 
many multicast applications use the many-to-many -many model, where every host is both receiver and sender. Bidirectional PIM allows packets to be forwarded from a source to the RP using only the shared tree state. Examples of such environments include many-to-many -many applications where there are many different sources available and that send traffic to many different receivers. And the use of a spanning tree does not scale well. Bidirectional spanning tree simply forces shared tree usage. In bidirectional mode, multicast groups can scale to include an arbitrarily large number of sources with only a little extra overhead. Bidirectional PIM uses a designated forwarder or DF on each link. Another extension to the PIM protocol is SSM, which used, utilizes short source trees exclusively, and Cisco recommends using it to support one-to-many applications. SSM makes the network much simpler to manage and eliminates the need for RP engineering. In other words, SSM uses only source trees. There are no shared trees, and therefore no RPs are required. SSM is a method for delivering multicast packets from a specific source address that is requested by the receiver. SSM is easy to install and is easy to provision on the network, as it does not require the network to maintain records of which active sources are sending to what multicast groups. SSM is the recommended practice for internet backbone style or one-to-many applications. For example, online training sessions. So here's what you've learned. You've received an overview of PIM. We've talked about PIM operations and then the capabilities of this protocol. Obviously a very important protocol to run if you're running multicast, something you surely will be tested on in your exam. But also you need to know this to be a solid engineer in the enterprise. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about multicasting in Ethernet environments and more generally in switched environments. Specifically, we're going to talk about what is unique about multicasting in Ethernet environments. And then we're going to talk about multicast functionality in switched environments, what you need to take into account, and more importantly, start talking about IGMP snooping, which is a very important aspect of multicast and something you need to know not only for your exam uh, but also to be a solid engineer. So let's begin. In Ethernet environments, the Layer 2 multicast process is seamlessly supported. A 48-bit multicast address is utilized and the stations listen for the address at Layer 2. These addresses are used for various purposes beyond traditional multicast implementations. For example, CDP and Layer 2 protocol tunneling techniques. When multicast applications are created, developers must be aware that there is some overlap in the addressing when mapping IP version 4 to MAC addresses. The IPv4 multicast group range is 224.000 to 239.255.255.255. And the MAC address range allocated by the IEEE is 01005 echo 000000 the 01005 echo 7 echo foxtrot 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 with the first 25 bits being fixed and the last 23 bits mapped to a group address this means that there are 2 to the power of 28 possible groups but only 2 to the power of 23 possible groups can be mapped as a result, each MAC address maps 32 IPv4 groups, so it is possible to create overlapping groups accidentally. Next, let's talk about multicast in switched environments. IGMP is a protocol that operates at layer 3, so the layer 2 switches are not aware of the hosts that want to join the multicast groups. 
By default, Layer 2 switches flood the received multicast frames to all of the ports in the VLAN, even if only one device on one port needs the specific information. To improve the switch's behavior when they receive multicast frames, technologies that facilitate effective implementation of multicast at Layer 2 should be used, such as IGMP snooping or CGMP. Most of the time, switches treat multicast traffic like traditional broadcast traffic, flooding multicast packets out to all ports in the VLAN. This is not an efficient approach, so solutions had to be found. An initial solution to this issue was a protocol invented by Cisco called CGMP, or Cisco Group Management Protocol. The Cisco proprietary protocol is implemented between multicast routers and switches so that the switches know where to send the multicast traffic. CGMP works based on a client-server model where the router is a CGMP server and the switch is a CGMP client. CGMP allows switches to communicate with multicast-enabled routers to figure out whether any users attached to the switches are part of any particular multicasting groups or whether they qualify for receiving the specific stream of data. CGMP eventually became a legacy protocol, and Cisco has since adopted a protocol called IGMP snooping. This applies overhead to the switch because it is now has to eavesdrop on IGMP reports and leave messages. Cisco handled this issue by building particular application-specific integrated circuits, or ASICs, within the switches that would speed up this process by running it in hardware. IGMP is the ideal solution in modern networks, as the switches constrain the multicast traffic. When using IGMP snooping, switches listen in on the IGMP messages between the router and the hosts and automatically update their MAC addresses and automatically update their MAC address tables. In other words, IGMP snooping allows the switch to intercept the multicast receiver's registration message, and based on the gathered information, it makes changes to its forwarding table. CGMP is a Cisco-specific protocol which is becoming depreciated, so as a result, IGMP snooping is now used more in both Cisco and non-Cisco environments. In addition to IGMP snooping, Catalyst 6500 series switches and Catalyst 4500 series switches support multicast packet replication in hardware, which makes it more efficient to copy multicast packets to network interfaces where the multicast paths flow. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about multicasting in Ethernet environments and what makes that unique, but also multicasting in switched environments in general, but specifically narrowing in on the importance of using IGMP snooping and why it's so important. This may not have been one of the more longer videos, but all of these topics are crucial to truly understanding multicast and doing well on the exam, but also in implementing it in your enterprise. Good luck with your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video we're covering concepts of routing protocols. Specifically, we'll be covering static and dynamic routing, and then within dynamic routing, we'll be talking about some of the design considerations you need to take into account when dealing with dynamic routing protocols, when choosing to use dynamic routing protocols, and understanding some of the different concepts, which are foundational to understanding which routing protocol may be the best to choose. So this lays a foundation for you prior to digging into each individual routing protocol in the later videos. This lays a good foundation for you to begin. Network designers should know the key characteristics that different routing protocols have because they will be in a position to recommend specific routing protocols for different projects. 
The first key decision criteria is figuring out whether static or dynamic routing should be used. Static routing implies manually defining routes on devices, and dynamic routing implies a dedicated routing protocol that will build a routing table. Now, even though static routes may not seem necessary in modern networks, there are certainly situations in which they can offer granular control and optimization of the information learned by the routing protocols. They can be used in conjunction with dynamic routing protocols to reach specific networks or to provide a default gateway. This is obviously useful in situations where the destination network is not a part of the routing protocol database. Another scenario in which static routes are used is to override some dynamically learned routing information. Static routing can also be used in the form of floating static routes. For example, when you set the administrative distance of a particular static route to a higher, which is a worse value than the administrative distance value of the same route learned via a routing protocol, and this would be done for failover reasons. Cisco wants you to be able to identify the attributes of routing protocols so that you can make the correct design decisions. The fundamental question is, which routing protocol should you use? When answering that question, you must keep in mind the following characteristics of routing protocols. And Cisco wants you to remember all of these. First is scalability. How large is your network now? How large will it become? This is important because there are versions of RIP, or actually all versions of RIP, have a maximum hop count of 15 routers. OSPF and EIGRP scale much better, and BGP is the primary routing protocol used on the internet, so obviously it scales very well, and many companies in fact use BGP internally for that reason. Vendor interoperability. Will you be using all Cisco routers on your network, or will it be a blend of Cisco and non-Cisco? Why is that important? Well. RIP and OSPF work fine regardless of vendor, and now even Cisco has taken steps to ensure EIGRP can be used by any networking vendor. The question is, do they support it? RIP and OSPF and BGP most likely, EIGRP maybe or maybe not by non-Cisco vendors. IT staff's familiarity with the protocol. You and the IT staff at your company might be much more familiar with one routing protocol over another. I worked at a company where we had an internal debate over EIGRP versus OSPF. And the tipping point for the conversation was what protocol do the engineers already know or want to learn better? It was OSPF. And therefore, that's what we went with as far as our design decision. That was the tipping point. You will have the same debates internally and should be prepared for this in your decision-making process. Speed of convergence. A benefit of dynamic routing protocols over static routes is the ability for dynamic routing protocols to reroute around network failures. When this failure occurs, the network recalculates and reaches a steady state condition. This is called the state of being a converged network. The amount of time for the failover to occur is called the convergence time. Now, some routing protocols have faster convergence times than others. This is important because when a network is not in a steady state, data can be dropped or looped within the network. You should know that because RIP and BGP might take up to a few minutes to converge. By contrast, OSPF and EIGRP can converge in just a few seconds. The capability to perform summarization. Large enterprise networks can have routing tables with many route entries and network summarization allows multiple routes to then be summarized into a single route advertisement. So it reduces the number of entries in a router's routing table that eats up less memory and also CPU because it reduces the number of network advertisements that need to be sent. And that can obviously increase convergence time as well. Here's a perfect example. Let's say we're looking at the routing table of a core router and it knows about all the branch offices. And let's say there are 255 branch offices and each are allotted a slash 24 and they're assigned to 192.168. Uh, x.0 slash 24 network. Now, sure, the core router has individual entries for all of these routes and knows how to reach all of them through separate interfaces or tunnels, but all these routes do not need to be passed individually throughout the network onto a neighbor through a route advertisement. They can be summarized 
using one summary route, 192.168.00 slash 16. So as you can see, using summarization, we're saving a lot of memory and CPU by simply summarizing all of these routes um, into one single route. Interior or exterior routing. A key term you need to understand is AS, which stands for Autonomous System. And this is a network under a single administrative control. A network might be a single AS, and when it connects to, let's say, another network, let's say an internet service provider, then it's connecting to a separate AS. When you're selecting a routing protocol, you need to determine, is it running inside your network, or will you be running it with somebody outside of your network? To answer the question as to what routing protocol you should run, you need to understand if you need an IGP, an interior gateway protocol, or a EGP, an exterior gateway protocol. An IGP exchanges routes between routers in a single AS. Common IGPs are EIGRP or OSPF, and then RIP and ISIS are also used, but not as much. Today, the only EGP in use is BGP. But please note that BGP is sometimes also used as an interior gateway protocol as well. There are two types of routing protocols. The first type is distance vector. Distance vector routing protocols send a full copy of the router's routing table to directly attach neighbors. Now, obviously this is not very efficient because it's sending information to a neighbor even if the neighbor already has that information. This can lead to slower convergence time. With slow convergence time, you then can introduce routing loops. The routing protocols that are considered distance vector are RIP and EIGRP. There are two mechanisms that you can use to deal with routing loops that Cisco wants you to know. The first is split horizon. This prevents a route learned on an interface from being advertised back out that same interface. I'll show you a diagram in a minute so this makes more sense. And then there's poison reverse, which causes a route received on one interface to then be advertised out the same interface with an infinite metric so that nobody actually wants to use it. But let's go ahead and take a look at the diagram so we can better understand the issue with routing loops and distance vector routing protocols, and then what we can do about it with split horizon or poison reverse. As you can see here, we have a basic point-to-point -point network, router one connecting to router two over serial interface, and then a network 192.168.1.0 slash 24, which is then advertised out serial zero over to router one. Router one then learns that route and places it in its routing table, as you can see here, with a metric of one, one hop. Now, what if ethernet zero on router two were to go down and the network were no longer available? The problem with distance vector routing is that router one is going to send its full routing table over to router two. Well, router two does not know about 192.168.1.0 anymore. So when it receives the subnet advertisement from router one of 192.168.1.0, it's going to accept it and place it in its routing table with a metric of two. And this is where we introduce routing loops. Router two will then forward traffic over to router one Router th one thinks it can reach that network via router two, and traffic will then loop between the two routers. This obviously is not ideal. Now you've already learned about the two solutions to deal with that, and you'll need to know it for your CCMP exam. Split horizon will prevent a route learned on an interface from being advertised back out that same interface, and then poison reverse, which causes a route received on one interface to be advertised out that same interface with an infinite metric. The next type of routing protocol you need to be aware of is the link state routing protocol. Routers send link state advertisements, or LSA, to advertise the networks they know how to reach. So they don't send the full routing table, just the networks they know how to reach, and only when there is a change in the topology. They only exchange full routing information when two routers initially form their adjacency, but from there on out, it's on a need-to-know basis. The routing protocols that are link state routing protocols are OSPF and ISIS. And the final type of routing protocol you need to know is path vector. BGP is path vector and it includes information not just about the neighbor, but the exact path that packets take 
to reach a specific destination network. So when you do look at BGP advertisements, you can see exactly over what autonomous systems that traffic is flowing over. So here's what you've learned. You've received a foundation for understanding routing protocols that will be helpful not only in your CCDB exam, but also as you learn additional information about each routing protocol as it applies to your CCDP architecture exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about route manipulation. You will need to understand on your architecture exam uh, at least the basics of route filtering, redistribution, and understanding how summarization works. Uh, any of these are fair game on the architecture exam. So let's go ahead and dig into each one of these, understanding you may already know these from your previous studies. Uh, but if you feel like you're weak in any one of these areas, this video is definitely worth watching because you will be asked about these topics. So let's go ahead and begin with summarization. It reduces the number of entries in a router's routing table that eats up less memory and also CPU because it reduces the number of network advertisements that need to be sent. And that can obviously increase convergence time as well. Here's a perfect example. Let's say we're looking at the routing table of a core router and it knows about all the branch offices. And let's say there are 255 branch offices and each are allotted a slash 24. And they're assigned a 192.168.x.0 uh, slash 24 network. Now, sure, the core router has individual entries for all of these routes and knows how to reach all of them through separate interfaces or tunnels. But all these routes do not need to be passed individually throughout the network onto a neighbor through a route advertisement. They can be summarized using one summary route, 192.168.00 slash 16. So as you can see, using summarization, we're saving a lot of memory and CPU by simply summarizing all of these routes um, into one single route. So that's summarization in a nutshell. The next topic we wanna to cover is route filtering. Let's go ahead and discuss this topic. So let's draw out this concept of route filtering just to make sure we understand it before we actually program it. So let's say we have two routers and this router has four routes in its routing table. Now let's say this router has two other EIGRP neighbors as well. And he intends to send all four routes to his, these two neighbors. And he wants them to know about all of those routes. Now let's say in this environment that we only want two of these routes to be known over this path and that we do not want the router at the other end of this path to know about any of the other routes. What we need to do is we actually need to filter and EIGRP allows us to filter so that one router only knows two routes and that the other two routers know all four. EIGRP filtering allows us to do that. Now we can put a filter on this router here and deny one of those routes to say, you know what, we don't want to know about that route and filter that out as well. So that's what we have for route filtering. The next topic we want to discuss in this video, and it's the final topic, is redistribution. Let's go ahead and cover this at a high level, uh, but in a, at a level at least granular enough so that if you do get asked in your architecture exam, understanding it's not a highly technical exam when it comes to asking you about coding or specific commands, but you will have to understand how to answer questions about redistribution at the level you're going to learn in this next segment. So let's go ahead and dig into redistribution. Now let's just do a quick review of redistribution. Let's say we have three routers that are connected and in the middle router, the middle router is connected 
to one router via OSPF and the other router via EIGRP. The EIGRP router knows of routes one and two, and the OSPF router knows of routes three and four, and the middle router, because it's running routing protocols with both, is aware of all four routes. But let's say we want the EIGRP router to learn routes three and four, and we want the OSPF router to learn routes one and two. What we would need to do is redistribute one routing protocol into the other. So we would redistribute OSPF routes into EIGRP, and then that router would learn routes three and four, and then redistribute EIGRP routes into OSPF, and the other router would learn route one and two. Now, that being said, maybe you don't want to redistribute all of your routes. Redistribution can be filtered. So let's say we just wanted to filter out one of those routes and we only wanted to share route three. You can do that. Redistribution also allows you to tag routes. So if you wanted to tag a route, let's, well, let's say tag 100, it would be known by that router as 100. And let's say the other routes, three and four, were tagged as 50. Then if these routes are shared throughout the network in the OSPF uh, area, they would keep these tags. And they would be aware of who is tagged as what. Now, this could become important downstream. Let's say you had a router that, with a rule that said, I am only going to allow routes with a tag of 50. I'm going to deny anything with a tag of 100. That allows you to filter routes not based on subnet or prefix, but simply on tag. So redistribution can be pretty powerful in managing your network. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about route manipulation. We've covered summarization, route filtering, and redistribution. All of these are fair game on the architecture exam. And I'm confident now that you've watched this video, uh, there shouldn't be too many surprises in these areas for you. So I wish you the best of luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video, you're going to learn about advanced EIGRP. Specifically, you're going to learn about the engine or the algorithm that runs EIGRP, EIGRP messages, tables, and modules, and anything else that you really need to know for the CCDP architecture exam. So let's go ahead and begin. EIGRP is a unique protocol because it uses a hybrid approach combining distance vector and link state characteristics. Combining these features makes EIGRP very robust and allows for fast convergence even in larger topologies. Like RIP version 2, EIGRP is a classless protocol and it allows for variable length subnet masks. Another similarity between the two protocols is their automatic summarization behavior. The algorithm that EIGRP uses is called dual or diffusing update algorithm. This is the engine that makes EIGRP such a power pro powerful protocol. Dual operates based on a topology table that contains all the possible prefixes and information about how to reach these prefixes. You'll learn more about the topology table shortly. EIGRP is the only IGP that can perform unequal cost load balancing across different paths. This is accomplished using the variance command, which defines a tolerant number, a tolerant multiplier that can be applied to the best metric, and that will result in the maximum allowed metric. For example, in this diagram, there are two routes with a cumul cumulative metric of 100 to a destination and a route with a cumulative metric of 200 to the same destination. By default, EIGRP performs only equal cost load balancing, so it will send traffic across only the first two links, which have the metric of 100. If you wanted to send traffic over a third link, you'd want to send the variance to two. 
meaning that the maximum allowed metric is two times the lowest metric equaling 200. Traffic will then be sent proportionally to the metric, meaning for each packet sent over the third link, two packets are sent over the first two links because their metric is better. EIGRP has four basic components and these should already start looking familiar to you. It has messages. So messages flow to and from neighbors, EIGRP neighbors. There's five different types. We'll dig into that in a little bit. EIGRP has the dual algorithm. The dual algorithm takes the information from those messages and then processes best path and possible best path. Then all the information from the messages and the algorithms get put into tables. So these EIGRP tables hold the data from the algorithm and the messages. And then finally, the modules. These protocol dependent modules support a variety of network layer protocols. So we're not limited. EIGRP is not limited to just IP. So with regards to messages, there are different types of packet formats. There's five different types of packet formats. First, there's the hello message. A hello message is basically a query out to anybody who will listen, asking if anybody's out there. So a router running EIGRP sends hello packets by default, and it will send those packets out and hope for a return reply. And when it gets a return reply, it'll get that update. And that update contains all of the messages or all of the routes that want to be shared via EIGRP. Update messages are messages with a lot of routing information in them. And then there's the acknowledgement message, which surely you know about from other protocols, but it's simply acknowledging that, yes, I've received your message. And that's key to the reliable nature of EIGRP, which we'll talk about in a minute. There's a query message. So if EIGRP loses a route and does not know how to get there anymore, it will query its neighbor saying, do you have any information about this route? Because I'd like to get that information. And then if a router does have information on that route or on that path, it will reply back saying, yes, I do have information and here it is. So these five messages can be broken out into two categories, uh, some that are reliable and some that are not reliable. The reliable messages are use reliable transport protocol. And this is unique to EIGRP, but RTP basically makes sure that packets um, get to where they're supposed to go in order. So an unreliable packet is a hello message. Um, that message is not reliable, but the update message from an EIGRP router does use RTP. So it is sequenced and there are acknowledgements. So there is an acknowledgement to that message, but the acknowledgement itself is not reliable. Then there's the query message. Remember the query is to ask, do you have information about this route? And that is that uses RTP and the response to that query, the reply also uses RTP. So three different types of messages use RTP, the update, the query, and the reply. And I think that's critical to know for your exam. Now let's talk about the EIGRP algorithm, which is dual. Now to understand dual, you need to understand what successor and feasible successor routes are. Think when you think of successor, just think of success. That's the best path. So if EIGRP loses connectivity to the best path, it will then run the dual algorithm and ask, is there a feasible successor? Is there a second best path? And if the dual algorithm states, yes, there is a feasible successor, a second best path, it will then promote that second best path to the, to, to the best path. So that becomes the successor. Once it's, a, it's the successor, it is then installed into the routing table. So for example, it would be installed into the IP routing table, and then the router would begin to use that new path. So this chart gives you an overview of, of base, a high level overview of how the dual algorithm runs. But it's important to know these concepts of successor and feasible successor as you move forward with EIGRP and how Dual uses that information. Now, as stated earlier, a key table to understand is the EIGRP topology table. Topology table contains all destinations advertised by neighboring routers. This includes 
Remember, the successor and feasible successor routes the best path to a destination and the next best path, respectively. So a topology table is key for EIGRP to run. Now remember, within topology table, you can see the route tag. So in EIGRP, you can actually perform route tagging. And all you really need to know for now is that you can identify routes by their origination, which allows for custom routing. So you can tag those routes with a manual entry. So that's all you really know, need to know for now. But getting back to EIGRP tables, now, here, here's an example. We have, again, a hub and spoke design, router A, router B, and router C. Now, router A is going to build out, as soon as it enables EIGRP, it's going to build out these EIGRP tables. And one of the tables, again, is going to be this topology table. The topology table is going to contain critical information for EIGRP to run and make the choices upon what the best path is going to be. So. In the topology table, it's going to insert routes that it learns from router B and router C. And then it's going to ask, now that I know about this route, which neighbor did I learn it from? And then finally, it's going to say, all right, I know the route. I know the neighbor I learned from. What metric should I assign to it? Which way should I send traffic or forward traffic? So in this example, the route itself, let's say we'll do a 10.1.1.0 slash 24. And let's say we learn this route from both router B and from router C. So this topology table is filled out with two entries for the same route. Again, this is not the routing table yet. This is the topology table. And it has a metric, so let's keep it simple. So the metric to router B is 10, and their metric to router C is 20. So for this simple example, let's just say that the router now realizes that the successor route, the best route, is going to be the path through router B. Now, once the dual algorithm has run and it realizes this, it then takes that route or that path and it places the successor route into the routing table in this case the ip routing table so now we know the successor is to router b and the feasible successor path is to router c so as we can see it's going to choose the path out to router b now what happens if this route information is lost and router a no longer learns about this this route from router b or from router c and it gets flushed well router a what he's going to do is he's going to send a query to router b and to router c asking do you know about this route because i've lost it and i'm hoping you have information on it and the neighbors will respond back, but specifically, let's say in this case, that router C is the only one that knows about it. Router C will respond, yes, I'm aware of it, and it will send the information over, and router A will say, thank you very much, and router A will then insert it into the topology table. It will become the successor, and once it's the successor, it will be placed into the routing table, and then router A will then begin using the path through router C to reach that subnet. And last, but certainly not least, we have protocol dependent modules. So EIGRP and the dual algorithm function in a way that protocols can run and use EIGRP independently of one another. So IP builds out its own neighbor and topology tables, IPX and Apple Talk, they all build out their own neighbor and topology tables and dual can work with any and all of them. So neighbor discovery and updates are a big part of the EIGRP, and the best way I can equate this is if you have a new neighbor who moves into the neighborhood, you surely knock on his door and you introduce yourself and you tell him about yourself. Maybe you're married, uh, where you're from, what your interests are. You tell the neighbor a lot about yourself, and if your neighbor is friendly, they're probably going to tell you a lot about themselves as well, like where they're from and what they're interested in as well. So 
in that initial conversation, a lot of information is exchanged. When you see that neighbor in the future, you don't give them all that information again. You just give them an update. You just say maybe what happened to you in the past day or so. So EIGRP pretty much works the same way. When two routers establish an EIGRP neighbor relationship, initially, there is a major conversation where a lot of information is, is transferred between the two routers. And then there are follow-up conversations after that that I just have incremental updates. So the best way for me to describe this to you is actually just to draw this out. So let's say here we have router one and router two, and let's say they're sharing the same uh, point to point circuit and both of the interfaces, uh, directly connected interfaces uh, for router one and router two are both participating in EIGRP. So router one sends a hello packet over to router two. And router two receives that and router two sends a hello message over to router one. And this neighbor relationship now comes up in EIGRP. Now, initially there is a large transfer of routes saying, hey, I have a lot of information to share with you. And router one says, you know what? You don't know anything about me. I have a lot of information to share with you, a lot of routes to share with you. Now these hello messages continue repeatedly over and over. So the routers know that, hey, I know you're still around and I know you're still up and running. And they're consistently checking to make sure that they receive these hello packets. But let's say router one has a new update, a new subnet they know about. They're just going to send information on that subnet. Or let's say router two turns up a new interface and they insert that interface into EIGRP. Let's say 10110, it's a slash 24. Well, router two, when they send an update to router one, they're just gonna send this one update. So again, it's like the conversation with your neighbor. You're gonna have one initial conversation about a lot of things, but then your follow-up conversations are pretty much just gonna be updates. That's pretty much how EIGRP works. Now, the default for high bandwidth links, the hello interval is five seconds, the hold time is 15. For low bandwidth, uh, the hello interval is 60 seconds, and the hold time is 180 seconds. But for the example here, Let's say we want to know, we need to know faster than 15 seconds if a circuit is down or a neighbor is down and that we no longer want to forward routes and we want to tweak that. Well, EIGRP allows you to do that. Um, we can just log on to the interface, um, onto the router and then configure the interface to change these intervals so that we are aware if our neighbor is down much quicker than the 15 second hold time. So the way you do that is that uh, you, you actually you go into the configuration and then you go into the interface itself. So fast ethernet here, you know, fast ethernet one one is the interface on this point to point link and IP hello interval EIGRP autonomous system number 10. And we're gonna set that to two seconds and IP hold time EIGRP 10. We're gonna set that to six seconds. Now, this is important to note. Hello interval is important to note locally, but hold time is actually information we send on to the other router. And let's actually draw this out. I think it'll make a lot more sense for you. So here we have router one and router two. And we have set router one, the hello interval uh, to two seconds. So every two seconds, we will be sending a hello message over to router two. Every two seconds. And again, we've adjusted that from the default five down to two seconds. Now, it's important to note, we also set the hold time for router one to six seconds. And this hold time information is not actually held locally. We forward that over to router two to say, hey, you know what, router two, if you don't hear from us in six seconds, then we're down. So here, we send you a hello packet. Router two counts down six, five, four. Oh, I received a new hello, because it's two seconds later. I'll begin counting down again, six, five, four. I received another hello, and that resets my hold time counter, and I will begin counting down again. So every two seconds, these hello packets are actually resetting that hold time counter on router two. Let's say router one, the interface goes down or the router goes down. Uh, router two begins counting six, five, four. He's not going to receive any hello messages. 
And he's going to count all the way down to zero. And he says, you know what? I haven't heard from you. You are down. <clears throat> That's important to note because now I'm going to flush your routes out of my table because I don't want to forward traffic to you anymore because it's, it's probably just going to get dropped. And therefore, all the information from router one is, is flushed out of the routing, router two uh, routing table. And that's important to know for convergence purposes that you can tweak these numbers. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about EIGRP algorithm, messages, tables, and modules, and any other key information you needed to know for your CCDP architecture exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video, you're going to learn about advanced OSPF. Now, actually, some of what we're going to be reviewing, you would consider foundational to OSPF, but being that you work with OSPF day in and day out, you begin to forget about some of the foundational aspects of OSPF, such as virtual links, router types, link state advertisements, the specifics of these topics, the fine details of OSPF that you may not be working with every day, but you certainly need to know for your CCDP architecture exam. So we are going to talk about OSPF functionality, router types, virtual links, link state advertisements, and area types so that you have the information you need to do well on your exam, but also obviously to uh, manage your network. The OSPF protocol is one of the most complex routing protocols that can be deployed in modern networks. It is an open standard protocol and a classless routing protocol, so that allows it to support VLSM. It uses the Dijkstra SPF algorithm to select loop-free paths throughout the topology. OSPF is designed to be very scalable because it is hierarchical in nature, using the concept of areas to split the topology into smaller sections. OSPF generally does not converge as fast as EIGRP, but it does offer efficient updating and convergence, as it takes bandwidth into consideration when calculating route metrics or what OSPF considers costs. A higher bandwidth generates a lower cost, and lower costs are preferred in OSPF. OSPF supports authentication and is very extensible, meaning that the protocol can be modified in the future to handle other forms of traffic. Now we've covered a lot in the first couple minutes. Let's dig deeper into what we've talked about and get a bit more granular. So let's start with administrative areas. So let's start from the basics here. Autonomous system is a, is a network under a common network administration. Now, I'm sure you know that. So, but an OSPF, an autonomous system is broken out into areas. So areas are a group of routers that share a same area ID. And these different areas, these different groupings have different functions and, and they know different types of information. So, you have backbone area, standard area, et cetera, et cetera. And each of these areas perform different functions. So let's talk in detail about what some of these areas know and maybe what some of these areas do not know, but also how OSPF is designed around these, these concepts of areas. So remember, we're talking at a higher level here, but as, as, a, as a good rule of thumb, um, your backbone area in OSPF if anybody ever refers to area zero, you know they're talking about the backbone area in OSPF. And this is probably the most well-known area because uh, it is required. And all other areas must connect to the backbone area. So if for area to area communication, let's say you have an area one communicating to an area three, both of those areas must connect to the backbone. 
So let's start here with a standard area. Now, a standard area, you know, you know, what does that really mean? Well, standard areas can be thought of as equal opportunity employers, I guess you could say, because um, they know about every route in the autonomous system in the OSPF network. And they share their routes, but they also learn all their routes uh, from other areas uh, through the backbone. And this is just fine. All of this route sharing is just fine if routers are high powered enough to store every route, but also to run these uh, complex SPF calculations. Um, but just know that standard areas contain LSAs of type 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Now next, you know, if you think of a, a stub area, which we'll talk about next, if you think of a network, you know, you have leaf nodes on networks. Well, that's what kind of a stub area is. It's handy if devices are lower powered, routers are lower powered, or simply do not need to know about every route. A stub area is similar to a standard area, but routers in it are not aware of externally sourced routes directly. And in terms of LSAs, that means that type five LSAs are not permitted in a stub area. Stub areas use a default route uh, to exit. For traffic to exit a stub area, it uses a default route. Now, next would be a totally stubby area. And let's take this stub area concept one step further. In a, in a total stubby area, in addition to the lack of type four and five LSAs, type three LSAs, which carry information about internal routes are also prohibited. Uh, the concept of an injected default route still applies here, just like a stub area. So all traffic leaving the area does so using the default route. And then finally, let's go over this concept of not so stubby areas. So, you know, this is an interesting, uh, I guess you could say concoction because not so stubby areas can connect to non OSPF networks um, that are not a part of this autonomous system and they, and they can receive routes from those non OSPF networks or networks that are not participating in the autonomous system. And it will receive those routes through redistribution. And then it can um, turn those type seven LSAs and kind of, you know, basically it's gonna mask them and, and make them appear as type five LSAs and then begin sharing them onto the network. So there's, there's your ideas of networks and, and areas, but all areas in an OSPF autonomous system must be, as you know, physically connected to the backbone area. Well, what if you can't do that? You know, what if you, uh, what if you can't connect an area to uh, area zero? So let's draw out this concept of a virtual link. Let's imagine we have our a company on the East Coast and we have in this company, we've deployed OSPF already. So we have our backbone area zero. And then we have other areas that have to obviously connect into this backbone area. So let's say we have an area one in the Boston area and then an area two, let's say in Florida. But let's focus in on area one. So in the Boston area, we have area one in Boston and we acquire another company in that area. And it's easy enough for us to connect this new company into our Boston resources. So uh, we're gonna connect them into our Boston router very simply. The problem is, is that even though this company that we've acquired, maybe they're already running OSPF and we convert them to OSPF area three to work within our autonomous system, we still need to meet the requirement of OSPF where an area must connect into area zero. So OSPF allows for what is called, as you know, the virtual link. We will create this virtual link between area three and area zero. It's passing through area one, and this allows us to meet that design requirement of OSPF. So route to area three and area zero see this as a direct connection and things will work just fine thanks to the virtual link. So there are many different OSPF router types that you need to be aware of. 
There's the area border router, which connects one or more OSPF areas to the backbone area. There's the ASBR, or Autonomous System Boundary Router, which will be located between an OSPF autonomous system and a non-OSPF network. And then you have your backbone router, which is pretty straightforward, a router with at least one interface connected to area zero. And then another easy concept, an internal router, a router with all interfaces in one area. Let's draw this out real quick, let's just to drive it home. So uh, let's draw out our area zero. And in area zero, you know already is the backbone. So a router within area zero is a backbone router. And then we connect to another area, let's say area one. And this is an, this is an area border router. Pretty straightforward concept. There's your ABR. And let's say we have another area we're connecting to. There's another ABR. But we are also connecting an ASBR here because we have a non-OSPF network that we're going to be injecting routes from into our OSPF process. So we are injecting routes in through an ASBR, converting type 7 LSAs to type 5, and those are being forwarded on to the network. And then you have, last but not least, internal uh, routers, which have all interfaces in the same area. Pretty straightforward. So in order for two OSPF routers to communicate, they need to go through this process of exchange states. So you need to understand a basic concept of what these are. Here's the following states. There's the init state where a hello packet has been sent by a router. It's waiting for a reply. Then the establishment state where there's the discovery of that hello and then the election of a DR and multi-access networks. The X start stage where a master slave relationship is started between two routers. The router with the higher router ID becomes the master and starts the exchange and as such is the only router that can increment the sequence number. Then there's the exchange state where the slave acknowledge, acknowledges the master's packets and this information in this state is only LSA headers and, that does, and, and it describes the contents of the entire link state database. Then there's loading where there's a request for more information. In this state, the actual exchange of link state information occurs. And then there's full synchronization. And in this state, routers are fully adjacent with one another. All the router and network LSAs are exchanged and the router databases are fully synchronized. Now a designated router in OSPF is a key concept that you need to know because on multi-access networks, a designated router will establish adjacencies with all other routers on the multi-access network, learn all of their routes, and then share all of their routes with all the other routers. And then the, the BDR, the backup designated router, will fill in should the DR fail. And you can set the DR and the BDR manually. And actually, you, most, you, you should do it this way. You should set it using the priority command in OSPF. So understanding OSPF priority is key because you can manually set who the DR is and who the BDR is. Now, it's easy to talk about this and look at a, look at a PowerPoint and you may not fully appreciate how important this concept really is. So let's actually draw it out. So on a typical multi-axis network, let's say we have five routers and you want to establish adjacencies in OSPF to share routes between them. If they did it that way, where they're all neighboring with one another and communicating with one another, you're going to see that all of these adjacencies are going to add up pretty quickly. And that's going to, that's going to tax the resources on the routers themselves, but it's really unnecessary. We can share this information in a much more efficient manner. So what we're going to do is we elect a DR in OSPF. Again, it has this built in within the, the OSPF design itself, where multi-access networks, you can elect a DR. And then the DR establishes an, a, an adjacency with all the other routers on the multi-access network. It learns all of their routes and then shares all of their routes. So now we just have four adjacencies required. Now, if the DR fails and those adjacencies fail, the BDR would take over. Now regarding link state advertisements, what you really need to know, at least just for now in OSPF, is that a link state advertisement 
is a packet that contains all relevant information regarding a router's links and the state of those links. Now there are many different types and I've listed the key types for you here. And we're gonna dig into detail on these different types as we get into the labs. But just for now, know that these are, these are informational packets that have information on a router's links and the state of those links. So now that OSPF has gathered all this information, it needs to know what to do with it. It needs to choose the best path. So it puts all the information in a topology table. And then OSPF, the metric for OSPF is cost. So cost is 10 to the power of 8 divided by bandwidth. And lower costs are preferred. So the best way to understand cost is actually for us just to draw this out to see how it works. So let's draw out a six router network. And let's say we have router one, which ultimately wants to communicate with a network off of router six. And it will have two choices, two paths it can possibly take. It can go via router two or via router four to this network, we'll say 192.168.10 network slash 24. which is hanging off router six. Now, router one then calculates using OSPF the cost for each and every link in this path. And it's gonna do the same uh, for the path from router two and three to six. And then what OSPF is going to do is add up the entire cost to get to router six. So from going via router four, that path is a total cost of 20. And going via router two, that path is a total cost of 25. And we know that OSPF uses the lower cost to make its decision on which path to take. So the total cost of 20 wins out and we will choose router four. Now that being said, let's say a new network is introduced that has higher bandwidth links. And even though we have more routers or more hops through this network, let's say there are four hops. If the cost is low, and for this case, we'll say five, five, one, one, and one. If the total cost here is just 13, even though there's more hops, OSPF is gonna choose this path because it's more efficient. So that's cost basically explained. That's cost in a nutshell. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about OSPF functionality, router types, virtual links, link state advertisements, and area types. All this you'll need to know for your CCDP architecture exam. And I wish you the best of luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video, we're going to be covering advanced BGP. Specifically, we're going to cover the necessity of BGP, then we'll dig into BGP functionality, path vector attributes, the scalability of BGP using route reflectors and confederations as well. So let's begin. BGP is used to route between autonomous systems and is considered to be a path vector routing protocol. Routing decisions are based on multiple attributes that can be tuned and controlled, resulting in the particular path the AS's data will take. This is more of a policy-based routing approach, and policy routing is very important for Internet service providers routing traffic between each other for different AS's. BGP is a classless routing protocol and it supports VLSM and summarization. While IGPs can scale to thousands of routes, BGP can scale to hundreds of thousands of routes, making it the most 
scalable routing protocol ever developed. Another characteristic of BGP is its high rate of stability. As there is never a solid convergence of the internet routing table, that is something that's always changing in such a large routing table, this is obviously very important to be stable. In addition, it is stable enough to handle routing and decision making at the same time. Because BGP focuses on the enforcement of policies, it does not use a simple metric value that might be tied to a single parameter. Instead, BGP has a group of attributes that can be manipulated to dictate a particular routing policy, and you will learn about all of those attributes in this video. When used to exchange routing information between organizations, BGP can be configured in two particular ways. As a transit network, that is when ISPs want to provide transit to other destinations on the public internet, or a multi-homed network, big enterprise networks that rely heavily on internet traffic and have sophisticated connectivity requirements would use this methodology if the connectivity connects to two or more ISPs. BGP allows them to control inbound and outbound routing policies. Most of the enterprise networks do not need BGP. This can be for various reasons. First, the network requires single ISP connectivity and default routing is sufficient. A default route will simply point to the ISP so all internet traffic is routed out that single connection. Memory and CPU resources are limited and do not support BGP implementation. Since the global routing table needs more than one gig of memory just for storage, obviously not every business will have that much memory or capability. Finally, not owning the IPv4 address space in use. This happens in situations where the organization's addresses are owned by the ISP, which is a frequent occurrence for small and medium-sized organizations. Now, regarding BGP path attributes, there are some that you absolutely have to know and memorize. The first is weight. Weight influences a best route for the local router, and it, obviously it's manually configured. Local preference influences the best route for all routers in an autonomous system, so this is a shared attribute. AS path lists the number of autonomous system numbers in the path, and this can be manipulated. Origin is a value implying if the route is from an IGP or an EGP. And then finally, the MED, which can influence the best route for routers in another AS, so you can influence traffic flows into your AS by sending out the MED uh, to other, uh, other routers. So here you can see we have two routers that are in autonomous system 700. And then upstream, we have another router in autonomous system 140 and autonomous system 87. So here you see there are four hops, but as far as BGP is concerned, it's just counting ASs. So it counts one, two, three ASs. The AS path is 700, 140, and 87. Why is this important to know? Because here's another flow that has two routers in AS 700 and then one router in AS 87. Now, according to this path, there's just two ASs. That would be the preferred path. It's critical to understand that BGP is concerned about AS path and not so much about hop count. AS path is a key attribute to understand. Now, internal versus external BGP. IBGP is something you would run basically interior to your company. It's BGP connectivity within the same autonomous system. In this, routers do not update AS path. Normally, they should never have to because you're running the same autonomous system. And in IBGP, things should always be meshed. Routers should always be fully meshed. And there are ways you can get around this. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, eBGP is external connectivity to other ASs. And routers do update the AS path in those cases. So let's say we have an autonomous system 200 and in our company we're running IBGP full mesh between all routers.
And let's say we have connectivity to two upstream providers. One is Autonomous System 301, and the other provider is Autonomous System 450. Now, between ourselves and our providers, we are running eBGP because it's two different ASs. And internally, we are running iBGP because we are communicating between the same AS. Now, configuration between iBGP and eBGP is, is quite similar. The main difference is you're choosing to communicate with the same AS or a different AS. Now, let's say we want to communicate to a web server over the internet. And we have a certain amount of hops. Now, let's say one of those paths through AS450 takes us through quite a few more hops, but it takes us through fewer ASs. So let's just say, for example, we go through AS900 and then AS100. So that's 450, 900, and 100. Those are the three ASs we traverse in order to reach that route. Now let's say on this flow through Autonomous System 301, we go through fewer hops, but more ASs. Now, even though there's fewer hops, because there are more ASs, we're not going to prefer this route. There are five ASs in this path that is not gonna be preferred to the other path, which has only three ASs. So we're gonna choose that path. We'll choose the three AS path. Now let's say we're running a web server inside of our company and we're running iBGP between these three routers and we're connecting to two upstream providers using eBGP. And let's say we have users on the internet who are trying to get to this web server. We can manipulate the AS path attribute in BGP to make them prefer one path over the other. And the way we do that, now let's say our autonomous system is 50. We can manipulate the AS path attribute um, by adding to the AS path on one of our links. So, for example, the users know that they can reach the web server via one AS. Well, we're going to increase that on the top router and we're going to manipulate it manually and add our AS over and over again to the AS path attribute and the users as far as BGP is concerned that now is a longer path and therefore the users will prefer the bottom path because it's only one hop one AS hop now if that router were to fail users would then prefer the other path. So you see, you can manipulate traffic flows that way. Now you need to understand the concept of public and private ASNs, and this shouldn't be foreign to you because you understand public and private IP addressing. So autonomous system numbers are chosen from this pool and you can use them um, for private use or public use as need be, but you should be aware of that chart. Now regarding BGP updates that we receive from neighbors, you can receive from your provider a default route only, which many people do, or you can receive a full BGP routing table. That is literally every route that's available on the internet, or you can receive just partial updates. And that is maybe the provider knows about certain routes via a better path than most other providers. You can just receive a partial update from your provider. So you should know that you can receive those three different types of updates that should be known for your CCNP route exam. Now regarding advertising routes, advertising BGP routes can be done four ways, either through the manual network command, redistribution of BGP into IGP, or propagation of existing BGP routes, or again, manually using the aggregate address command. Maybe the best way to explain these is to simply draw it out. Now imagine we have a router with an iBGP connection and an eBGP connection to an upstream provider. So there's our eBGP connection, here's our iBGP connection, and we're autonomous system, let's say 400. So on a router, we can advertise in four different ways. 
we can manually specify the network we want to advertise by literally typing it in network 10.10.10.0 or uh, network uh, 198.110 and we can forward that via IBGP and or eBGP. The other way is we can learn routes via BGP and redistribute that route into, let's say, an interior routing protocol. Let's say if we're running OSPF, we can take the, the routes we learn from our eBGP neighbor and redistribute them. The other way is to simply pass the routes we're learning from our eBGP neighbor via BGP internally to our iBGP neighbor. So that's just forwarding the, the information on. And finally, we can, again, manually set an aggregate address on the router. And that's a manual configuration to aggregate some of the routes. And again, that can be advertised out either way. So the rule of synchronization in BGP, you should simply know this, that BGP will not advertise a route unless it knows about that route via an IGP. That's what you really need to know for the exam. Now you can disable this by typing no synchronization on your router, and then it will simply forward routes that are not in the IGP. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about the advanced BGP information you need for your CCDP architecture exam, including its necessity, its functionality, path vector attributes, and its scalability through route reflectors and or confederations. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, you're going to learn about IPv6 routing. Specifically, we're going to focus in on RIP, OSPF, and EIGRP changes to support IPv6 with the understanding that ISIS and BGP underwent the least amount of modifications to support IPv6 because they were built with extensibility in mind. Cisco routers do not route IPv6 by default and this capability should be activated with the IPv6 unicast routing command. Cisco routers are dual stack capable by default, meaning they are capable of running IPv4 and v6 simultaneously on the same interface. IPv6 allows the use of static routing, and it supports specific dynamic routing protocols that are variations of the IPv4 routing protocols modified or redesigned to support IPv6, such as RIP Next Generation, OSPF version 3, and EIGRP version 6. We will talk about each of these routing protocols individually. Before we do that, let's talk about what they have in common. RIP NG, OSPF version 3, and EIGRP version 6 are new routing protocols that work independently of the IPv4 versions, and they run in a completely separate process on the device. BGP and ISIS are exceptions to this rule as they route IPv6 traffic using the same process used for IPv4 traffic, but they use the concept of address families that hold the entire IPv6 configuration. Many of the issues with IPv4 still exist with IPv6 routing, such as name resolution and non-broadcast multi-access environments. An important aspect is that IPv6 routing protocols communicate with the remote link local addresses when establishing their adjacencies and exchanging routing information. In the routing table on an IPv6 router, the next hops are link local addresses of the neighbors. As mentioned, static routing is one of the options that can be used in IPv6 and it has the same implications as in IPv4. A route can point to the next hop, a multi-point interface, or a point-to-point -point interface. 
To support IP version 6, all of the IPv4 routing protocols had to go through adaptations. Each had to be changed to support longer addresses and prefixes, and the actual messages used to send and receive routing information have changed in some cases as well, using IPv6 headers instead of v4 headers. But in particular, like their IPv4 versions, each version 6 IGP uses v6 multicast addresses. Those are just a few of the changes, but even with those changes, each IP version 6 IGP has many more similarities than differences compared to their respective version, version 4 cousins. Let's start with RIP. The overall operation of RIP Next Generation closely matches that of RIP version 2. Routers still send periodic full updates with all routes. No neighbor relationships occur. The continuing periodic updates also serve the purpose of confirming that the neighboring router still works. The big difference between RIP version 2 and RIP Next Generation configuration is that RIP Next Generation discards the age-old RIP network command and replaces it with an enable interface subcommand. Finally, RIP Next Generation allows multiple RIP Next Generation processes on a single router. So an iOS requires that each RIP Next Generation process is given a text name that identifies each RIP Next Generation process for that one router. Next, let's talk about EIGRP. Cisco originally created EIGRP to advertise routes for IP version 4, IPX, and Apple Talk. This original EIGRP architecture easily allowed for yet another layer 3 protocol, IP version 6, to be added. As a result, Cisco did not have to change EIGRP significantly to support version 6, so there are many similarities that exist between version 4 and version 6 versions of EIGRP. Now regarding OSPF, in order to support IP version 6, an IETF working group took the OSPF version 2 standard and made changes to the protocol to support version 6, resulting in the new protocol named OSPF version 3. To migrate to IPv6, routers run OSPF version 2 for v4 support and version 3 for IPv6 support. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about the updates required in routing protocols for IPv6 support. And then specifically, we dug a little bit deeper into RIP Next Generation, OSPF version 3, and EIGRP version 6. This is the information you'll need to know for your CCDP architecture exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn Advanced IS. IS. Now, that being said, here's what you're going to learn. You're going to start off with a refresher on ISIS, IS, and then we're going to jump into ISIS IS operations, areas, addressing, and then focus in on metrics and then the enhanced design in ISIS. IS. And all of this will be used to prepare you for your architecture exam and you certainly need to know all of this. So let's go ahead and begin. In recent years, the ISIS routing protocol has become increasingly popular with widespread usage among service providers. It is also a very flexible protocol that's been extended to incorporate leading edge features such as MPLS traffic engineering. The ISIS routing protocol is a link state protocol as opposed to distance vector protocols such as RGRP and RIP. ISIS protocol is an intra-domain OSI dynamic routing protocol. ISIS uses a two-level hierarchy and it's used to support these large routing domains. 
A large domain may be administratively divided into areas. From a high level, ISIS operates as follows. Routers running ISIS will send hello packets out all ISIS-enabled interfaces to discovered neighbors and establish adjacencies. Routers sharing a common data link will become neighbors if their hello packets contain information that meets the criteria for forming an adjacency. Routers may build a link state packet, LSP, based on their local interfaces that are configured for ISIS and prefixes learned from other adjacent routers. And a shortest path tree is calculated by each IS and from this SPT, the routing table, and from this, the routing table is built. Next, let's talk about areas and the routing domain within ISIS. So an ISIS routing domain is similar to BGP autonomous system. A routing domain is a collection of areas under an administration that implements routing policies within the domain. First, let's talk about the backbone. ISIS does not have a backbone area like OSPF area zero. The ISIS backbone is a contiguous collection of level two capable routers, each of which can be in a different area. Now, speaking of areas within ISIS, an individual router is only in only one area and the border between areas on the link that connects the two routers that are in different areas. And the border between areas is on the link that connects two routers that are in different areas. This obviously is in contrast to OSPF. So as you've already heard, ISIS has a two level hierarchy, contiguous level two capable routers from the backbone. Both level two and level one routers live in areas. Routers can be level one, level two, or both level one, level two. Within the Cisco IOS software, the default configuration is both level one and level two at the same time. This allows ISIS network to run with minimal configuration in more of a plug and play fashion. Level two capable routers connect all areas within a routing domain. Level two routers advertise their own NSAP address to other, two, other level two routers in the backbone. And all level one routers and hosts in an area must have an NSAP with the same area address. A level two router may have neighbors in the same or in different areas, but it has a level two link state database with all information for inter area routing. Level two routers know about other areas, but will not have level one information from its own area. A level one and level two router may have neighbors in any area. It has two link state databases, a level one link state database for intra area routing and a level two link state database for inter area routing. Next, let's talk about NSAP addresses. An NSAP describes an attachment to a particular service at the network layer of a node, similar to the combination of IP destination and IP protocol number in an IP packet. An NSAP address has two major parts the IDP or initial domain part and the DSP, the domain specific part. The IDP consists of a one byte authority and format identifier, that's the AFI, and a variable, variable length initial domain identifier, the IDI. And the DSP is a string of digits identifying a particular transport implementation of a specified AFI authority. Everything to the left of the system ID can be thought of as the area address of a network node. The big difference between NSAP style addressing and IP style addressing is that in general, there will be a single NSAP address for the entire router. All ISs and ESs in a routing domain must have system IDs of the same length. All routers in an area must have the same area address. All level two routers must have a unique system ID domain wide, and all level one routers must have a unique system ID area wide. All ESs in an area will form an adjacency with a level one router on a shared media segment if they share the same area address. If multiple nets are configured on the same router, they must all have the same system ID. Next, let's talk about packet types. 
There are four types of packets. Each type can be level one or level two. First, there is the intermediate system to intermediate system hello packet used by routers to detect neighbors and form adjacencies. Then there's the link state packet. There are four types of LSPs, level one pseudo node, level one non pseudo node, level two pseudo node, and level two non pseudo node. Complete sequence number PDU. CSNPs contain a list of all LSPs in the current database. CNSPs are used to inform other routers of LSPs that may be outdated or missing from their own database. This ensures all routers have the same information and are synchronized. And then finally, partial sequence number PDU. PSNPs are used to request an LSP and acknowledge receipt of an LSP. Next, let's talk about network types. The types of networks that ISIS defines include point-to-point -point and broadcast networks. Point-to-point -point networks, such as serial lines, connect a single pair of routers. A router running ISIS will form an adjacency with the neighbor on the other side of a point-to-point -point interface automatically. The DIS is not elected on this type of link. The basic mechanism defined in the standard is that each side of a point-to-point -point link declares the other side to be reachable if a hello packet is received from it. Next, there's broadcast networks such as Ethernet, even Token Ring. These are multi-access and they are able to connect more than two devices. All connected routers will receive a packet sent by one router. On broadcast networks, one IS will elect itself the DIS. The DIS is responsible for flooding, and it will create and flood a new pseudonode LSP for each routing level that is participating, that it is participating in, that is level one or level two, and for each LAN to which it is configured and connected. A router can be the DIS for all connected LANs or a subset of connected LANs, depending on the configured priority, or if no priority is configured, the layer to address. And then finally, NBMA networks such as Frame Relay or ATM or X25 can connect multiple devices but have no broadcast capability. All other routers attached to the network will not receive a packet sent by this router. Special considerations need to be taken in account when configuring ISIS over these types of networks because ISIS considers these media to be just like any other broadcast media such as Ethernet or Token Ring. In general, it is better configure point-to-point -point networks on WAN interfaces and sub-interfaces. Next, let's talk about ISIS metrics. Cost is the default metric and is supported by all routers. While some routing protocols calculate the link metric automatically based on bandwidth, such as OSPF, or bandwidth and delay, such as EIGRP, there is no automatic calculation for ISIS. Using old styled metrics, an interface cost is between 1 and 63. All links use the metric of 10 by default. The total cost to a destination is the sum of all costs on an outgoing interface along a particular path from the source to the destination, and least cost paths are preferred. The total path metric was limited to 1023. This small metric value proved insufficient for large networks and provided too little granularity for new features. The Cisco iOS software addresses this issue with the support of a 24-bit metric field, the so-called wide metric. Now metrics can have a maximum value of, as you can see right here. Deploying ISIS on the IP network with wide metrics is recommended to enable finer granularity and to support future applications such as traffic engineering. On multi-access networks, ISIS elects a router to act as a pseudo node representing the multi-access circuit. The elected router is known as the designated intermediate system, the DIS. The DIS issues pseudo node LSPs listing all of the routers which are reachable on the network. 
Each router on the network advertises its non-pseudonode LSP's reachability to the DIS. This reduces the amount of information that needs to be advertised. A DIS is elected for each level that is operating on the network, for example, both level 1 and level 2. By default, all routers have the same priority for being elected DIS. The MAC address on each router's interface onto the network is used as the tiebreaker. When all routers have the same priority, the addition or removal of a router on the network can result in a chance in a change in the DIS. This churn can be prevented by assigning a higher priority to the router which you want to act as the DIS. Priorities can be configured individually for level 1 and level 2. The default priority is 64. You can configure the priority from the range of 0 to 127. You can configure a summary address to represent summarized aggregate addresses within the ISIS routing table. This produces this process is called route summarization. Using a summary address can enhance scalability and network stability because it reduces the amount of information that needs to be advertised and reduces the frequency of updates required. For example, a single route flap may not cause the summary advertisement to flap. The disadvantage of using the summary address is that routing may be suboptimal. For example, the path to a spe specific destination covered by the summary address may be longer than that what normally would have been had all the individual addresses been advertised. Summary addresses are most commonly used to summarize routes from one level 1 area into the level 2 subdomain. One summary address can include multiple groups of addresses for a given level. Routes learned from other routing protocols can also be summarized. The metric used to advertise the summary is the smallest metric of all the more specific routes. In the Cisco iOS software, ISIS has a default metric value of 10 for all active interfaces. If the interface is passive, the default value is 0. Rather than change the metric values for the active interfaces one by one, you can configure a different default metric value to be used by all interfaces. All interfaces that had the original ISIS default metric 10 will be configured with a new default value. Besides offering the user the convenience of being able to glo globally configure the value for all ISIS interfaces, the feature helps prevent errors that may occur when interfaces are individually configured to change the metric value. For example, the user may remove configured metrics from an interface, thereby restoring the default metric value of 10, perhaps unintentionally making that interface a highly preferred one in the network. Such an occurrence on the wrong interface could mean the rerouting of traffic across the network on an undesirable path. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about, it actually received a refresher on ISIS, but then we dug into the items you're going to need to know for your architecture exam, such as operations, areas, addressing, and metrics. And then we talked about enhanced design of ISIS, ways you can tweak it, um, certainly, you'll be asked about many of these things on your architecture exam, but I'm confident now that you've watched this video, you'll do very well on the ISIS section of your exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video we're going to do a WAN design overview. Specifically, we'll do a wide area network overview, and then we will talk about WAN design requirements, the enterprise edge, and then we will talk about WAN categories. So let's go ahead and begin with an overview of wide area networking. Wide area networking technologies operate at the enterprise edge in the modular Cisco enterprise architecture model. WANs span across large geographical distances 
to provide connectivity for various parts of the network infrastructure. Unlike the local area network environment, not all of the WAN components are usually owned by the specific organization they serve. Instead, WAN equipment or connectivity can be rented or leased from internet service providers. Most ISPs are well trained to ensure they can properly support not just the traditional data traffic, but also voice and video services over large geographical distances. With WANs, unlike LANs, there is typically an initial fixed cost along with periodic recurring fees for services. Because the organization does not own everything and must pay recurring fees to ISPs, over-provisioning the network should be avoided. This leads to the need to implement effective quality of service mechanisms to avoid buying additional costly WAN bandwidth. The design requirements for WAN technologies are typically derived from the following. The types of applications, availability of applications, reliability of applications, costs associated with a particular WAN technology, and usage levels for those applications. The enterprise edge represents a large block, or it could be several blocks of equipment. This large module is typically split into smaller blocks, each with a specialized functionality. Here are the following components you will find in an enterprise. The WAN block for branch offices and remote access connectivity. The e-commerce block, which is a part of the organization and obviously serves the business customer facing business applications. The internet connectivity block, which offers robust internet access with some level of availability and redundancy. And also you'll find within this block, um, often your DMZ services and then the remote access or VPN block, which provides secure connectivity for a large number of employees who work out of a home office. An important topic when considering CCDA certification is the common categories within various WAN technologies. An essential concept is circuit switched technology. The most relevant example of this is the PSTN or public switch telephone network. One of the technologies that falls under this category is ISDN. The way circuit switched WAN connections function is by being established when needed and terminated when they are no longer required. Another example that reflects the circuit switching behaviors is the old fashioned dial up connection. You may remember, or maybe you don't, using a dial-up modem analog access over the PSTN to access the internet in the late 1990s. The opposite of circuit switched option is the leased line technology. This is a fully dedicated connection that is permanently up and owned by the company. Examples of leased lines include TDM or time division multiplexing based leased lines, and these are usually very expensive because a single customer has full use of the offered connectivity and you're paying for that bandwidth whether you're using it or not. Another popular category of wide area networking technology involves packet switched concepts. In a packet switch infrastructure, shared bandwidth utilizes virtual circuits. The customer can create a virtual path, which is similar to a leased line through the service provider's infrastructure cloud. This virtual circuit has a dedicated bandwidth, even though technically it's not a real leased line. Frame Relay is an example of this type of technology. Some legacy WAN technologies you may have heard of, such as X25, that's the predecessor of Frame Relay. An example of cell switch technology is Asynchronous Transfer Mode, or ATM. This operates by using fixed sized cells. Cell switch technologies form a shared bandwidth environment from the service provider standpoint that can guarantee customers some level of bandwidth through their infrastructure. Broadband is another hugely growing category for wide area networking, and this includes technologies such as DSL cable and wireless. 
Broadband involves making a connection, such as an old-fashioned coax cable that carries TV signals and figuring out how to use the different aspects of that bandwidth. For example, by using multiplexing, an additional data signal could be transmitted along with the original TV signals. And obviously, wireless continues to expand at a rapid pace. As detailed so far, there are many options when discussing WAN categories. All of these technologies can support the needs of modern networks that operate under the 80-20 rule. That is, 80% of the network traffic uses some kind of WAN technology to access remote resources. Next, let's talk about WAN topologies. There are three you should know of. First, let's talk about full mesh topologies which for obvious reasons require a large number of nodes and added extra overhead. Referring back to the formula n times n minus one divided by two, where n denotes the nodes. This obviously can get very expensive very fast. That being said, the full mesh topology is the best option when considering availability and reliability. Failover will occur on the other links and devices, assuming you have your routing protocols programmed correctly. The downside of full mesh topology, obviously, is the extra overhead associated with building and maintaining all of the connections and the high costs required to install all of the links. A more popular design is the hub and spoke topology. The hub router is usually located at the headquarters location and connects to branch office routers in a hub and spoke fashion. The hub and spoke topology is not the best topology as far as redundancy and availability are concerned, as the hub device is the most common point of failure. So obviously in the hub area, you're going to want to have redundant systems with redundant power supplies, redundant route processors, etc., etc. Hub and spoke topologies are obviously less complex and less expensive than full mesh topologies, so the added investment in the hub site is well worth it. Next, there's partial mesh. This involves a combination of full mesh and hub and spoke. The partial mesh topology falls in the middle of full mesh and hub and spoke topologies in terms of availability and costs. This topology is useful when a high level of availability and redundancy is required only in some areas. So it's a good time to begin discussing network architecture types. The first network architecture type is point to point. Now this is rather self-explanatory. As you can see, we have two network devices connected by a single network link. The typical point to point connection is a serial link. The next architecture type is broadcast network. A broadcast is sent from one of the routers and then propagated to all other routers on that segment. Ethernet networks, like the one you see below, are common examples of a broadcast network. The next architecture type is NBMA, or non-broadcast multi-access. As the name implies, it does not support broadcasts. Therefore, when an interface on a router needs to send out data to all other routers, it must send individual messages to each router. NBMA also doesn't support multicast. So here's what you've learned. You received a wide area network design overview. We talked about design requirements for wide area networking, and then we got more specific with discussing the enterprise edge and the submodules. And then finally, we talked about WAN categories, all this information you'll need to know, not only for the upcoming videos that you'll be watching, but you could be asked on any of this. You could be asked on any of these topics in your CCDP architecture exam. Good luck in your studies.
Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about optical networking. Specifically, you'll learn about Sonnet, and then we'll talk about uh, the bandwidth associated with Sonnet. Then CWDM, DWDM. And then finally, Resilient Packet Ring. So let's go ahead and begin with Sonnet. Synchronous optical network and synchronous digital hierarchy are usually considered similar, although there are some key differences between the two technologies. Synchronous optical network, or SONNET, is the North American high speed transport standard for digital based bandwidth, and it is an ANSI standard. It provides incrementally increased rates that can be used on digital optical links. On the other hand, SDH is the European standard, and it is an ITU standard. Sonnet and SDH are popular connectivity solutions that ISPs can offer based on specific customer needs. Sonnet uses TDM, that is time division multiplexing, as the technique for framing the data and voice on a single wavelength through the optical fiber. Single digital streams are multiplexed over the optical fiber using lasers or LEDs. Sonnet typically uses fiber rings, although it is not exclusively based on a ring topology, and it allows transmissions of distances up to 80 kilometers without having to use repeaters. Single mode fiber can obtain distances of up to 80 kilometers without a repeater as well. Much of the long haul fiber connections are actually Sonnet because it can use repeater technology across a number of internet service provider networks to boost the signals over long distances. Although not all the Sonnet topologies will be ring based, customers who need a reliable link should agree on a strict SLA with the ISP to ensure high reliability through a ring topology. Some common optical carrier rates and the mapped bandwidth for each standard are shown here. You should know all of these for your CCDP exam. You will see the Sonnet SDH standards and then the, capac the bandwidth capacities as well. Now, some of the considerations that must be taken into account when new Sonic connections are being purchased include the following. Details about the transport usage, whether the link will be used for data or voice. Details about the topology, such as linear or ring-based. Details about the single points of failure in the transport. Customer needs, costs, implementation scenarios, and the type of oversubscription offered by the ISP. Although useful to know is whether the bandwidth will be dedicated or shared with other users. If the services are from two ISPs, to achieve high availability and redundancy, they must have different Sonnet implementations and may follow different paths. ISPs usually have the same physical fiber paths. But even if dual ISPs are used, the physical fiber path is often the same and the physical risk, the physical risk of failure does not decrease. If something happens to the pipes that have the fiber links attached, all the ISPs that follow that specific path will suffer an outage. Next, let's cover CWDM and DWDM. Coarse wave division multiplexing and dense wave division multiplexing are two different types of wavelength division multiplexing. Both of these use a multiplexer or a MUX at the transmitter to put several optical signals on the fiber. A DMUX supplier or a DMUX is installed at the receiver and will achieve the inverse operation. This concept is similar to a modem as you know, is, which modulates and demodulates signals. CWDM transmits up to 16 channels, with each channel operating in a different wavelength. It boosts the bandwidth of the existing gigabit Ethernet optical infrastructure without having to add new fiber optic 
cable strands. CWDM has a wider spacing between the channels compared to the DWDM technology, so it's a much cheaper technology for transmitting multiple gigabit signals on a single fiber optic strand. This is great. This is a great amount of support for this equipment from Cisco, which offers many small form factor pluggable or SFP transceivers that can be used with CWDM links. CWDM is often used by organizations on a least dark fiber topologies to boost the capacity from 1 to 8 or 16 gigabits per second over metropolitan area distances. The downside to CWDM is that it is not compatible with modern fiber amplifier technologies such as EDFA. EDFA is a method for amplifying light signals and is making repeaters obsolete. CWDM is also used in cable television implementations. But DWDM is a core technology for optical transport networks that is similar to CWDM in some ways. However, with DWDM, the wavelengths are much tighter, so there are up to 160 channels as opposed to 16 channels with CWDM. This makes the transceivers and equipment much more expensive. Even though there are 160 channels, Cisco DWDM cards can support 32 different wavelengths. In addition, DWDM is compatible with EDFA, so it can reach longer distances when using this technology, which better supports metropolitan area networks and WAN applications. Using EDFA with DWDM technology can achieve distances of up to 120 kilometers between amplifiers. DWDM is a high-speed enterprise WAN and MAN connectivity service. This following figure shows a sample topology of a DWDM optical network that connects three locations. This type of solution typically includes three components. Transponders, which receive the optical signal from a client, convert it into the electrical domain and then retransmit using a laser. Multiplexers, they take the various signals and put them into the single mode fiber. The multiplexer can support EDFA technology. And then finally, amplifiers. They provide powered amplification of the multi-wavelength optical signal. Next, let's talk about Resilient Packet Ring. This is a layer two transport architecture that offers packet transmission based on dual counter rotating ring topology. RPR was standardized in 2004 under IEEE 802.17 and is a layer two packet based transport mechanism that can be offered by various ISPs. It is based on a counter rotating ring structure using dual fiber optic rings allows a much higher level of packet survivability and availability. If one of the stations fails or if the fiber is damaged, then data is transmitted over the other ring. RPR is a layer two technology, so it can be used with either Sonnet SDH or gigabit, 10 gigabit ethernet at the physical layer. This supports enterprise network solutions, MANs and transmission over long, long distances. RPR is a proper solution for MANs with large organizations. A typical RPR topology contains the following components. The IP backbone network, RPR supporting routers, and RPR ring, which is at the MAN core and distribution layers. RPR can provide connectivity to campuses with different buildings or even different locations where there are different business offices across multiple floors. RPR can also support VoIP gateways and provide data, multicasting, and video services. RPR is a better solution than Sonnet or SDH when it comes to data traffic. Sonnet and SDH are capable of handling voice traffic because this type of traffic is consistent in terms of usage. However, data traffic is more bursty, especially when transferring large files. And RPR works better with this type of traffic RPR also works well in point-to-multipoint or multipoint-to-multipoint -multipoint environments. 
It is good at leveraging quality of service technologies to help various types of traffic. So here's what you learned. You've learned about Sonnet and SDH and their bandwidth availability. Then CWDM and DWDM, the similarities and differences. And then finally, you learned about resilient packet rings. So all this information you will need to know for your CCDP exam, and I'm sure you'll do well on this portion of it. So good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Boss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about Metro Ethernet. Specifically, you're going to learn about the general considerations for Metro Ethernet, the Cisco Metro Ethernet solution, then Ethernet private line, Ethernet relay service, Ethernet wire service, Ethernet multi-point service and then finally ethernet relay multi-point service so let's go ahead and begin with general considerations metro ethernet is a rapidly emerging solution that defines a network infrastructure based on the ethernet standard as opposed to frame relay or atm which is supported over a man Metro Ethernet extends MAN technology over to the Enterprise WAN at Layer 2 and Layer 3. This flexible transport architecture can be some combination of optical, optical networking, Ethernet, and IP technologies, and these infrastructure details are transparent to the end user, who sees a service at the customer edge but does not see the underlying technology being used. Metro Ethernet technologies are not visible to customers, but they are responsible for provisioning these services across their core network from the Metro Ethernet access ring. This represents a huge market for the ISP because there are many customers that have existing Ethernet interfaces. And the more customers know about their ISP and the core network, the more informed they will be about the different types of services they can receive and the problems that might happen with those services. In these situations, it is critical to think about the appropriate SLA for advanced WAN services provided to the customer via Metro Ethernet. A generic Metro Ethernet infrastructure contains multiple blocks that provide a wide variety of services, and they are all connected to the Metro Ethernet core. The core can be based on multiple technologies, such as TDM, MPLS, or IP services, that operate on top of the gigabit Ethernet. The ISP can use Sonnet, point-to-point -point links, DWDM, or RPR. The connection points for the different blocks use edge aggregation devices or user provider edge devices that can multiplex multiple customers on a single optical circuit to the network provider edge devices. The Cisco Metro Ethernet solution has specific components such as a multi-gigabit RPR over Sonnet in a dual link topology with RPR operating at layer two and Sonnet at layer one. The core device is the Cisco op optical network system, the Sonnet multi-service provisioning platform, which provides data, voice, and video services. A typical Cisco Metro Ethernet topology is presented in this figure. The aggregate and transport services are very flexible and they can use Ethernet or optical modules, including 10 gigabit Ethernet modules. 
They can support the ring topology, but they can also support linear point-to-point -point start and hybrid topologies. The Cisco ONS MSPP device represents NPE and UPE devices located at the customer location in the form of various high-end routers and switching platforms. Cisco offers a very scalable Metro Ethernet solution over Sonnet, but it also can support switched Ethernet networks for the enterprise or the very popular IP MPLS networks that will be analyzed later on in this video. The Cisco Optical Metro Ethernet solution wants supports five Metro Ethernet forum services. Ethernet Private Line, Ethernet Relay Service, Ethernet Wire Service, Ethernet Multipoint Service, Ethernet Relay Multipoint Service. When selecting between all of these technologies, network designers should always analyze the type of connection they need. If the, co if the company needs only point-to-point -point services, designers should focus on the characteristics of EPL, EWS, or ERS. Whereas if multi-point services are needed, EMS or ERMS should be used. These services are now covered in detail. Ethernet Private Line The Metro Ethernet EPL service is a point-to-point -point service that uses Sonnet rings and provides dedicated bandwidth with no oversubscription abilities. It provides simple uptime for SLAs, and typically the customer edge device is a high-end router or a multi-layer switch, and the line rate between customer sites can reach 1 gigabit per second. EPL Metro Ethernet topologies are usually used in the following areas. Mission critical links on the enterprise network, data centers, support for the business continuity plan and availability solutions, and network consolidations with multiple services. Ethernet Relay Service. This particular flavor of Metro Ethernet which is known as ERS, is all about multiplexing multiple services. This is typically a point-to-point -point service, although it can also support point-to-multipoint connections between two or more customer sites, similar to Frame Relay. While Frame Relay uses the DELSI number as the Layer 2 connection identifier, ERS Metro Ethernet uses a VLAN tag. So every customer has a VLAN tag mapped to a certain Ethernet virtual connection. The Ethernet service in this situation is not transparent to the Layer 2 Ethernet frames because of the VLAN tag which, dictate, which dictates the destination. Because of its service multiplexing capabilities, ERS offers scalability for large sites over a few connections to the MAN or WAN Ethernet services. Typically, the CE device is a high-end router or an ASA device, and ERS can also integrate with existing frame relay or ATM solutions. ERS offers the advantage of having different service tiers, so the ISP can provide several tiers of services with different cost structures based on bandwidth, distance, or class of service. With multipoint connections, the ERS technology transforms into the ERMS Metro Ethernet technology. ERS is a great solution for interconnecting routers in the enterprise network. Ethernet Wire Service Ethernet Wire Service is another point-to-point -point Metro Ethernet service that uses shared provider network switched transport. It offers oversubscription services using statistical multiplexing, and it provides tier service offerings that can be based on distance, class of service, and bandwidth. Because of these features, EWS allows for SLA capacity based on class of service. The CE device is usually a high-end router or multi-layer switch. EWS also supports content networking, and can provide a wide variety of services, portal services, monitoring services, billing services, subscriber database services, 
address management services, policy services, point-to-point -point LAN extensions, Ethernet access to different storage resources, and connectivity to the data center. EWS is a port-based service, so the carrier network is transparent to all of the customer Ethernet traffic. It also provides all-to-one bundling, which means that all the customer packets are transmitted to the destination port in a transparent fashion. EMS is the multipoint version of EWS, and it has the same type of characteristics and technical requirements. In an EMS topology, the P network is a virtual switch for the customers, so several customer sites can be connected and offered any to any communication. This is very useful, especially with the rapid emergence of multicasting and VoIP services. The technology that allows this is called Virtual Private LAN Service, and this will be covered later in this video. EMS allows for rate limiting and service tiers based on distance, bandwidth, and class of service. The CE device is usually a router or multi-layer switch, and typically ISPs will offer extensions of the corporate or campus LAN to the regional branch offices extending the LAN over the WAN. This is a great disaster recovery solution, so it can be integrated into the disaster recovery plan or the business continuity plan. EMS is an excellent subscription service as the P network can be oversubscribed as necessary using statistical multiplexing. From a technology standpoint, EMS uses Q and Q encapsulation to separate customer traffic. And then finally, Ethernet Relay Multipoint Service. ERMS is a combination of EMS and ERS. This service offers the any-to-any -any connectivity of EMS, but it also provides the service multiplexing of ERS. ERMS provides rate limiting and multiple service tiers based on distance, bandwidth, and class of service. The CE device is typically a high-end router, which is also used by the technologies discussed previously. ERMS is used to support various services, including the customer intranet and extranet networks, layer two branch VPN connectivity, layer three VPNs, ISP internet access, and distributed route processor and bridge control protocol solutions. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about the general considerations for Metro Ethernet, the Cisco Metro Ethernet solution, Ethernet private line, Ethernet relay service, Ethernet wire service, Ethernet multipoint service, and Ethernet relay multipoint service. All this you will need to know for your architecture exam. And now that you know it, I'm sure you'll do very well on this portion of your CCDP exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, you're going to learn about IP security for VPNs. Specifically, we're going to talk about IPsec VPN functionality. Then we're going to talk about site to site IPsec VPN design. So let's begin. IPsec represents a suite of protocols working together to achieve different security features in IP networks. Virtual private networks provide connections between devices that do not literally share a physical cable, but by using VPNs, networks look like they are connected, but the connections between them are just logical connections. IPsec ensures data protection on top of the specific logical connections. IPsec helps protect the information that is transmitted through the VPN and it can be in one of two varieties, site-to-site -site VPN or remote access VPN. 
Site-to-site VPNs provide a permanent, secured connection between two locations. Remote access VPNs are used when the virtual link is not always on. This is a situation where the individual needs to transfer something for a short duration of time up to, the, for example, the corporate headquarters, and then it can disconnect. Remote access VPN technologies are similar to dial-on-demand technologies, such as the old circuit-based technologies that function only after a phone number or a number was dialed. The remote access connection closes after it is used, meaning it does not remain per- permanently open like a site-to-site connection would. IPsec is a security suite that allows for many different degrees of security to be designed and implemented. Some situations might require strict security features to be implemented, while other situations might require the security policies to be relaxed for various reasons. The most important security mechanisms provided by IPsec are as follows. Data origin authentication. This ensures that the packet was sent by an authorized user. Data integrity, which ensures that the packet was not changed or manipulated in the transit path. Data confidentiality, which ensures that only authorized users read the data so sensitive information is not compromised. And then anti-reply, which prevents against denial of service attacks that send the same packet multiple times. The IPsec VPN tunnel is built in two phases. First, there is negotiation and then data transmission using negotiated IPsec SA. The Internet Security Association and Key Management Protocol Internet Key Exchange Negotiation Phase is not very secure as it is an internal security phase in which details about how the data will be secured are discussed. The secure VPN tunnel is built after this initial phase. The initial negotiation serves as a mechanism for transferring the IPsec SAs, security associations, which are forms of agreements on different IPsec parameters and is composed of two distinct phases. Phase one is the setup and phase two is negotiation. The goal of this process includes the following, authentication of the parties and establishment of a secure negotiation channel, which this is phase one, perform additional negotiation, which would be considered phase one and a half, and then negotiate data protection parameters, which is phase two. In the first phase, A technology called Diffie-Hellman is used. This generates cryptographic keys to ensure that the communications are secure. Phase 1 can operate in one of two modes, main mode or aggressive mode. Main mode takes longer to negotiate because it hides the party's identities by performing the DH exchange ahead of time. The aggressive mode takes less time to negotiate but does not provide the same level of security as main mode because it does not hide the party's identities. Aggressive mode permits flexible authentication with pre-shared keys. Phase one negotiation processes provide several authentication mechanisms to verify the party's identities. These mechanisms offer different degrees of security. There are pre-shared keys. Using this technology, hosts know the same key via an out-of-band messaging system. This is the least secure authentication mechanism. RSA signatures. Using this method, hosts trust a certificate authority for authentication. This is a much more secure mechanism than using pre-shared keys because a trusted third-party authority controls the process by verifying the identity of each party involved in the authentication process. And then finally, there's RSA encrypted nonces. This technology uses RSA keys to hash random numbers and other values. Once phase one is completed, network designers must decide how the data will be secured. The SA determines how the secure negotiation channel will be established and the peers must agree on the following parameters. The authentication method, 
PSK, which is considered weak, or RSA signatures, which is considered strong. Encryption type, DES, which is considered weak, triple DES, medium, and AES, strong. Hash algorithm, MD5, is considered weak, SHA, strong, and Diffie-Hellman group 1, 2, or 5. After phase 1 is completed, a secure communication channel exists between the IPsec peers. And at this moment, the IPsec SA can be created. Phase 2 can be implemented based on two different technologies, AH, authentication header, and ESP, encapsulated security payload. AH is rarely used in modern networks because it can only perform authentication without actually securing the data. On the other hand, the ESP approach uses both, both authentication and encryption and is the preferred method to be used in Phase 2. When designing IPsec VPNs and providing all of the criteria for Phase 1 and Phase 2, a lifetime for the entire negotiation process must be defined. There is a definable lifetime, and when it expires, the process at Phase 1 and Phase 2 will rerun. A shorter lifetime means more security and more overhead, while a longer lifetime implies less security and less overhead. The IPsec SA rekeying process can also involve PFS, or Perfect Forward Secrecy, which is a technology that allows the rekeying to take place while the IPsec tunnel is in place. Next, let's talk about site-to-site -site IPsec VPN design. Cisco invented a series of technologies to make site-to-site -site VPNs very secure and simple to implement. The Cisco Easy VPN technology was developed with the concept of having software running on routers that could completely automate the establishment of a site-to-site -site or remote access VPN configuration. The software solution is easily operated by configuring settings in a graphical interface. A Cisco Easy VPN server can be configured to act as the head end device and push the required VPN configuration to a remote client. This can happen on many Cisco devices, including iOS routers and firewalls. The Easy VPN Server Wizard is a built in feature in the Cisco Security and Device Manager, SDM, which is the graphical interface on Cisco devices. The configuration process can be very complicated but the EasyVPN Server Wizard can be utilized to configure certain features, including the following. Interface selection, IC configuration, group policy lookup method, user authentication, group policies, and IPsec transformations. In some situations, GRE might be needed in conjunction with IPsec because IPsec ESP, which is used for authentication and encryption, works only with unicast transmissions. Key technologies like routing protocols rely heavily on multicast, so GRE is used for encapsulation in unicast packets. Although GRE provides some interesting capabilities, IPsec without GRE has a much better scalability. This situation in which IPsec is used with GRE and possibly running a routing protocol over the connection adds significant overhead. Cisco recommends using EIGRP as the preferred routing protocol to lower the overhead on GRE over IPsec solutions. In a GRE over IPsec design, multiple head-end devices might be needed to scale the solution or to provide redundancy. When using multiple head-end devices to achieve redundancy, routing metrics should be used to prefer one of the links over the other. The most popular topology for site-to-site -site VPN solutions is the HOPE hub and spoke topology. Cisco invented the Dynamic Multipoint Virtual Private Network, or DM VPN, as a technology that helps automate the hub and spoke site-to-site -site VPN deployment. The peers can be dynamically discovered and on-demand tunnels can be created to assist with large hub and spoke VPN designs. The DM VPN approach illustrated here should be used when spoke-to-spoke -spoke traffic represents more than 20% of the total VPN traffic, or when a full mesh VPN topology design is considered. Using DM VPN tunnels, 
Traffic is directly exchanged between peers, so it does not have to pass through the hub router, thus saving valuable bandwidth and response time. DMVPN is usually used in conjunction with other protocols such as IPsec, GRE, and NHRP, or Next Hop Resolution Protocol. The advantages of DMVPN from a design standpoint include, when using a full mesh topology, the tunnels are built on demand. So at any given point, fewer active tunnels are established. Additional remote sites in a hub and spoke environment can be added without the need for additional static configuration. And spokes can be statically or dynamically addressed even behind NAT devices. The most important design recommendations regarding DMVPN are use IPsec in tunnel mode, use TripleDes or AES for encryption. When implementing PKI, the certificate authority should be placed in a private subnet of the hub location. EIGRP with route summarization for query scoping is the recommended routing technique. Use devices that are capable of hardware acceleration for IPsec and use an NHRP ID and password to add an extra layer of security. Finally, use multiple NHRP servers on multiple hubs to further scale the design. Virtual tunnel interfaces or VTIs are another Cisco technology that can be used when designing IPsec VPN. VTIs are IPsec routable interfaces between Cisco routers and they offer support for quality of service, multicast, and other routing functions that previously needed GRE. IPv6 has adopted the VTI technology for building IPsec site-to-site -site VPNs. VTIs can be statically and dynamically configured. Another Cisco proprietary technology used in site-to-site -site VPN implementation is Group Encrypted Transport, Get VPN. When using Get VPN approach, routers become part of a trusted grouping of VPN devices, and secure packets flow between these routers, and their original IP header is preserved. This behavior eliminates many quality of service and multicast issues. Get VPN simplifies the security policy and key distribution in the group of routers mentioned previously using the group key distribution model. GetVPN is a very sophisticated technology and it uses the concept of group domain of interpretation, GDOI. GDOI features a key server and multiple cooperative key servers. The key server can be a Cisco router and its role is to authenticate group members and distribute security policies and required keys. The COOP key servers can be used across a wide geographical distance. The key technologies that make up the GetVPN include the following, the GDOI key servers, COOP key servers, group members, IP tunnel header preservation, group security association, rekey mechanism, time-based anti-replay. Some of the most important GetVPN design advantages are it provides large-scale any-to-any IPsec security. It uses the underlying IPVPN routing infrastructure. It integrates with existing multicast infrastructure. And quality of service policies are consistent because of the preservation of the original IP header. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about IP security for VPNs. First, we covered IPsec VPN functionality. And then after that, you learned about site-to-site -site IPsec VPN design. All this information you'll need to know for your architecture exam, and I'm confident if you know this video well, you'll do well on that portion of your exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video, you're going to learn about service level agreements. Now, if you're going to learn about service level agreements, you need to first understand what is a service level contract. So we'll cover that first. 
Then we will dig into detail on service level agreements. And then we're gonna show you specifically how Cisco supports these service level agreements in the enterprise, technically. All of this will prepare you very well for your CCDP architecture exam. So let's go ahead and begin. An SLA is a common agreement of features that can include the following, services, priorities, responsibilities of the ISP and the organization, guarantees or warranties. SLAs may contain technical definitions such as data rates, mean time to failure, mean time between failures, or mean time to repair, which are predicted times to certain events in the system. All of these parameters depend on system failure and recovery definitions as agreed to with the customer. SLAs can often be made up of smaller components known as operating level agreements. An OLA is often used internally in the organization as it describes what will be provided to the organization. The SLA should contain measurable targets, committed information rates, and distinct levels of services defined in terms of minimum and maximum targets. The contract should also specify actions that should be taken in situations of non-compliance. The different types of an SLA include customer-based SLA. This defines the services offered to a particular customer. Service-based SLA defines a particular service that can be offered to a customer or to multiple customers. Multi-level SLA, which includes multiple levels, each one of which has a different set of customers for the same services. And then you have corporate level, customer level, and service level SLAs. So many companies, vendors, and service providers must provide service level contract or SLCs to their partners or customers. And an SLA, which is a service level agreement, is a component of the overall service level contract. The SLC designates connectivity and the performance level that the service provider guarantees to its customers and the organization guarantees to its end users. The SLA defines specific parameters and performance measurements between devices, such as routers, servers, workstations or other equipment on the network. So here's an example of a service level agreement. As you can see, things are spelled out in detail regarding service to the customer, but also software updates, customer support. And then even a part of the contract states what the customer responsibility is. So that they're in the event of an outage or just on day-to-day -day disputes, you can refer back to the contract. So the customer and the provider are both very clear about what is expected. This protects both the customer and the provider so that roles and responsibilities are very clear. But when there is confusion or when there is a major outage, there is a legal backing for operation procedures and decisions. Now, that being said, some of this needs to be measured, and Cisco allows you to do that using Cisco IP SLA. Let's do a refresh on how Cisco IP SLA works. IP SLA allows you to monitor, analyze, and verify IP service levels. It's comprised of two components, a source and a target. Operations can broadly be categorized into five functional areas. Let's take a look at an example. You can use IP SLAs to monitor the performance between any area in the network, core distribution and edge, without deploying a physical probe. It uses generated traffic to measure network performance between two networking devices. So as we draw this out, this shows how IP SLAs begins when the source device sends a generated packet to the destination device. After the destination device receives the packet, depending on the type of IP SLA's operation, it responds with the timestamp information 
for the source to make the calculation on performance metrics. It then can communicate with a performance management application via SNMP to provide real-time analysis of the network. It should be noticed that IPSLA can communicate with any IP device on the network that's enabled for these types of measurements. Although this video has covered what you need to know for Cisco SLA, be aware that there are other white papers out there should you want to read more. And here they are, Service Level Management Best Practices, Deploying Service Level Management in an Enterprise, and Service Level Management Defining and Monitoring Service Levels in the Enterprise. Now, again, that being said, within this video and throughout this video series, you will have the information you need to do well on your CCDA exam. But again, we want to apply this to our work environments. So if you want to do additional reading, please refer to this. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about service level contracts, service level agreements, and how specifically you can support SLAs in the enterprise through technical solutions that Cisco provides. All this will prepare you for your CCDP architecture exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about MPLS VPN technology. So here's what you'll learn. You're going to learn about the general considerations for MPLS VPN, MPLS VPN operation and design, layer 2 versus layer 3 MPLS VPN, and then finally advanced characteristics of MPLS VPN. So let's begin. MPLS is an emerging and high-performance technology that allows the transport of packets by switching them based on special packet labels that are inserted between Layer 2 and Layer 3 information. This mechanism allows for a much faster forwarding process than the traditional Layer 3 forwarding process. The MPLS approach leverages the intelligence of the IP routing infrastructure and the efficiency of Cisco Express forwarding. MPLS functions by appending a label to any type of packet forwarded through the network infrastructure that will be performed based on this label value instead of any Layer 3 information, which is very efficient and it allows MPLS to work with a wide range of underlying technologies. By simply adding a label in the packet header, MPLS can be used in many physical and data link layer WAN implementations. After entering the MPLS network, Packet switching occurs much faster than in traditional Layer 3 networks because the MPLS label is simply swapped instead of having to strip the entire Layer 3 header. MPLS-capable routers, also called LSRs or label switch routers, come in two flavors, Edge LSR, which are the PE routers, and LSR, which are the P routers. PE routers are provider edge devices that perform label distribution packet forwarding based on labels and label insertion and removal. P routers are provider routers and their responsibility consists of label switching and efficient packet forwarding based on labels. With MPLS, there is a separation of the control plane from the data plane, resulting in greater efficiency in how the LSRs work. Resources that are constructed for efficiency of control plane operations such as the routing protocol, the routing table, and the exchange of labels are completely separate from resources that are destined only to forward traffic in the data plane as quickly as possible. Analyzing this diagram, the MPLS label is four bytes in length and it consists of the following. 
a 20-bit label value field, 3-bit experimental field, this is where the QoS marking would occur, 1-bit bottom of the stack field, useful when multiple labels are used, it is set to 1 for the last label in the stack, and then finally the 8-bit TTL field to avoid looping. Usually MPLS VPN implementations require the use of a stack of MPLS labels because one label identifies the MPLS edge device and another label identifies the customer virtual routing and forwarding. Here's an example of an MPLS VPN configuration. In the center, the ISP cloud offers MPLS VPN services. The PE routers connect to different customers and some customers occupy two sites, each connected to a different PE router. With the MPLS approach, the customers with two sites receive transparent secure communication capabilities based on the unique customer labels assigned. The ISP uses MPLS to carry the traffic between the PE routers through the PE devices. When implementing MPLS VPNs, a stack of labels is used because one label identifies the customer and another label initiates the forwarding through the ISP cloud. Layer 3 MPLS VPN technology is a very powerful and flexible option for ISPs when providing customers with the transparent WAN access connectivity that they need. This is very scalable for ISPs because it's very easy for them to add customers and sites. MPLS comes in two different flavors, frame mode MPLS and cell mode MPLS. Frame mode MPLS is the most popular MPLS type, and it is in this scenario that the label is placed between the layer 2 and the layer 3 header. Cell mode MPLS is used in ATM networks, and it uses fields in the ATM header as the label. An important issue that must be solved with MPLS is determining the devices that will insert and remove labels. The creation of labels is carried out in the Ingress Edge LSR, and label removing is carried out on the Egress Edge LSR. The label switch routers in the interior of the MPLS topology are only responsible for label swapping, that is, replacing the label with another one, to forward the traffic on a specific path. The MPLS devices need a way in which to exchange the labels that will not be utilized for making forwarding decisions. This label exchange process is carried out using various protocols. The most popular of these protocols is called LDP or Local Distribution Protocol. This is a session-based UDP technology that allows the exchange of labels. UDP and multicast are used internally to set up peering, and then TCP ensures that there is a reliable transmission of the label information. A special feature that improves MPLS efficiency is PHP, penultimate hop popping, where the second to last LSR in the MPLS path is the one that pops out of the label. This adds efficiency to the overall operation of MPLS as the edge router does not have to deal with two MPLS labels. The concept of route distinguisher, or RD, describes the way in which an ISP can distinguish between the traffic of different customers. This allows different customers who are participating in the MPLS VPN to use the exact same IP address space. This means both customer A and B are using 10.10.10.0 and the traffic is differentiated between customers using RDs. Devices can create their own VRF tables, so a PE router can store each customer's specific data in a different isolated table, which provides increased security. VPN4 prefixes are carried through the MPLS cloud using multi-protocol BGP. Customers can be filtered from accessing certain prefixes using import and export targets. The characteristics of MPLS VPNs depend on whether they are implemented at layer two or layer three. Network designers should understand the fundamental differences between these two technologies. Layer three VPNs forward only IP packets, 
So the CE routers are peers of the MPLS VPN PE routers. These types of VPNs are based on layer three information exchange and the ISP is involved due to the routing process. This means that the SLA should include information about the way the ISP is involved in the customer routing process. Layer three VPNs offer support for any access or backbone technology, so they are extremely flexible. In addition, ISPs can offer a wide array of advanced WAN services. The advantage of an MPLS VPN at layer two is that it supports multiple protocols, not just IP. The PE devices forward frames to the CE devices via layer two, so there is no peering with the ISP. The layer two service allows the customer's routers to peer directly to one another without having to do this with an ISP router. The customers have control of the layer three policy and the ISP offers layer two VPNs as a point to point service where the access technology is determined by the type of VPN being used. MPLS VPNs at layer two might be a good solution for a service inter networking or carrying out conversations of frame relay or ATM into Ethernet to get delivery on high bandwidth links. The most important MPLS issues and considerations are the following. Determine whether the routing is achieved by the ISP or the customer. This depends on the level of control required. As mentioned earlier, a layer three VPN solution can be more expensive than a layer two solutions and details about the responsibility of the ISP and the way the CE devices are managed should be clearly stated in the SLA. Determining whether to use a single MPLS VPN provider or multiple providers to achieve redundancy. It is not very likely that two ISPs on dedicated backbones will experience a common outage, but having two ISPs will add more complexity to the overall solutions. If there are two ISPs with two CE devices at every site, the design must first be able to support proper gateway configuration using FHRP first hop redundancy protocol. Determining the need for quality of service and multicasting using a layer three VPN may provide support for IP multicast, whereas operating layer two MPLS VPN may require a great amount of support from the ISP to achieve the functionality and this can be very expensive. Quality of service should be available from the ISP, so it's important to decide whether to include quality of service parameters in the SLA. As you can see in this scenario, this involves an MPLS VPN agreement with an ISP and an internal backdoor route. For example, an IPsec VPN connection through the internet using a GRE over IPsec configuration, which represents a second path between locations already depicted in this figure. The backdoor connection is typically used as a failover backup route. As you see in this diagram, using multiple providers to achieve failover and high availability requires carefully implementing FHRP, a first hop routing protocol, such as HSRP, VRRP, or GLBP. This should be negotiated with the internet service providers before the implementation phase as part of the contract of the SLA. So here's what you've learned. We've covered the general considerations for MPLS VPN, MPLS VPN operation and design, Layer 2 versus Layer 3 MPLS VPN and Advanced MPLS VPN. I'm confident you'll be asked about this on your architecture exam. And if you know this video well, you should do very well on the MPLS VPN portion of your exam. I wish you the best of luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video, we are covering WAN design considerations. We're going to talk about, at a granular level, things you need to consider when designing a wide area network. Also, we'll do a refresh of a few items that you'll need to remember 
in order to best understand the material that's presented in this video. There is no doubt that you will need to know what is on this video to pass your architecture exam, so please pay close attention. So let's begin. You must be aware that the Enterprise Edge design process must follow the PPD IOO process, which is prepare, plan, design, implement, operate, and optimize. The designer should carefully analyze the following network requirements using this methodology the types of applications and their WAN requirements, traffic volume, and traffic patterns, including possible points of congestion. Let's do a quick refresh of the PPDIOO methodology. Cisco has formalized a network's life cycle into six phases, prepare, plan, design, implement, operate, and optimize. And these phases are collectively known as PPDIOO. Let's discuss the PPDIOO phases in detail. First, the prepare phase. This phase establishes organization and business requirements, develops a network strategy, and proposes a high level conceptual architecture to support that strategy. Technologies that support the architecture are identified in this phase as well as a business case to establish the financial justification for the strategy. The plan phase identifies the network requirements based on goals, facilities, and user needs. This phase characterizes sites and assesses the network, performs a gap analysis against best practice architectures, and looks at the operational environment. In the design phase, the network design is developed based on the technical and business requirements obtained from the previous phases. A good design will provide high availability, reliability, security, scalability, and performance. In the implement phase, new equipment is installed and configured according to the design specifications. In this phase, any planned network changes should be communicated in change control meetings and with the necessary approvals to proceed. The operate phase maintains the network's day-to-day -day operational health. Operations include managing and monitoring network components and performing the appropriate maintenances. And then finally, the optimize phase, which involves proactive network management by identifying and resolving issues before they affect the network. Now there is a design methodology for the first three phases of the PPDIOO methodology, and there are three steps to it. In step one, decision makers identify the requirements and a conceptual architecture is proposed. In step two, the network is assessed. The network is assessed on function, performance, and quality. And then in step three, the network topology is designed to meet the requirements and close the network gaps identified in the previous two steps. Let's review these three phases in detail. To obtain customer requirements, you need not only to talk to network engineers, but you need to talk to the business personnel and company managers. Networks are designed to support applications, and you want to determine the network services that you need to support, both now and in the future. So an example of design flexibility is VoIP. Considering the strict requirements of this technology, you want to make sure that VoIP can function over the design solution at any given time, even if this is not an initial requirement from the customer but maybe a year or two or possibly even three years later, you will want to be able to support voice over IP. Flexibility in enterprise edge design consists of the ability to incorporate other technologies easily at any given time. Other key design criteria when considering WAN design include the following. Response time, throughput, reliability, window size, and data compression. Response times are of great importance to the wide area network, as well as to its supported applications. 
Many modern applications will give an indication of the necessary response times. And again, VoIP is an excellent example. When a VoIP call is made over many network devices, you should know what the necessary response time must be for proper voice communications. Generally speaking, one-way latency should not exceed 120 milliseconds. You can test a response time using a feature on Cisco devices called IPSLA. Let's do a quick overview of IPSLA for you. IPSLA allows you to monitor, analyze, and verify IP service levels. It's comprised of two components, a source and a target. Operations can broadly be categorized into five functional areas. Let's take a look at an example. You can use IP SLAs to monitor the performance between any area in the network, core distribution and edge, without deploying a physical probe. It uses generated traffic to measure network performance between two networking devices. So as we draw this out, this shows how IP SLAs begins when the source device sends a generated packet to the destination device. After the destination device receives the packet, depending on the type of IP SLA's operation, it responds with the timestamp information for the source to make the calculation on performance metrics. It then can communicate with a performance management application via SNMP to provide real-time analysis of the network. It should be noticed that IP SLA can communicate with any IP device on the network that's enabled for these types of measurements. Another important design parameter is overall available bandwidth, or what many call throughput. This measures the amount of data that can be sent in a particular time frame through a speci specific WAN area. Reliability is another aspect to consider. This gives information about the health of the WAN connection and its resources, so whether this connection is actually up or down, as well as detailed information about how often the WAN functions as, efficient, as efficiently as possible. Window size influences the amount of data that can be sent into the WAN in one chunk. TCP uses a sliding window concept that works by sending an amount of data, waiting for an acknowledgement of receipt, and then increasing the amount of data until it reaches the maximum window. In the case of a congested WAN link, everyone in the network that is sending data via TCP will start increasing the rate at which they send until the interface starts dropping packets, causing everyone to back off and use the sliding window. After the congestion disappears, everyone will start increasing the rate at which they send at the same time until a new congestion event occurs. This process, which repeats again and again, is called TCP global synchronization. This leads to a waste in bandwidth during the periods that all hosts decrease their window size simultaneously. And finally, another key WAN factor is whether traffic can be compressed. If the data is already highly compressed, any additional compression mechanisms are inefficient. But that being said, especially today with SANS or other high capacity systems, compression and compression over the WAN is critical to ensure that failover and backup services are ready to go live with the most accurate data possible. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about some unique WAN design methodologies, specifically a refresh of the PPD IOO process, and then reviewing the key design criteria of WAN design, such as response time, throughput, and reliability. Then another refresh of IP SLA. If you know the information in this video well, you will do excellent on this portion of your exam. Good luck in your studies.
Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video we're going to cover general considerations for the Enterprise Data Center. So here's what you'll learn in this video. We're going to walk you through the Enterprise Data Center components, talking about ser server considerations, facility and spacing considerations, and then power, cooling, and cabling considerations. So let's begin. The data center concept has greatly evolved over the last few years, passing through many phases because of evolving technology. At the time of their first appearance, data centers were centralized and used mainframes to maintain their data. Mainframes, in turn, were managed using terminals, which are still used in modern data centers because of their resiliency. But they were quickly becoming legacy components. The next generation of data centers used a distributed processing model and introduced the client-server architecture. Business applications were installed on servers and they were accessed by clients from their PCs. This resulted in a cost-benefit compared to accessing the mainframe model. The third generation of data centers uses modern technologies, such as virtualization. That, is, that have further reduced costs, even though the communication equipment's performance has increased. This approach has proven to be more efficient than the distributed processing model. In particular, virtualization has resulted in higher utilization of computing and network resources by sharing and allocating them on a temporary basis. From an architecture standpoint, modern enterprise data centers include virtualization technologies and processing, storage, and networking services. All of these features combined enabled flexibility, invisibility, and policy enforcement. Major components of the Cisco Enterprise Data Center architecture framework include the following. Virtualization, such as the Cisco Nexus 1000V virtual switch for VMware ESX, which delivers per virtual machine visibility and policy control for SAN, LAN, and unified fabric. Cisco Unified Computing System, which unifies the data center resources into a single system that offers end-to-end -end optimization for virtualized environments. Virtualization of SAN device contents which helps converge multiple virtual networks. All of these features lead to simplification in the enterprise data center and a reduction of total cost of ownership. Next is unified, unified fabric. Unified fabric technologies include fiber channel over ethernet and internet small computer system interface as they usually offer 10 gigabits per second transfer rates. Unified Fabric is supported on Cisco Catalyst and Nexus series. Cisco MDS storage series are designed and optimized to support iSCSI. Next is Unified Computing. Cisco introduced the Unified Computing System as an innovative next generation enterprise data center platform that converges virtualization, processing, network, and storage into a single system. Unified computing allows the virtualization of network interfaces on servers. It also increases productivity with temporal provisioning using service profiles. The following figure illustrates the enterprise data center topology. From top to bottom, the top layer includes virtual machines that are hardware abstracted into software entities running a guest operating system on top of a hypervisor. Unified computing resources comprise the next layer, which contain the service profiles that map to the identity of the server and provides the following details. Memory, CPU, network interfaces, storage information, and boot image. The next layer consolidates connectivity and is referred to as unified fabric. This layer contains technologies such as 10 gigabit ethernet, fiber ch channel over ethernet, and fiber channel and all of these are supported on the Cisco Nexus series. Fiber channel over Ethernet allows native fiber channel to be used on 10 gigabits per second Ethernet networks. Next is the virtualization layer, which includes technologies such as VLANs, VSANs, 
which provide connectivity for virtualized lands and SANs by segmenting multiple lands and SANs on the same physical equipment. The logical lands and SANs do not communicate with each other. The bottom layer contains virtualized hardware that is made up of storage pools and virtualized network devices. Some very important aspects to consider when deploying servers in an enterprise data center include required power, rack space needed, server security, virtualization support, and server management. The increasing number of servers used means that more power is required, and this leads to the need for energy efficiency in the data center. Rack servers usually consume a great amount of energy, even though they are low cost and provide high performance. An alternative to standalone servers are blade servers. These provide similar computing power, but require less space, power, and cabling. Blade servers are installed in a chassis that allows them to share network connections and power. This also reduces the number of cables needed. Server virtualization is supported on both standalone and blade servers and provides scalability and better utilization of hardware resources, which increases efficiency. Server management is a key factor in server deployment, and this can be accomplished using different products that offer secure remote management capabilities. The facility, spacing, and other considerations for the enterprise data center will determine where to position the equipment to provide scalability. For example, the space available will determine the number of racks for servers and the network equipment that can be installed. An important factor that must be considered is floor loading parameters. Estimating the correct size of the data center will have a great influence on costs, longevity, and flexibility. An oversized data center will result in unnecessary costs, while an undersized data center will not satisfy computing, storage, and networking requirements, but will impact productivity. Factors that must be considered include, and here you will see many of the factors that must be considered. Please pause the video at this point if you'd like to study this list further. Physical security is another important consideration because data centers contain equipment that hosts sensitive company data that must be secured from outsiders. Factors that may affect the physical security of the equipment include fires and natural disasters. Access to the data center must be well controlled. Enterprise data center design considerations must be addressed early in the building development process and this must be carried out with a team of experts from various fields, such as networking, power, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. The team members must work together to ensure that the system's components interoperate effectively, providing high availability and the ability to recover network services, data, and applications. In addition, the data center must be properly designed for future use based on its limited capacity. The power source in the enterprise data center will be used to power servers, storage, network equipment, cooling devices, sensors, and other additional systems. The most power consuming systems are servers, storage, and cooling. The process of determining the power requirements for the data center equipment is difficult because of the many variables that must be taken into consideration. Power usage is greatly impacted by the server load. Various levels of power redundancy can affect the capital and operational expenses based on the options chosen. Determining the right amount of power redundancy to meet the requirements takes careful planning. Estimating that necessary power capacity involves collecting the requirements for all the current and future equipment, such as servers, storage, network devices, UPS, generators, HVAC, and lighting. The power system should be designed to include additional components, such as PDUs or electric conduits and circuit breaker panels. Implementing a redundant system should provide protection for utility power failures, surges, and other electrical problems. When designing the enterprise data center power system, 
The most important tasks include provide the physical electrical infrastructure, design for redundancy, and define the overall power capacity. Based on the type of equipment used, careful heating and cooling calculations must be provided. Blade server deployments allow for more efficient use of space, but they increase the amount of heat per server. The increased use of high density servers must be addressed by careful data center design. Considerations for cooling must be taken into account for proper sizing of the servers. Cooling solutions for the increase in heat production include the following. Increase the space between the racks, increase the number of HVAC units, and increase the airflow between the devices. Enterprise data center equipment produces variable amounts of heat depending on the load. Heat has a negative effect on the reliability of the devices, including data center, subsystems, racks, and individual devices. So cooling must be used to control temperature and humidity. To design a proper cooling system, environmental conditions must first be measured. Computing power and memory requirements demand more power, and this leads to more heat being dissipated. The increase in device density also leads to an increase in the amount of heat generated, and this can be reduced by designing proper airflow. Sufficient cooling equipment must be available to produce acceptable temperatures within the data center. An efficient technique is arranging the data center racks with an alternating pattern of hot and cold aisles. The cold aisles should have equipment arranged face to face, and the hot aisles should have them arranged back to back. The cold aisles should have perforated floor tiles that draw cold air from the floor to the face of the equipment. Hot aisles should be isolated and prevent hot air from mixing with the cold air. Other cooling techniques that can be used for equipment that does not exhaust heat to the rear include using cabinets with mesh fronts and backs, increasing the height of the raised floor, spreading out equipment into unused racks, and blocking unnecessary air escapes to increase airflow. A passive infrastructure for the enterprise data center is essential for optimal system performance. The physical network cabling between devices determines how these devices communicate with one another and with external systems. The cabling infrastructure type chosen will impact the physical connectors and media type of the connector. This must be compatible with the equipment interfaces. Two options are widely used today, copper, and fiber optic cabling. The main advantages of using fiber optic cables are that they are less susceptible to external interference and they can operate over greater distances than copper cable. The main disadvantages of using fiber optic cables are specific adapters might be necessary when connecting to device interfaces and they are more difficult to install and repair. The cabling must be well organized for ease of maintenance in the passive infrastructure. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about the enterprise data center components, and specifically we talked about server, facility, power, cooling, and cabling considerations. I'm confident if you get asked questions about planning for a data center on your architecture exam, you'll do very well on that portion of your studies. Good luck on your exam. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video, you're going to learn about enterprise data center architecture. Cisco has a well-proven and well-tested layered enterprise data center design approach that has been improved over the last few years. The Cisco enterprise data center infrastructure is used to implement even extremely large data center environments. The most important features a data center must include are flexibility, maintainability, resilience, performance, and scalability. We'll talk about all these throughout this video. 
the enterprise data center architecture as defined by Cisco is a three-tier model that delivers scalability, performance, flexibility, resilience, and maintainability. The three tiers are the core, aggregation, and access layer, as you see in this diagram. The enterprise core layer offers high-speed packet switching with 10 gigabit Ethernet connections or Ether channels with backup links. The core layer is the switching backplane for all of the data flows going in and out of the data center. The core layer is usually a centralized layer 3 routing layer in which one or more aggregation layers connect. The core layer can inject a default route into the aggregation layer after the data center networks are summarized. If multicast applications are used, the core layer must also support IP multicast features. The aggregation layer usually contains multi-layer switches and aggregates a variety of network services. Smaller enterprise data centers may use a collapsed core layer design that combines the aggregation layer and the core layer into a single entity. Some of the most important core layer features include low latency, low latency switching, 10 gigabit Ethernet connections, and scalable IP multicast support. The enterprise data center access layer usually offers layer 2 and layer 3 access layer services, including layer 2 access with the cluster services, blade chassis with the integrated switches and pass-through modules access, mainframe services, and other layer 3 access layer services. Typically, the enterprise data center will have a three-tier design with an Ethernet access layer and an aggregation layer with network services connected to the enterprise core layer. A small to medium-sized data center will most likely have a two-tier design that serves the server farms where the layer three access layer services are connected to a collapsed core layer and combines the standard core layer and the aggregation layer. In a typical enterprise network, the enterprise data center architecture connects to the enterprise campus architecture, as you see in this diagram. The connection point is at the enterprise data center core layer, which usually connects the enterprise campus core layer with high availability. The enterprise data center architecture layers should not be confused with the enterprise campus architecture layers, even though they might consist of a dedicated access, aggregation or distribution layer, and then core layer. When implementing a three-tier design, as you see here, the network designer must decide whether a single pair of multi-layer switches at the core layer is enough. This configuration might not support a large number of 10 gigabit Ethernet ports to connect to the enterprise data center aggregation layer to the enterprise campus distribution layer switches. Separating the enterprise data center core layer and enterprise campus core layer will isolate the enterprise campus distribution layer from the enterprise data center aggregation layer because different types of policies and services might be avoided at the enterprise campus distribution layer than at the enterprise data center aggregation layer. This is important in terms of administration and policies because there may be one team dealing with the enterprise campus distribution layer and another team dealing with the enterprise data center aggregation layer. Once the decision has been made to expand to a three-tier enterprise data center architecture, the next big decision is determining the layer two and layer three boundaries. Cisco recommends implementing the enterprise data center core layer infrastructure at layer three and positioning the layer two to layer three boundary within or below the aggregation layer. Layer three links offer the ability to achieve bandwidth scalability and quick convergence at the enterprise data center core layer. Layer three links also avoid issues such as path blocking due to the spanning tree algorithm or uncontrollable broadcasting that is typically seen in a layer two domain. This concept is illustrated in the following diagram. Layer two spanning across the enterprise data center core layer should be avoided because all of the traffic in the data center passes through this layer and an STP loop would bring down the entire data center. OSPF and EIGRP are two of the routing protocols recommended for data center environments because of their ability to scale a large number of routers and achieve fast convergence times. 
OSPF should be carefully tuned in an enterprise data center environment, and some of the design recommendations include the following. Implement Area 0 at the Enterprise Data Center Core Layer. Configure NSSAs below the Enterprise Data Center Core Layer. And this is up to the server subnets to control the LSA propagation, but still allow read route redistribution. Advertise the default route into the aggregation layer and then summarize the routes coming out of the NSSA into Area 0. Consider using loopback addresses for the router IDs to simplify troubleshooting and use OSPF MD5 authentication to add security and to avoid any rogue adjacencies. The OSPF default interface cost is calculated based on a 100 megabits per second link, so the auto cost reference bandwidth 10,000 command should be used to set the reference to a 10 gigabit ethernet value and let OSPF differentiate the cost on higher speed links. If this parameter is not modified, all interfaces that have bandwidth higher than 100 megabits per second will be assigned the same OSPF cost. EIGRP is often simpler to configure than OSPF, but it should be carefully implemented to avoid any odd behavior in the enterprise data center. Depending on the situation, other default routes may need to be filtered if they exist on the network such as the ones coming from the Internet Edge into the Enterprise Data Center core layer. Route filtering can be achieved using distribution lists. The IP summary address EIGRP command can also be used to summarize routes as they, enterprise, as they enter the Enterprise Data Center core layer and pass into the aggregation layer. As with OSPF, the passive interface default and no passive interface commands should be used to suppress EIGRP advertisements on all links, and this process should be selectively enabled only on links that must participate in the routing process. The role of the Enterprise Data Center aggregation layer is to aggregate Layer 2 or Layer 3 links from the access layer to connect upstream links to the Enterprise Data Center core layer. Layer 3 connectivity is usually implemented between the aggregation and core layers. Cisco recommends using multiple aggregation layer submodules to assure a high degree of functionality and scalability. The aggregation layer is responsible for various services that operate in the three layer enterprise data center architecture, including what you see here. These services are commonly deployed in pairs using Cisco Catalyst 6500 chassis clusters, and their role is to maintain the session state for redundancy purposes. By implementing this kind of architecture, the management overhead is reduced by simplifying the number of devices that must be managed. The Layer 2 design approach includes three categories, Layer 2 Loop Design, Layer 2 Loop Free Design, Layer 2 Flex Link Design. The Layer 2 Loop Design is the most commonly used Layer 2 design and it comes in two forms, Triangle Loop Design and Square Loop Design. Here you see the triangle loop design, and here is where you see the square loop design. One of the main differences between these two designs is the trunk link between the access layer switches, which will involve leveraging 10 gigabit ethernet port density in the aggregation layer multi-layer switches. The advantage of this option is that the square design will accommodate more access layer switches. So this topology design might have to be considered in an environment with many access layer switches. In the triangle loop design scenario, the primary aggregation layer device will still need to be used to offer active services. Layer two loop free topologies come in two forms loop-free U topology, and loop-free inverted U topology. In a loop-free U topology, the VLANs are contained in layer two switch pairs distributed across the access layer as depicted here. There is no extension outside the switch pairs and all of the uplinks to the aggregation layer devices are active. So none of the ports will be blocked by spanning tree protocol. Nevertheless, spanning tree will still be used to deal with uplink failures or configuration issues. In this type of scenario, the recommendation is to implement a fail-close technique 
at the aggregation layer services. That will achieve traffic black holing. This is useful in situations where one of the services fails, as this will prevent traffic from continuing to pass through those services. The difference between the loop-free U and the loop-free inverted U design is that the first topology has a U-form design pointing up from the access layer switches to the aggreg aggregation layer devices, while the inverted topology has a U-form pointing down from the aggregation layer devices to the access layer switches. The loop-free inverted U design is illustrated here. The Layer 2 FlexLink topology is the third major design type, and it is an alternate to looped access layer technology. FlexLink technology offers an active standby pair of uplinks on a common access layer switch. So this design involves flexible uplinks going up from the access layer switches and connecting to the aggregation layer devices, as you see here. In this table, which has been provided by Cisco, you can see a summarization of the main advantages of the various access layer designs presented in this video. You will want to memorize this for your architecture exam. Now regarding layer three access design, this design type involves using layer three multi-layer switches at the access layer as the layer two to layer three boundary moves down at this level in the enterprise data center architecture, as shown in this diagram. In a layer three design, the access layer switches link to the aggregation layer switches with a layer three uplink and dedicated subnetwork. In this type of environment, layer three routing takes place at the access layer switches first. Layer three implementation at the data center access layer is becoming more and more popular, especially in large, large organizations. Some of the most important benefits of implementing layer three at the access layer include increased control of broadcast domains and the ability to limit their size, minimized failure domains offering a higher level of stability, all of the uplinks from the servers are active, Ceph will be used to achieve load balancing, convergence times are faster than those offered by STP, and this design can be used when multicast IGMP snooping is unavailable at the access layer. Next, let's talk about designing blade servers. Blade server chassis can be deployed using two different models, the pass-through model and the integrated Ethernet switches model. The pass-through model, as you see here, shows an external layer two and layer three switches for the access layer. And these switches are not integrated in the actual blade server farm. The blade servers connect to access layer switches, and these switches connect to the enterprise data center aggregation layer. In the integrated Ethernet switching model depicted here, the layer two access layer switches are integrated into the blade server chassis, and the chassis connects directly to the enterprise data center aggregation layer. Usually blade servers are used to replace older server farms that used towers and other types of rack mount servers where density is a big issue. Another situation is when blade servers are needed, is when a new high-end application comes in that requires clustering. With blade servers, the data center managers can actually lower their TCO and have a great amount of rack space. Blade servers represent a huge area of the server market and various vendors such as Cisco, Dell, HP, and IBM offer this type of solution. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about data center architecture, You've learned how to properly design the data center, digging deep into each of the layers of the data center and layer two and layer three design, as well as pros and cons. Confident when you ask questions, get, I'm confident when you get asked questions about this on your exam, you'll do very well. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about data center and network integration. 
The Cisco Virtual Multi-Service Data Center, or VMDC, reference architecture provides a framework for building fabric-based infrastructure using Cisco Unified Data Center platform. Cisco VMDC provides design guidelines that demonstrate how customers can integrate Cisco and partner technologies such as networking, computing, integrated computing stacks, security, load balancing, and system management into a data center architecture that supports critical IT initiatives such as consolidation and virtualization, including de desktop virtualization, application migration and rollout, public, private, and hybrid cloud deployments, and business continuity, disaster recovery. The Cisco VMDC architecture uses the Cisco validated design process to test and document solutions that bring together networking, computing, and storage resources and services. Specifically for this video, please focus on networking fabric. The Unified Fabric in Data Center Networking module provides network and services virtualization. The infrastructure solutions enabled and validated by the Cisco VMDC architecture are designed to address all challenges and compare and contrast the choices and options available and then document the reference solution. Let's talk about network virtualization. The challenge is to understand how server virtualization and cloud characteristics change the network requirements. A few solutions are to connect and manage the virtual and physical using Cisco Nexus 1000 V-Series switches and Cisco Data Center VM fax. And also you can use virtual security and management services. Let's get a bit more granular. How does this all interconnect? The Ethernet infrastructure forms the foundation for resilient Layer 2 and Layer 3 communications in the data center. This layer provides the ability to migrate from your original server farm to a scalable architecture capable of supporting fast Ethernet, Gigabit Ethernet, and 10 Gigabit Ethernet connectivity for hundreds of servers in a modular approach. The core of the data center is built on the Cisco Nexus 5500 UP series switches. Cisco Nexus 5500 UP series is a high speed switch capable of layer two and layer three switching. The Cisco Nexus 5500 supports fabric extender technology or FEX, which provides a remote line card approach for fan out of server connectivity to top of rack for fast ethernet, gigabit ethernet, and 10 gigabit ethernet requirements. The physical interfaces on the Cisco FEX are programmed on the Cisco Nexus 5500 switches, simplifying the tasks of configuration by reducing the number of devices you have to touch to deploy a server port. The Cisco Nexus 5500 series virtual port channel or VPC technology provides a loop free approach to building out the data center in which any VLAN can appear on any port in the topology without spanning tree loops or blocking links. The data center core switches are redundant with sub second failover so that a device failure or maintenance does not prevent the network from operating. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about data center and network integration. You've learned, obviously, when we build out a data center, we need to be able to communicate to and from that data center. So we talked about the touch points and specific Cisco solutions that make Cisco uniquely positioned to provide the cutting edge solutions for the data center. Now, as you go through the videos, you'll see that Cisco takes a holistic approach, which is why this video, although it was focused on network integration, it is just one piece of the larger puzzle of the data center. And it must integrate with any expansion of the data center for future use. I'm confident you'll have some data center questions on your architecture exam, and this will give you a good foundation should you be asked about network integration. Good luck in your studies.
Hi, this is David Voss, CCIA 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about network programmability. Specifically, we're going to talk about Cisco's implementation of SCN, Cisco ACI, and we'll discuss its benefits and its attributes. All of this you should know for your CCDA exam. So let's go ahead and begin. IT departments and lines of business are looking at cloud automation tools and software-defined networking architectures to accelerate application delivery, reduce operating costs, and greatly increase business agility. Cisco Application-Centric Infrastructure, or Cisco ACI, is a comprehensive SDN architecture. This policy-based automation solution supports a business-relevant application policy language, greater scalability through a distributed enforcement system, and greater network visibility. These benefits are achieved through the integration of physical and virtual environments under one policy model for networks, servers, storage, services, and security. Through Cisco ACI, customers are reducing application deployment times from weeks to minutes. It also dramatically improves IT alignment with business objectives and policy requirements. Cisco ACI is built on the application-centric policy based on Cisco Application Policy Infrastructure Controller, or what is known as APIC. The Cisco ACI Fabric, which is based on the Cisco Nexus 9000 series switches, and the Cisco Application Virtual Switch, and the Cisco ACI Partner Ecosystem. ACI provides a network that is deployed, monitored, and managed in a way that benefits different teams in the IT organization, including SDN network, cloud and DevOps, and security. It supports rapid application change by reducing complexity with a common policy framework that can automate provisioning and resource management. You can facilitate rapid systems integration and customization for network services, monitoring, management, and orchestration. Cisco ACI is a comprehensive SDN solution, making the application the focal point. It is delivered in an agile, open, and highly secure architecture, and its application-based policy model offers speed through automation, reducing errors and accelerating application deployment in IT processes from weeks to minutes. Application-based policies decouple high-level application connectivity needs from the complicated details of network configuration. This results in automated IT processes that simplify operations. ACI provides transparent support of heterogeneous physical and virtual endpoints, such as bare metal servers and virtual servers on any hypervisor, with layer two to seven network services using consistent policy. This provides faster troubleshooting through increased visibility of the entire infrastructure. Cisco ACI supports open APIs, open source, and open standards to optimize customer choice and flexibility. In fact, Cisco contributes technology specifications to open source and standards communities. The open integration with existing data center management tools and comprehensive open partner ecosystem helps to ensure flexibility while decreasing costs and increasing innovation. Provisioning applications has become easy with programmable infrastructure, yet onboarding them is still difficult. Cloud architects have to know what infrastructure design will support frequent application changes to performance, security, availability, and scale. DevOps has to work with both application and admin teams to understand how numerous application changes affect the configuration of switches, ports, VLANs, firewalls, security appliances, load balancers, and other application delivery functions. All changes must work within a shared production and infrastructure without affecting existing attendance and applications. Cisco ACI introduces a simple application-level policy-based approach. Application intentions are automatically translated to infrastructure design without requiring knowledge of devices or the effort to translate to configurations. This helps to enable policy-aware resource orchestration, real-time governance, and open choice in cloud software. Cisco ACI and the APIC SDN controller allow for security policies down to the individual tenant, application, or workload. 
They provide protection that meets the most stringent business and compliance requirements. The whitelist model permits the communication only where explicitly allowed, helping to ensure that policy omissions do not leave security vulnerabilities. Through Cisco ACI, all security device provisioning and configuration can be automated according to the centrally managed application policies and requirements. This simplifies IT security tasks and accelerates application deployments. The Cisco Nexus 9000 series switches bring new industry-leading performance, power, port density, and open programming innovations. The products that support Cisco ACI are the Cisco Nexus 9000 series. In addition, the Cisco Application Virtual Switch, which provides a consistent virtual switch infrastructure between ACI fabrics and the Cisco Nexus 1000V Virtual Switch. The Cisco Application Policy Infrastructure Controller, which prog programmatically automates network provisioning and control based on application requirements and policies, and the Cisco application-centric infrastructure security for data centers solves many complexities in customer environments. It treats firewalls as a pool of resources and intelligently stitches them according to application network policies. ACI security offers full acceleration dynamically in hardware and directly integrates into Cisco ACI. When considering Cisco ACI, it's important to define desired business outcomes and plan each stage of the journey. Then you'll want to know how to accelerate the benefits of ACI while mitigating the risks. You need to develop an ACI adoption strategy based on business and technology needs. You need to provide a migration strategy and operational readiness need to deploy proof of concept to gain experience and reduce the deployment risk, and then design application-centric data centers based on the ACI fabric pods and policy templates. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about Cisco's deployment of software-defined networking, which is Cisco ACI. This you'll need to know for your CCDA exam, but more importantly, you will need to know this if you're going to work in the future of network engineering. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video, you're going to learn about virtualization. Specifically, here's what you're going to learn. You're going to learn about the advantages of virtualization, drivers for it, the types of virtualization, and then the different platforms, specifically network and server platforms offered by Cisco. Virtualization can represent a variety of technologies, but the general idea is to abstract the logical components from hardware or networks and implement them into a virtual environment. The official definition of computer virtualization is the pooling and abstraction of resources and services in a way that masks the physical nature and boundaries of those resources and services. A good example is a VLAN because it masks the physical nature of resources. The concept of virtualization dates all the way back to the 1970s with IBM mainframes. These mainframes were separated into virtual machines so that different tasks could run separately and to prevent a process failure that could affect the entire system. One of the issues that IT departments face today is called server sprawl. This concept implies that each application is installed on its own server, and every time another server is added, issues such as power, space, and cooling must be addressed. These are just a few of the many issues, and none of them are cost effective. However, these challenges can be mitigated with server virtualization that allows the partitioning of a physical server to work with multiple operating systems and application instances. The most important advantages are improved failover capabilities, better utilization of resources, and a smaller footprint. 
Virtualization is a concept that applies to many areas in modern IT infrastructures, and it's not limited to servers. It can include networks, storage, applications, and desktop. Network virtualization refers to one physical network supporting a wide array of logical topologies. This allows actions such as outsourcing by the IT department where a logical topology can be created that can be accessed by external IT professionals. Network virtualization with Cisco products is typically classified into four areas. Control plane virtualization. This is making sure processes like routing are separated and distinct so routing process failure will not affect the entire device. Data plane virtualization. This is done every time different streams of data traffic are multiplexed. That is, different forms of traffic are placed on the same medium. The simplest example of data plane virtualization is a trunk link between two devices. Management plane virtualization. This implies the ability to make a software upgrade on a device without rebooting that device or having it lose its capabilities to communicate on the network. And then pooling and clustering. This, for example, is used on the Cisco Catalyst 6500 virtual switching system, and it works by creating pools of devices that act as a single device. Another example is the Nexus VPC or virtual port channel, which allows ether channels to be created that span across multiple devices. Virtualization has become a critical component in most enterprise networks because of modern demands in IT, including increasing efficiency while reducing capital and operational costs. Virtualization is a critical component of the Cisco enterprise network architecture. Virtualization can represent a variety of technologies, including extracting the logical components from hardware or networks and implementing them into a virtual environment. Some of the drivers behind implementing a virtualized environment are as follows. The need to reduce the number of physical devices that perform individual tasks. The need to reduce operational costs the need to increase productivity, the need for flexible connectivity, and the need to eliminate underutilized hardware. Virtualization can be implemented at both the network and the device level. Network virtualization involves the creation of network partitions that run on physical infrastructure, with each logical partition acting as an independent network. Network virtualization can include VLANs, vSANs, VPNs, and VRFs. On the other hand, device virtualization allows logical devices to run independently of each other on a single physical machine. Virtual hardware devices are created in software and have the same functionality as real hardware devices. The possibility of combining multiple physical devices into one single logical unit also exists. The Cisco Enterprise Network Architecture contains multiple forms of network and device virtualization, such as the following. Virtual machines, virtual switches, virtual LANs, virtual private networks, virtual storage area networks, virtual switching systems, virtual routing and forwarding, virtual port channels, and virtual device contexts. Device contexts allow the partitioning of a single partition into multiple virtual devices called contexts. A context acts as an independent device with its own set of policies. The majority of features implemented on the real device are also functional on the virtual context. Some of the devices in the Cisco portfolio that support virtual contexts include the following. Cisco ASA, Cisco ASE, Cisco IPS, and Cisco Nexus series. Server virtualization allows the server's resources to be extracted in order to offer flexibility and usage optimization in the infrastructure. 
The result is that data center applications are no longer tied to specific hardware resources, so the applications are unaware of the underlying hardware. Server virtualization solutions are produced by companies such as VMware, Microsoft, and Citrix. Now, all this being said, there are unique design considerations to network virtualization. Network solutions are needed to solve the challenges of sharing network resources, but keeping users totally separate from one another. Although the users are separate, we need to ensure that the network is highly available, secure, and can scale along with business growth. Network virtualization offers solutions to these challenges and provides design considerations around access control, path isolation, and services edge. Regarding access control, access needs to be controlled to ensure that users and devices are identified and authorized for entry to their assigned network segment. Security at the access layer is critical for protecting the network from threats, both internal and external. Path isolation. This involves the creation of independent logical network paths over a shared network infrastructure. MPLS VPN is an example of path isolation technique, where devices are mapped to a VRF to access the correct set of network resources. Other segmentation options include VLANs and vSANs, which logically separate LANs and SANs. The main goal when segmenting the network is to improve the scalability, resiliency, and security services as with non-segmented networks. Services Edge. The Services Edge refers to making network services available to the intended users and devices with an enforced centralized managed policy. Separate groups or devices occasionally need to share information that may be on different VLANs, each with corresponding group policies. In such cases, the network should have a central way to manage the policy and control access to the resources. Next, let's talk about server virtualization. Server virtualization is a new area for Cisco, and it involves a more intelligent deployment of new servers and services, as opposed to the traditional approach in which a new physical server was deployed when a new application needed to be implemented. Cisco's line of products for server virtualization is called the Cisco Unified Computing System. And one of the major advancements Cisco introduced in this area is related to a consistent I.O. that provides uniform support for hypervisors across all servers in a resource pool. Cisco Unified Computing System products allow advanced management and configuration of throughput across all of the servers. This technology supports Ethernet in all of its variations, including fiber channel over Ethernet. It also allows for 10 gigabit unified network fabric with up to 40 gigabits per second of throughput per blade server. Cisco provides the wire once feature that allows for the chassis to be initially wired and then performs all the IO changes through a GUI management system. This approach avoids any recabling issues. The management component of the Cisco Unified Computing System is the CUCS Manager. The manager allows the servers to be grouped in resource pools and new applications to be deployed in those pools without associating them with any specific hardware. Moving a particular virtual machine between the server blades, for example for load balancing, SLA, or for even downtime reasons, is easily accomplished through the GUI. Memory and CPU performance are the primary hardware factors that need to be considered in a CUCS environment as these factors can become bottlenecks for the solution. Cisco has invented the extended memory technology incorporated in some platforms that allow the mapping of physically distinct DIMMs into a single logical DIMM as seen by the processor. This eliminated the memory bottleneck issues as extended memory servers with large number of DIMMs can provide hundreds of gigabits of memory that can be mapped to a single resource. 
So here's what you've learned. You've learned about the advantages of virtualization, what are the drivers for virtualization, the different types of virtualization. We talked about platforms, specifically network platforms. And then, then we talked about the server virtualization as well and Cisco's offering in that arena. All this you'll need to know for your architecture exam. I'm confident you will do well in the virtualization part of that exam after viewing this video. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about network attacks and countermeasures in preparation for your architecture exam. Specifically, you're going to learn about network infrastructure vulnerabilities, and there are many, and then application vulnerabilities. So let's go ahead and begin with discussing network attacks and countermeasures. From a design standpoint, security is one feature of risk management that must be included in the overall business policy. Every organization must determine the acceptable levels of risk and vulnerabilities, and these should be based on the value of the corporate assets. Organizations should also define the risk probability and the reasonable expectation of quantifiable loss in case of a security compromise. One aspect of risk management is risk assessment, and this is the driving force behind an organization's written security policies. Network designers play a key role in developing these security policies, but they do not implement them. This is done by another team. When a network designer is in the process of attack recognition and identifying countermeasures for those specific attacks, the designer should consider and plan for the worst situations because modern networks are large and they can be susceptible to many security threats. The applications and systems in these organizations are often very complex and this makes them difficult to analyze, especially when they use web applications and services. As shown in this figure, the network designer should be able to guarantee the company the following important system characteristics confidentiality, integrity, and availability. These three attributes are the core of an organization's security policy. Confidentiality ensures that only authorized individual users, applications, or services can access sensitive data. Integrity implies that data will not be changed by unauthorized users or services. And finally, the availability of the systems and data should result in uninterrupted access to computing resources. Next, let's talk about threats to confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Before a network designer offers security consulting services, the designer must understand the real threats to the network infrastructure. Different categories to threats to confidentiality, integrity, and availability include denial of service attacks, spoofing, telnet attacks, password cracking programs, viruses, trojans, and worms. These threats must be analyzed in the context of the enterprise campus design submodules they affect and the exact system component they target. Let's spend a little time talking about each. Denial of service attacks. The main purpose of a DOS attack is to make a machine or a network resource unavailable to its intended audience. In this particular type of attack, the attacker does not try to gain access to a resource. Rather, the attacker tries to induce a loss of access so that different users or services are down. These resources can include the entire enterprise network, the CPU of a network device or server, the memory, or the disk of a network device or server. The DOS attack will result in the resource being overloaded, and this will cause the resource to become unavailable for use. This can vary from blocking access to a particular resource or crashing 
a network device, or a server. There are many different types of denial of service attacks, such as ICMP attacks and TCP flooding. An advanced form of DOS attack is the DDoS attack, which works by manipulating a large number of systems to launch an attack on a target over the internet or over a large enterprise network. To manage a DDoS attack, hackers usually break into weakly secure hosts and compromise the systems by installing malicious code to gain full access to the victim's resources. After many systems are compromised, they can be used to launch a massive simultaneous attack on a target that can then be overwhelmed with a very large number of illegitimate requests. Spoofing attacks involve a process in which a single host or entity will falsely assume or spoof the identity of another host. A common spoof attack is called man in the middle, and it works by convincing two different hosts, the sender and the receiver, that the computer in the middle is actually the other host. This is accomplished by using DNS spoofing, where a hacker compromises a DNS server and explicitly changes the name resolution entries. Another popular type of masquerading attack is ARP spoofing, where the ARP cache is altered and thus the Layer 2 to Layer 3 address mapping entries are changed to redirect the traffic to the attacker's machine. Programs like Telnet or FTP utilize user-based authentication, but the credentials are sent in clear text, which makes the Telnet attack very popular. These credentials can be captured by attackers using network monitoring tools, and they can be used to gain unauthorized access to network devices. Password cracking software is very easy to find nowadays, and the programs can be used to compromise pa password security in different applications or services. They work by revealing a password that has been previously encrypted with weak encryption algorithms. One way to prevent password cracking from happening is to enforce the organization's security policy by using strong encryption algorithms, such as AES, choosing complex passwords, and periodically changing those passwords. Next, let's talk about viruses. These are, this is a general term for any type of program that attaches to individual files on a targeted system. Once the virus appends its original code to a victim's file, the victim is infected, the file changes, and it can infect other files through a process called replication. Finally, let's talk about Trojans and worms. Trojan programs are comprised of unauthorized code that is guaranteed in legitimate programs and performs functions that are hidden to the users. Worms are other illegitimate pieces of software that can be attached to emails and once they are executed, they can propagate themselves within the file system and perform unauthorized functions, such as redirecting user traffic to certain websites. An important vulnerable area in the network infrastructure is where network devices reside. The targeted devices can be part of any network module or layer, including access layer, distribution, or core layer equipment. Since network devices provide embedded security features, they must be secure from intruders. The first thing that must be done is to control physical access. Critical equipment should be placed in locked rooms that can be accessed only by authorized users preferably via multiple authentication factors. Network administrators must follow security guidelines to avoid human errors. Finally, the network devices must be hardened, just as hosts and servers are. This can be done by applying the following techniques. Enabling only the necessary services, using authenticated routing protocols, use one-time password configurations, Provide management to access to the devices only through secure protocols such as SSH, and make sure the devices in the operating system are always patched and updated. Network infrastructure vulnerabilities are present at every level in the enterprise architecture model, and the attacks aimed to exploit these vulnerabilities can be categorized as follows, reconnaissance, DOS and DDoS, or traffic attacks. Reconnaissance is a military term that implies scoping the targets before initiating the actual attack. The reconnaissance attack is aimed at the perimeter defense of the network, 
including the WAN network and Enterprise Edge module. This type of attack includes activities like scanning the topology using techniques such as ICMP, SNMP, TCP, and UDP port or application scanning. The scanning procedure can use simple tools, but it also can involve complex tools that can scan the network perimeter for vulnerabilities. The purpose of reconnaissance attacks is to find the network's re uh, the purpose of reconnaissance attacks is to find the network's weaknesses, and then one can apply the most efficient type of attack. The applications and individual host machines are often the ultimate target of an attacker. Their goal is to gain access to permissions so they can read the sensitive data and write changes to the hard drive or compromise data confidentiality. Attackers try to exploit bugs in the operating system or abuse vulnerabilities in various applications. Countermeasures against application and host vulnerabilities include using secure and tested programs and applications. This can be enforced by requiring applications to be digitally signed and using quality components from different vendors. Another useful countermeasure is minimizing exposure to outside networks. As organizations get larger, increased attention must also be given to the human factor and inside threats, not only from outside, but inside the organization. Network administrators, network designers, and end users should be carefully trained to use the security policies implemented in the organization. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about network infrastructure vulnerabilities and application vulnerabilities. All of these topics certainly will be covered on your architecture exam. And I wish you the best of luck in your studies. Thank you. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about designing firewalls. Specifically, you're going to learn about virtual firewalls, and then active-active firewalls, private VLANs, and then zone-based firewalls. These are the hot topics that you'll need to know. These are the hot topics that you will need to know as you prepare for your architecture exam. So let's go ahead and begin with virtual firewalls. Firewalls can be deployed in multiple modes, including routed and transparent. And most of them can be virtualized into security contexts that provide cost-effective solutions. The virtual firewall is a security context, and it is a way to partition a physical firewall into multiple, multiple logical devices, each with its own configuration. This is similar to having multiple standalone firewalls, but without having to buy separate devices. When defining security contexts on a device, the old configuration will be saved in the appropriate file, and the new virtual firewalls will each have dedicated configuration files. Security contexts are distinct and independent firewalls in the sense of having their own attributes, such as security policies, assigned interfaces, NAT rules, ACLs and administrators. Each virtual firewall has a system configuration that can be modified through the administrator context, which is created automatically when converting from single mode to multi multiple mode. The administrator context is just like any other virtual firewall, with the exception that it is one used to access the system and configure it. Next, let's talk about active-active failover firewalls. The active-active failover mechanism used on firewall devices leverages the virtual context feature. The best results are obtained when the two devices configured with active-active failover have an identical platform and operating system. The two firewalls must be connected with a failover state link. This can be accomplished in three ways. A single physical link, where both the failover and stateful information are transmitted on this link. Dual physical links, the failover information is exchanged on one interface and the stateful information is exchanged on another. 
dual redundant physical links. These act as a single logical link that carries both the failover and stateful information between the firewalls. Although the two devices are identical, either firewall modules or ASA devices, the security context feature will be leveraged. Next, let's talk about private VLANs. PVLANs can be an option for adding extra security in the Enterprise Campus module or in the Data Center submodule, especially in the e-commerce submodule. A PVLAN is a way to take a VLAN and then divide it into more logical components, which allows groups of servers or individual servers to be isolated, quarantining them from other devices. To build a good trust model between servers and the DMZ, consider separating the servers so that if one of the servers is compromised, it will not affect the other ones. PVLANs function by creating a secondary VLAN within a primary VLAN. The secondary VLANs can be defined based on the way the associated port is defined on the switch. Such as community VLANs, they communicate with devices in the same community and with promiscuous ports on the primary VLANs. And then isolated VLANs, they communicate only with promiscuous ports on the primary VLANs. Next, let's talk about zone-based firewalls. A zone-based firewall policy is an iOS feature that can leverage the existing ISR routers by configuring firewall functionalities on them, as opposed to using dedicated ASA devices or firewall modules. Cisco's zone-based firewall functionality was introduced in Cisco iOS version 12.4.6 as an evolution from traditional firewall implementation, which was an interface-based model. The limitations imposed by the traditional firewall implementation led to the, to the development of zone-based firewalls, which work by following these steps. Create security zones, place an interface or multiple interface into each security zone, create unidirectional zone pairs to define relationships between zones, and then apply a modular, flexible, granular policy using class maps, policy maps, and a service policy to the zone pairs. After defining the zones and assigning interfaces, unidirectional zone pairs can be created to enforce policies for traffic passing through the three defined zones. After the zone pairs are defined, different policies can be applied to them, and once the modular policies have been created and the zone pair relationships have been defined, other interfaces are placed into that zone, and the policy applies to it automatically. Using zone-based firewalls no longer requires having just one ACL per interface, per direction, per protocol to provide security policies. Zone-based firewalls provide major advantages because they use a modular configuration structure including modularity, flexibility, and granularity. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about the key topics that they expect you to know for your architecture exam when it comes to firewall design. That is, virtual firewalls, active-active firewalls, PVLANs, and zone-based firewalls. All this you'll need to know to do well on your exam. And I'm confident now that you've watched this video, your studies will go that much better. Good luck as you continue your studies for your exam. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, you're going to learn about Cisco NAC services. Specifically, Cisco wants you to understand not only Cisco network access control, but how Cisco ICE plays in that equation. So we'll cover both of, both of those topics in this video as you prepare for your architecture exam. Cisco Network Admission Control, or NAC, is a service that tries to guarantee that various endpoints are compliant with the network security policies enforced by network devices. Cisco NAC provides access to compliant devices and then it ensures that non-compliant devices are denied access and placed in quarantine, 
or given restricted access to certain resources. NAC is an important part of the enterprise network security policies, and it focuses on two main areas of security enforcement, security of operating systems and security of applications that run inside the operating systems. The NAC products consists of two general categories, the NAC framework, which is a system that provides security for network environments, and the NAC appliance. The NAC framework is a system that provides security for network environments in which hosts are trying to gain access to the network by providing credentials, typically using EAP, Extensible Authentication Protocol, or 802.1x. The Cisco NAC solution consolidates all of the functionalities of the NAC framework into a single network appliance that will recognize users, devices, and roles in the network. After this step, it will evaluate whether systems are compliant with the security policies and will enforce these policies by blocking, isolating, and repairing the non-compliant machines. One of the first design decisions involves selecting the location in which the NAC solution will be implemented. The following aspects should be considered in this decision process. Choosing between a virtual and real IP gateway, the most common deployment option is the virtual gateway mode, where the network access server functions as a standard Layer 2 Ethernet bridge, but with the extra functionality. This option is used when the untrusted network already has a Layer 3 gateway. When using a real IP gateway mode, the network access server operates as the Layer 3 default gateway for the untrusted managed clients. In this mode, all traffic between the untrusted and trusted network goes through the network access server, which can apply IP filtering, access policies, and other traffic management mechanisms. The Cisco network access server can also perform actions such as DHCP or DHCP relay when acting as a real IP gateway. Choosing in-band or out-of-band deployment mode. This decision involves whether the traffic will flow through the network access server. Choosing a Layer 2 or Layer 3 client mode. In Layer 2 mode, the MAC address of the client devices will uniquely identify these devices. This is the most common client access mode. It supports both virtual and real IP gateway operation modes in either in-band or out-of-band. In Layer 3 Client Access Mode, the client is identified by its IP address and the device is not Layer 2 adjacent to the Cisco Access Server. Any Cisco Access Server can be configured for Layer 2 or Layer 3 Client Modes, but it can only be configured to operate in one mode at a time. Choosing a Central or Edge Physical Deployment The Edge Deployment Model is easier to implement and involves the access server being physically and logically in line with the traffic path. This model only leads to more complexity when more access closets are added. The central deployment mode is the common mo option mode and it involves the access server being logically in line but not physically in line. In other words, the VLAN IDs must be mapped across the access server when it is in virtual gateway mode. According to the aspects already detailed, the following NAC design models can be considered. Layer 2 in-band virtual gateway, Layer 2 in-band real IP gateway, Layer 2 out-of-band virtual gateway, Layer 3 in-band virtual gateway, Layer 3 in-band with multiple remote sites, and Layer 3 out-of-band. The modern Cisco NAC solution includes the Identity Service Engine, which uses Cisco network devices to extend access enforcement throughout a network and consists of the following components. Policy Administration and Decision Component, Cisco ICE. LAN Policy Enforcement Points, Cisco Catalyst Switches, ASA Devices or ISI Routers. And Policy Information Component on the Endpoints, Cisco NAC Agent, Web Agent, Cisco AnyConnect Client, or native 802.1x supplicants. ICE offers the following benefits. Improved visibility and control over all user activity and devices. Consistent security policy across the enterprise infrastructure. Increased efficiency by automatic labor intensive tasks. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about Cisco NAC and how Cisco ICE 
fits in the equation of controlling network access. Both of these topics you'll need to know for your architecture exam. And I'm confident if you're asked questions in this area, you will do very well. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, you're going to learn about designing intrusion prevention systems and intrusion detection systems. So here's what you're going to learn. You're going to receive an overview of IDS and IPSs. And then we're going to talk about some of the design challenges for both of these technologies. So let's go ahead and begin. The major difference between intrusion prevention systems and intrusion detection systems is that IPS devices operate in line with the traffic, while IDS devices receive only a copy of the traffic so they can analyze it. Cisco offers a wide range of products that offer IPS slash IDS functionality in enterprise networks, including Cisco 4200 and 4300 series IPS sensor applications, Cisco AIP SSM modules for the ASA devices, Cisco IDSM modules for Catalyst 6500 switches, and Cisco ISR routers with iOS IPS functionality. Intrusion detection, even though it's an old technology, is still used because there are still places where sensors are running in line with the traffic. Having a promiscuous mode device that captures and analyzes traffic is still a valid approach in modern networks and the underlying security policy will be the same whether or not IDSs or IPSs are deployed. The actions taken by a device in a promiscuous mode include sending alerts, alarms, log messages, or SNMP traps. On the other hand, by adding an inline sensor, the device will take more aggressive actions, such as dropping packets or blocking the source IP address. Sensor placement is a very important aspect, as IPS devices should be placed strategically throughout the organization. They can be placed outside the firewall, inside the firewall, or on the same VLAN as the critical servers. A very important IPS IDS design issue is considering the effect the design will have on network traffic. Promiscuous mode will not have any effect on the traffic because switched port analyzer span is used to send copies of traffic over a trunk port to a sensor. However, when deploying IPS solutions, it's very important for the devices to be able to process all the traffic that flows on that particular segment because all the traffic passes through the IPS device. When placing the IPS sensor on the enterprise network, there are several options to choose, as you can see in this diagram. Two layer two devices without trunking. This is a popular enterprise campus design where the sensor is placed between the two layer two devices, which is a layer two switch in a transparent mode firewall and the IPS can be between the same VLAN on two different switches or can be between VLANs within the same subnets on two different switches. Another option is two layer two devices with trunking. This is similar to the model just described with the difference of having a trunk between the two devices. This is a common scenario that provides protection for several VLANs from a single location with the sensor being placed on a trunk port between switches. The sensor can protect a pair of larger group of VLANs. Another option is two layer three devices. This design model involves placing the sensor between a layer three switch or router and a firewall that is running in routed mode. This deployment option is common in the server farm submodule, the enterprise campus module, and the e-commerce submodule. This is much easier to configure since the integration takes place without actually having to touch any of the other devices unless the IPS module is integrated in another device. 
two VLANs on the same switch. And this model involves sensor bridging VLANs together on the same switch by bringing packets into one VLAN and sending them out on another VLAN. This is a common scenario with ASA devices. Now, some of the challenges with deploying IDSs and IPSs include asymmetric traffic flows. Usually, the, the network packet flows are symmetric, meaning they are taking the same path through the network in both directions. However, many newer network designs do not have symmetrical traffic flows, as they are engineered to take advantage of all the links in the network, especially the low-cost links. Asymmetric traffic flows exist so that voice traffic can follow a different path than the data traffic, and this is a common issue with the emergence of any-to-any -any traffic on VoIP services. This problem should be carefully managed, and the network designer should be aware of traffic patterns that can influence IPS sensor development. Another challenge is high availability issues. Problems might occur if inline place sensors go down, especially when they are configured in a failed closed deployment type, meaning any hardware failure will block all the traffic. IPS devices must be carefully placed in the network and configured with high availability in mind. This can help avoid major service outages in the network. Another challenge is choosing the appropriate IPS device. There's a wide variety of IPSs out there, including Cisco ISR routers, ASA devices, Catalyst 6500 modules, or dedicated 4200 and 4300 appliances with different features and port densities. Special care must be taken when virtualizing IPS devices because this adds more complexity as virtual sensors have different features that depend on platform and licensee models. The next challenge is choosing the appropriate management and monitoring solution. Complex IPS deployments need robust management and monitoring solutions like Cisco Security Manager. The final design challenge is regularly updating IPS signatures. Something that sets IPS sensors apart from other security devices like firewalls is that the signatures must be automatically updated on a regular basis. It is critical for the network operations team to ensure that new signature de definitions are regularly downloaded and installed on the IPS device to keep up with evolving threats and vulnerabilities. So here's what you learned. You received an overview of IDS and IPS technology. And then we talked in detail about design challenges that you could face when designing for these technologies. Now, all of this information you'll need to know for, for your architecture exam. And I'm confident you're now that you've watched this video, you're going to do very well on this portion. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video we're covering advanced VPN. Specifically, you will be learning about SSL VPN, and then IPsec VPN, as well as DM VPN, and there'll be some crossover there between those two technologies. And then finally, we'll finish with Get VPN. All these concepts you'll need to understand thoroughly for your architecture exam. So let's go ahead and begin. Secure Sockets Layer, or SSL VPN, is also referred to as Web VPN, even though Cisco does not use this term anymore. Understanding SSL VPN deployments is of great importance for the network security designer, as this technology can be configured either on Cisco ISR routers or on Cisco ASA devices. SSL VPN is a technology that provides remote access through a gateway that offers many different features, access methods, group configurations, and group policies. End users can access the gateway from a wide variety of different endpoints. From a design standpoint, network designers need to understand the different access methods, including clientless access, thin client or port forwarding access, and full tunnel access. 
Clientless access mode involves the user accessing corporate resources through a web browser that supports SSL certificates on different operating systems. The user does not need to install any software client as it has web-enabled applications and file sharing services. The gateway performs address and protocol conversion. The thin client access method behaves differently than the clientless access mode and that it uses a Java applet and performs TCP port forwarding so the other services can be used in addition to web-enabled applications. TCP port forwarding with static port mapping extends application support beyond web-enabled applications, so SSH, Telnet, IMAP, POP3, and other protocols can be used. The full tunnel access mode offers extensive application support and user access by downloading either the Cisco SSL VPN client or the newer Cisco AnyConnect client. The VPN clients can be loaded through Java or ActiveX and they can operate in two modes. Users can run it in workstation memory for the lifetime of the session and then it can be cleared. Or users can install the VPN client permanently on a system if they have administrative access rights. The most common SSL VPN design types are the parallel, inline, and DMZ design, which we'll talk about now. As you can see here, the parallel design places the firewall logically in parallel with the VPN appliance behind the edge router. The enterprise servers and services will be placed behind the VPN firewall layer. The exact design depends on the submodules in use. However, the firewall policies need to limit traffic that come into the VPN termination device. With the inline option, as you see here, the SSL VPN gateway concentrator and the firewall are also placed behind the router and in front of the servers. But the difference from the previous model that you saw is that the firewall and the VPN devices are placed in line, as you can see in this diagram. This is a viable option that is suitable for small and medium-sized businesses. And then finally, the recommended design for most enterprise networks is the DMZ design, which involves placing the SSL VPN concentrator in a DMZ configuration with a firewall as you see here. Our next topic is DMVPN. Dynamic Multipoint VPN or DMVPN is a solution for building scalable IPsec virtual private networks. It works by using a centralized architecture and it provides easier implementation and management of deployments that require specific access controls for mobile workers, extranet workers, uh, telecommuters. DMVPN also allows branch offices to communicate directly with each other over the public WAN or internet. One of the advantages of DMVPN is that it does not require that a permanent VPN connection remain up between sites, but it does allow for what we would say a zero touch deployment of IPsec VPNs by allowing them to be dynamically created when needed. Now there are many advantages to DMVPN, but here are just a few. It reduced costs in integrating voice video with VPN security. It simplifies communications by allowing direct branch to branch connectivity. It reduces deployment com complexity by offering what we say again, zero touch configuration. So it reduces the deployment and complexity in VPNs themselves. And then it prevents disruption of business critical applications because it's using the standards-based IPsec technology. So it improves business resiliency. A popular method to connect offices, as you know, is using virtual private networks or what we say VPNs over, over public networks. And here is a perfect example. Let's say you have a hub and spoke VPN topology in which multiple remote sites, you see we have four remote sites, have site to site VPN connection to the headquarters location. Now in this topology, if a remote site wanted to communicate securely with another remote site, 
the traffic would travel between the sites to the headquarters location first, rather than directly between the two sites. This isn't really optimal though. I mean, it works, but if you're running voice or video, uh, there are better options or more ideal solutions which DMVPN can provide. The optimal path would be to have the hub uh, not get involved with spoke-to-spoke -spoke communication and allow them to communicate directly. Now, obviously, creating a full mesh of IPsec VPN connections is not reasonable. In a previous video, you've already learned how to create a GRE tunnel, and that's going to help you with this section. DMVPN can scale because of a technology called MGRE. So while a GRE tunnel supports one tunnel, MGRE allows your router to support multiple GRE tunnels on a single GRE interface. So security in a DMVPN network is provided by IPsec. There are four primary security features offered by IPsec that you should be aware of. The first is Antarplay, which IPsec uses to make sure that the packets being sent are not duplicate packets. So for example, if someone were to breach your network and to capture traffic, and let's say part of that traffic that they've captured is actual login credentials to a server, they could attempt to play those packets back on your network and then gain access to the host. But IPsec has built in within itself sequence numbers. And these sequence numbers, sequence numbers allow IPsec to determine whether a packet is a duplicate packet. And if it's a duplicate packet, then it's not to be transmitted. The next security feature is authentication. And authentication, as you know, allows two parties or the two endpoints of a flow to verify that the other party is who it actually claims to be. Next is confidentiality, and this is done by encryption. So obviously, if somebody is sniffing network traffic and the data is encrypted, they would not be able to interpret that data. And then finally, integrity. They make sure, IPsec makes sure that when data is on the network or is in the process of being forwarded, that that data is not modified while it's in transit. Now, the best way to learn about IPsec is to simply walk through how it works. The first step is, is that IPsec needs to know what traffic needs to be protected and encrypted. So you need to determine what type of traffic is interesting, and then IPsec knows what to do with it. So for example, in routers or firewalls, normally access lists are used to determine the traffic that is, should be encrypted and they're using a crypto policy that has permit statements that indicate the selected traffic should be encrypted. Now, if there's deny statements in those access lists, those can be used to indicate that the, the traffic should be sent unencrypted. So when interesting traffic is generated and marked by that ACL as interesting, then there is the initiation of step two, the next step of the process, which is negotiating the phase one exchange. So the basic purpose of phase one is to authenticate the peers and set up a secure channel. So in phase one, there is an authentication and a protection of the identities of the IPsec peers. And then there's a negotiation of a matching policy between the peers to protect that exchange. So it's important we understand what an SA is. The concept of SA or security association is fundamental to understanding IPsec. So an SA is a relationship between two or more entities, and it defines how the entities will use security services between them so that they can communicate securely. IPsec provides a wide array of options for things such as encryption or authentication. So each IPsec connection can provide different services such as um, authentication, integrity checking, encryption. It can provide one or, or all three of those. So when the security service is determined, 
two IPsec peers much determine which algorithms to use, um, such as triple DES for encryption or MD5 for integrity. And then after deciding upon these algorithms, the devices must share, must share session keys as well. So there's a lot of information to manage between these peers and the SA or the Security Association is the method that IPsec uses to track all of those specific details. Before we move off this step, please note that phase one can occur in two modes. That's main mode and aggressive mode. So main mode has a three two-way exchanges between the initiator and the receiver. So algorithms and hashes are used and agreed upon. Then the shared secret keying material is used. And then finally, it's a verification of the other side's identity. In aggressive mode, there are fewer exchanges and fewer packets. So everything is basically condensed and the receiver sends everything back to the sender that is needed to complete the exchange. The weakness of using aggressive mode is that both sides have exchanged information before there's a secure channel. Therefore, it is possible to sniff traffic and then discover who formed the new SA. But that being said, aggressive mode is much faster than main mode. Now, before we move on to phase two, you should know that IPsec relies on two protocols, AH, which is authentication header, or ESP, encapsulating security payload. Both AH and ESP offer origin authentication and integrity services. So this makes sure that IPsec peers are who they claim to be. And then they also make sure of another thing, that data is not modified in transit. But you may be tested on this. You need to know the difference between AH and ESP. And the difference is in the encryption support. ESP encrypts the original packet, and AH does not offer any encryption. So um, needless to say, ESP is far more popular on today's networks. So as we move on to phase two, the purpose of phase two is to negotiate IPsec essays to set up the tunnel. So during this function, there's a negotiation of IPsec essay parameters and then an establishment of IPsec security associations. And then there's a periodic renegotiation of essays to ensure security. So, in phase two, there's one mode, and it's called quick mode. And it only occurs after a secure tunnel has been established in phase one. And in this mode, there's a negotiation of the shared IPsec policy. And that, in that policy, you're deriving information such as security algorithms. But quick mode is also used to renegotiate a new IPsec essay when an essay lifetime expires. On to step four. After phase two is complete, information is exchanged by an IPsec tunnel. That is, packets are encrypted and decrypted using the encryption specified in the essay. Now remember, an essay is a relationship between two or more entities and they define how they'll use security services for things such as encryption, integrity, and authenticity. So when the security service is determined, the two IPsec peers then determine exactly which algorithms to use, and the SA makes that happen. And then finally, step five is tunnel termination. So if an SA terminates by deletion, or by timing out, the tunnel is torn down. Specifically, an essay can time out when a specified number of seconds have elapsed, or it can also time out when a specified number of bytes have passed through the tunnel. Now, you remember I mentioned that AH and ESP protocols are used for authentication. Both AH and ESP can operate in one of two modes that you should know. 
First is transport mode and the next is tunnel mode. So let's take a look at the differences here. Transport mode, tra in transport mode, it uses a packet's original IP header. So therefore it does not add an additional tunnel header. And this works well in networks where if you think that increasing a packet size could actually cause an issue. Transport mode is usually used for client to site VPNs where you have a PC running a VPN client software. And then it's connecting back to like a VPN concentrator or some other VPN termination device at a headquarters. Now there's tunnel mode and tunnel mode encapsulate, encapsulates an entire packet. And the encapsulated packet actually has a new header. It's called the IPsec header. And this new header has a source and destination IP address that reflects the, T, the VPN termination devices at the different sites. So this mode is often used for networking between hub and branch or IPsec site to site VPNs. Next, let's talk about GetVPN or Group Encrypted Transport VPN design. With the rapid deployment of multicast processes, audio, video streaming, and any to any communications, it is important to have a secure solution that does not rely on an overlay VPN or on building tunnels. When using the GetVPN approach, routers become part of a trusted grouping of VPN devices and secure packets flow between these routers with their original IP header preserved. This behavior eliminates many quality of service and multicast issues. GetVPN simplifies the security policy and key distribution in the group of routers mentioned before using the group key distribution model. The GetVPN design concept is illustrated here. GetVPN works on a topology where the key server is positioned at the hub site and it uses a technique that allows the original IP header to be preserved, copied, or reused without encapsulating it. GetVPN is well suited for IPsec or MPLS VPN networks, which are getting more and more popular, and it works by leveraging the keying protocol, which is actually an IPsec extension. GetVPN technology is a perfect example of the extensibility of IPsec, and it enforces IPsec as a framework, as the protocol used by GetVPN is called Group Domain of Interpretation, or GDOI. The key servers at the hub site automatically manage different types of keys, and secure communication channels are established with the spoke sites without using tunnels. The remote sites can register or refresh their keys with the closest server in the group, and the rekeying process is performed on a regular basis, according to the IPsec policy and the Security Association validity period. The most important advantages of using GetVPN include the fact that it does not use tunnels, it easily supports any-to-any -any communication, it allows for replication using multicast, and it is a very secure solution because it uses appropriate traffic encryption mechanisms. So here's what you learned. You've learned about advanced VPN solutions including SSL VPN, IPsec, and DMVPN, and then GetVPN as well. All this will help you master this portion of your architecture exam. And I'm confident if you know this video well, you'll do excellent on this portion of your exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about managing security. You're going to learn about the types of attacks there are that you need to manage, the security risks, uh, the targets of these attacks, preventing violations and breaches on the network you support, performing risk assessments, and finally discussing policies and how to implement policies. All this you'll need to know for your architecture exam. So let's go ahead and begin. It is important to be aware of the different types of attacks that 
can impact your systems on the network. Security threats can be classified into three categories, reconnaissance, gaining unauthorized access, and denial of service. The goal of reconnaissance, reconnaissance is to gather as much information as possible about the target network. Gaining unauthorized access obviously refers to the act of actually attacking or exploiting the network or host. And then denial of service. These aim to overwhelm the resources on the network, such as memory, CPU, and bandwidth, and thus impact the target system and affect the devices on the network negatively. Next, let's talk about security risks. To protect network resources, processes, and procedures, technology needs to address several security risks. Important network characteristics that can be at risk from security threats include data confidentiality, data integrity, and system availability. Let's talk about that now. Data confidentiality should ensure that only legitimate users can view sensitive information. Data integrity should ensure that only authorized users can change critical information. And system availability should ensure uninterrupted access to critical network and computing resources. In addition, the use of redundant hardware and encryption can significantly reduce the risks associated with all these three, system availability, data integrity, and data confidentiality. Next, let's discuss targets. Given the wide range of threats, just about anything on the network is vulnerable and is a potential target. Individual hosts are usually the number one thing that hackers are looking to access, but they're especially susceptible to worms and viruses. Other high-value targets include devices that support the network. So obviously, this would be routers and switches, possibly even firewalls, DHCP servers and DNS servers, certainly, and management stations such as SNMP or even IP phones. Next, let's talk about loss of availability or denial of service. DOS attacks try to block or deny access to impact the availability of network services. Here are some common failure points due to DDoS attacks. A network device, a host, or an application fails to process large amounts of data sent to it that then crashes or breaks communication ability for that device. A host or application is unable to handle an unexpected condition that was sent to it, and therefore there's resource depletion or failure and nearly all DOS attacks are carried out with spoofing or flooding methods. Now that being said, Cisco provides you many tools to deal with this, and here they are for you now. DHCP snooping, dynamic ARP inspection, unicast reverse path forwarding, access control lists, and rate limiting. If you study this chart and know it well, you will most certainly be prepared for the CCDA exam when it comes to how to manage against denial of service attacks. When attackers change sensitive data without authorization, it's called an integrity violation. So for example, an attacker might access financial data, change it, or delete it. It's important to use restrictive access controls to prevent integrity violations and confidentiality attacks. And here are some ways you can enforce access control and reduce risks. You can separate networks using VLANs and packet filtering firewalls, restrict access with operating system-based controls, limit user access by using user profiles, and then use encryption techniques to store your data. The security policies an organization employs use what are called risk assessments and cost-benefit analysis to reduce security risks. The following figure shows the three components of risk assessment. Control refers to how do you use the security policy to minimize potential risks. 
Severity describes the level of the risk to the organization, and probability is the likeness that an attack against the assets will occur. A risk assessment should explain what assets to secure, the value of those assets, the loss that would result from an attack, the severity and probability of an attack against the assets, and how to use a security policy to minimize the risks of the attack. In many cases, security costs can be justified by describing the loss of productivity or revenue that could occur during security incidents. A risk index is used to consider the risks of potential threats. The risk index is based on the risk assessment components, which are severity of loss if the asset is compromised, probability of the risk actually occurring, and ability to control and manage the risk. One approach to determining a risk index is to give each risk factor a value from one to three, one being the lowest risk and three being the highest. So for example, a high severity risk would have a substantial impact on the users or the organization. Medium severity risks would have an effect on a single department and low severity risks would have limited impact. The risk index is calculated by multiplying the severity times the probability factor and then dividing by the control factor. The following is an example of a risk index calculation for a typical large corporation. To provide the proper levels of security and increased network availability, a policy, a security policy, is a crucial element in providing secure network services. Business requirements and risk analysis are used in the development of security policy, and it is often a balance between ease of access versus the security risk and cost of implementing the security technology when making decisions. In terms of network security in the system life cycle, the business needs are a key area to consider. These needs define what the business wants to do with the network. Risk analysis is another part of the system life cycle, which explains the risks and their costs. So business needs and risk assessment feed information to formulate the security policy. The security policy describes the organization's processes, procedures, guidelines, and standards. Finally, an organization's security team needs to have the processes and procedures defined. This information helps explain what needs to happen for incident response, security monitoring, maintenance, and compliance. As you can see here, the consideration is prefaced with a question, and then you can see what aspect of security preparation and policies and procedures can deal with that consideration. It's key that you memorize this chart for the CCDA exam. RFC 2196 says, a security policy is a formal statement of the rules by which people who are given access to an organization's technology and information assets must abide. So when you are developing security policies for an organization, RFC 2196 can serve as a guide for developing security processes and procedures. The basic approach of creating a security policy is to identify what you are trying to protect, determine what you're trying to protect it from, determine how likely the threats are, implement measures that protect your assets in a cost-effective manner, and then review the process continuously and make improvements each time a weakness is found. One of the main purposes of a security policy is to describe the roles and requirements for securing technology and information assets. The policy defines the ways in which these requirements will be met. There are two main reasons for having a security policy. First, it provides the framework for the security implementation, and then it creates a security baseline of the current security posture. Here are some questions you might ask when developing a security policy. What data and assets will be included in the policy? What network communication is permitted between hosts? How will policies be implemented? 
and how will the latest attacks impact your network and security systems? A security policy is divided into smaller parts that help describe the overall risk management policy, identification of assets, and where security should be applied. There are other documents which concentrate on specific areas of risk management. The acceptable use policy. This document defines the roles and responsibilities within risk management. Network access control policy defines access control principles used in the network and how data is classified. Security management policy explains how to manage the security infrastructure. And then incident handling policy defines the processes and procedures for managing security incidents. If you look at this chart and memorize it, uh, you'll do excellent on this portion of your CCDA exam. As requirements change and new technology is developed, the network security policy needs to be updated to reflect those changes. So here are some steps that are used to facilitate the continuing efforts in the maintenance of security policies. Secure, monitor, test, and improve. Secure means identification, authentication, ACLs, VPNs, monitor, intrusion, and content-based detection and response. Test is assessment, vulnerability scanning, and security auditing. And improve is for data analysis reporting and intelligent network security. Today's network designs demonstrate an increased use of security mechanisms and have become more tightly integrated with network design. Trust and identity management is a part of the safe security reference architecture and is crucial for the development of a secure network design. This management of trust and identity defines who and what can access the network, when, where, and how that access can occur. Some of the best practices for protecting the network infrastructure through trust and identity include the following. Use AAA services with the Cisco ACS server, Use 802.1x, port authentication, logging using syslog and SDEE. This is a protocol used by Cisco IDS and IPS sensors to send information to the management stations. Using SSH instead of Telnet to avoid any management traffic crossing the, the network in clear text. Using secure versions of management protocols such as SNMP version 3, NTP version 3, and SFTP. Harden all network devices by making sure unnecessary services are disabled. Use authentication between devices that are running dynamic routing protocols. Use the Cisco one-step lockdown feature on network devices to harden them. Use ACLs to restrict management access allowing only certain hosts to access the network devices. Use IPsec as an internal encryption method or external VPN solution. And then use Cisco Network Admission Control Solution, which ensures that network clients and servers are patched and updated in an automated and centralized fashion. So here's what you've learned. You've learned a lot in preparation for your architecture exam, but specifically types of attacks, the security risks you need to be aware of, targets that are especially interesting when it comes to attacks, preventing violations and breaches, performing risk assessments, and policy support for whatever enterprise you end up supporting. All this you'll need to know for your architecture exam, and I'm confident you're going to do very well on this portion of the exam. Good luck in your studies.